Section 12 of A History of the Four Georges in Four Volumes, Volume 1 by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10 Home Affairs. Meanwhile, the public seemed to have forgotten all about Lord Oxford. Harley, the nation's great support, as Swift had called him, had been nearly two years in the Tower, and the nation did not seem to miss its great support or to care anything about him. In May 1717, Lord Oxford sent a petition to the House of Lords complaining of the hardship and injustice of this unaccountable delay in his impeachment, and the House of Lords began at last to put on an appearance of activity. The Commons, too, revived and enlarged their secret committee, of which it will be remembered that Walpole was the chairman. Times, however, had changed. Walpole was not in the administration and felt no anxiety to assist the minister in any way. He purposely absented himself from the sittings, and a new chairman had to be chosen. Probably Walpole had always known well enough that there was not evidence to sustain a charge of high treason against his former rival, perhaps now that the rival was down in the dust, never to rise again, he did not care to press for his punishment. At all events, he made it clear that he felt no interest in the impeachment of Lord Oxford. The friends of the ruined minister had recourse to an ingenious artifice. June twenty fourth, 1717, had been appointed for the opening of the proceedings. Westminster Hall, lately the scene of the impeachment of Somers, and soon to be the scene of the impeachment of Warren Hastings, was of course the place where Oxford had to come forward and meet his accusers. The king, the prince, and the princess of Wales were seated in the hall. Most of the foreign ambassadors and ministers were spectators. The imposing formalities and artificial terrors of such a ceremonial were kept up. Lord Oxford had been brought from the tower to Westminster by water. He was now led bareheaded up to the bar by the deputy lieutenant of the tower, having the axe borne before him, its edge turned away from him as yet, symbolic of the doom that might await the prisoner, but to which he had not yet been declared responsible. When the reading of the articles of impeachment and other opening passages of the trial had been gone through, Lord Harcourt, Oxford's friend, interposed and announced that he had a motion to make. In order to hear his motion, the peers had to withdraw to their own house. There, Lord Harcourt moved, that the House should dispose of the two articles of impeachment for high treason before going into any of the evidence to support the charges for high crimes and misdemeanors. The argument for this course of proceeding was plausible. If Oxford were convicted of high treason, he would have to forfeit his life, and in such case, where would be the use of convicting him of a minor offense? The plan on which the Commons proposed to act that of taking all the evidence in order of time, no matter to which charge it had reference, before coming to any conclusion, might, as Lord Harcourt put it, draw the trial into prodigious length, and absolutely to no purpose. Should the accused be found guilty of high treason, he must suffer death, and there would be an end of the whole business. Should he be acquitted of the graver charge, he might then be impeached on the lighter accusation, and what harm would have been done or time lost? The motion was carried by a majority of 86 to 56. Now it is hardly possible to suppose that the peers who voted in the majority did not know very well that the Commons would not and could not submit to have their mode of conducting an impeachment, which it was their business to manage, thus altered at the sudden dictation of the other chamber. The House of Commons was growing in importance every day, the House of Lords was proportionately losing its influence. The Commons determined that they would conduct the impeachment in their own way or not at all. Doubtless, some of them, most of them, were glad to be well out of the whole affair. July 1st was fixed for the renewal of the proceedings. Some fruitless conferences between Lords and Commons wasted two days, and on the evening of July 3rd the Lords sat in Westminster Hall, and invited by proclamation the accusers of Oxford to appear. No manager came forward to conduct the impeachment on the part of the commons. The peers sat for a quarter of an hour as if waiting for a prosecutor. 
well knowing that none was coming. A solemn farce was played. The peers went back to their chamber, and there a motion was made, acquitting Robert Earl of Oxford and Earl Mortimer, on the ground that no charge had been maintained against him. A crowd without hailed the adoption of the motion with cheers. Oxford was released from the tower, and nothing more was ever heard of his impeachment. The Duke of Marlborough was furious with rage at Oxford's escape, and the Duchess is described as almost distracted that she could not obtain her revenge. Magnanimity was not a characteristic virtue of the early days of the Georges. This was what has sometimes been called the honorable acquittal of Oxford. An English judge once spoke humorously of a prisoner having been honorably acquitted on a flaw in the indictment. Harley's was like this. It was not an acquittal. It was not honorable to the man impeached. The house that forbeared to press the impeachment, or the house that contrived his escape from trial. Oxford had been committed to the Tower, and impeached for reasons that had little to do with his guilt or innocence or with true public policy. He was released from prison, and relieved from further proceedings in just the same way. There was not evidence against him on which he could be convicted of high treason and this was well known to his enemies when they first consigned him to the tower. But there was not the slightest moral doubt on the mind of any man that Oxford had intrigued with the Stuarts, and had endeavored to procure their restoration, and that he had done this even since his committal to the tower. His guilt, whatever it was, had been increased by him and not diminished since the beginning of the proceedings taken against him. But, he had only done what most other statesmen of that day had been doing, or would have done if they had seen advantage in it. He was not more guilty than some of his bitterest opponents, the Duke of Marlborough among others. All but the very bitterest opponents were glad to be done with the whole business. It must have come to a more or less farcical end sooner or later, and sensible men were of the opinion that the sooner the better. Of Harley, Earl of Oxford and Earl Mortimer, as his titles ran, we shall not hear any more. We have already foreshadowed the remainder of his life and death. This short account of his sham impeachment is introduced here merely as a part of the historic continuity of the narrative. History has few characters less interesting than that of Oxford. He held a position of greatness without being great. He fell and even his fall could not invest him with tragic dignity. On December 13, 1718, Lord Stanhope, who had been raised to the peerage first as Viscount and then as Earl Stanhope, introduced into the House of Lords a measure ingeniously entitled A Bill for Strengthening the Protestant Interest in These Kingdoms. The title of the bill was strictly appropriate, according to our present ideas, and according to the ideas of enlightened men in Stanhope's days also, and it must at first have misled some of Stanhope's audience. Most churchmen are now ready to admit that the interests of the Church of England are strengthened by every measure which tends to secure religious equality, but most churchmen were not quite so sure of this in the reign of George I. The bill brought in by Stanhope was really a measure intended to relieve dissenters from some of the penalties and disabilities imposed on them in the reign of Queen Anne. The second reading of the bill was the occasion of a long and animated debate. Several noble lords appealed to the opinion of the bishops, and the bishops spoke in answer to the appeal. The Archbishop of Canterbury, the Archbishop of York, the Bishop of London, the Bishop of Bristol, the Bishop of Rochester, Atterbury, the Bishop of Chester, and other prelates spoke against the bill. The Bishop of Bangor, the Bishop of Gloucester, the Bishop of Lincoln, the Bishop of Norwich, and the Bishop of Peterborough spoke in its favor. The Bishop of Peterborough's was a strenuous and an eloquent argument in favor of the principle of the bill. Quote, the words church and church's danger said the Bishop of Peterborough, had often been made use of to carry on sinister designs, and then 
these words made a mighty noise in the mouth of silly women and children but in his opinion the church which he defined to be a scriptural institution upon a legal establishment was founded upon a rock and could not be in danger as long as we enjoyed the light of the gospel and our excellent constitution end quote. the argument would have been perfect if the eloquent bishop had only left out the proviso about our excellent constitution for the opponents of the measure were contending as was but natural that the bill if passed into law would not leave to the church the constitutional protection which it had previously enjoyed the bill passed the house of lords on december twenty third and was sent down to the commons next day it was read there a first time at once was read a second time after a debate of some nine hours and was passed without amendment by a majority of two hundred and twenty one against one hundred and seventy on january tenth seventeen nineteen the test majority however by which the bill had been decisively carried on the motion to go into committee was but small two hundred and forty three against two hundred and two and this majority was mainly due to the vote of the scottish members stanhope it is well known would have made the measure more liberal than it was and was persuaded from this intention by sunderland who insisted that if it were too liberal it would not pass the house of commons the result seems to prove that sunderland was right walpole spoke against the bill limited as its concessions were it would be interesting to know what sort of argument a man of walpole's principles could have offered against a measure embodying the very spirit and sense of whig policy unfortunately we have no means of knowing the galleries of the house of commons were rigidly closed against strangers on the day of the debate and all we are allowed to hear concerning walpole's part in the discussion is that quote, mr robert walpole made a warm speech chiefly levelled against a great man in the present administration end quote. there is something characteristic of walpole in this he was never very particular about principle or even about seeming consistency but still when opposing a measure which he might have been expected to support he would have probably found it more expedient as well as more agreeable to confine himself chiefly to the task of attacking some great man in the present administration it ought to be said of stanhope that he was distinctly in advance of his age as regarded the recognition of the principle of religious equality he was not only anxious to put the protestant dissenters as much as possible on a level with churchmen in all the privileges of citizenship but he was even strongly in favor of mitigating the severity of the laws against the roman catholics in his history of england from the peace of utrecht to the peace of versailles lord stanhope the descendant of the minister whose career and character have done so much honor to a name and a family claims for him the credit of having put on paper a scheme not undeserving of attention as the earliest germ of roman catholic emancipation stanhope's life was too soon and too suddenly cut short to allow him to push forward his scheme to anything like a perfect position and it is not probable that he could in any case have done much with it at such a time still though fate cut short the life it ought not to cut short the praise the peerage bill raised a question of some constitutional importance the principal object of this measure which was introduced on february twenty eighth seventeen nineteen in the house of lords by the duke of somerset and was believed to have lord sunderland for its actual author was to limit the prerogative of the crown in the creation of english peerages to a number not exceeding six in addition to those already existing according to the provisions of the bill the crown might still create new peers on the extinction of old titles for want of male heirs but with this exception the power of adding new peerages would be limited to the number of six it was also proposed that instead of the sixteen elective peers from scotland twenty-five hereditary peers should be created this part of the bill was that which at the time gave rise to most of the debate in the house of lords at least but the really important constitutional question was that which involved the limitation of the privilege of the sovereign 
the sovereign himself sent a special message to the house of lords informing them that he has so much at heart the settling the peerage of the whole kingdom upon such a foundation as may secure the freedom and constitution of parliament in all future ages that he is willing that his prerogative stand not in the way of so great and necessary a work the ostensible motive for the proposed legislation was to get rid of difficulties caused by the over-increase of the numbers of the peerage since the union of england and scotland the real object was to guard against such a coup d'etat as that accomplished in anne's later days by the creation of the twelve peers of whom mrs masham's husband was one nothing could be more generous and liberal it might have been thought than the expressed willingness of the king to surrender a part of his prerogative this very readiness however expressed as it was by anticipation and before the measure had yet made any progress set a great many persons in and out of parliament thinking a vehement dispute soon sprang up in which the pamphleteer as usual bore an important part addison in one of his latest political and literary efforts defended the proposed change he described his pamphlet as the work of an old whig it was written as a reply to a pamphlet by Steele condemning the bill and signed a plebeian reply retort and rejoinder followed in more and more heated and personal style the excitement created caused the measure to be dropped for the session but it was brought in again in the session following and it passed through all its stages in the lords without trouble and with much rapidity when it came down to the house of commons however a very different fate awaited it walpole assailed it with powerful eloquence and with unanswerable argument the true nature of the scheme now came out it would have simply rendered the representative chamber powerless against the majority of the chamber which did not represent this will be readily apparent to any one who considers the subject for a moment by the light of our more modern experience a majority of the house of commons representing it may be a vast majority of the people agree to a certain measure it goes up to the house of lords and is rejected there what means in the end have the commons who represent the nation of giving effect to the wishes of the nation they have none but the privilege of the crown to create under the advice of ministers a sufficient number of new peers to outvote the opponents of the measure no alternative but revolution and civil war would be left if this were taken away it is true that the power might be again abused by the sovereign as it was abused in anne's days on the advice of the tories but we know that as a matter of fact it is hardly ever abused hardly ever even used why is it hardly ever used for the good reason that all men know it is existing and can be used should the need arise even were it to be misused the misuse would happen under responsible ministers who could be challenged to answer for it and who could have to make good their defence but if the house of lords were made supreme over the house of commons in every instance by abolishing the unlimited prerogative which alone keeps it in check who could then be held responsible for abuse and before whom who could call the house of lords to account before what tribunal could it be summoned to answer the peers are now independent of the people and would then also be independent of the crown there is hardly a great political reform known to modern england which if the peerage bill had become law would not have been absolutely rejected or else carried by a popular revolution walpole attacked the bill on every side such legislation he insisted would in time bring back the commons into the state of servile dependency they were in when they wore the badges of the lords it would he contended take away one of the most powerful incentives to virtue since there would be no coming to honour but through the winding sheet of an old decrepit lord and the grave of an extinct noble family walpole knew well his public in his time he dwelt most strongly on this last consideration that the bill if passed into law would shut the gates of the peerage against deserving commoners he asked indignantly how the house of lords could expect the commons to give their concurrence to a measure 
by which they and their posterities are to be excluded from the peerage. The commoner, who after this way of putting the matter assented to the bill, must either have been an unambitious bachelor, or have been blessed in a singularly unambitious wife. Steele, who, as we have said, had fought gallantly against the bill with his pen, now made a very effective speech against it. He showed that the measure would alter the whole constitutional position of the House of Lords, whether as a legislative chamber or a court of appeal. The restraint of the peers, to a certain number, will make the most powerful of them have all the rest under their direction, and judges so made by the blind order of birth will be capable of no other way of decision. The prerogative, as Steele put it very clearly, can do no hurt when ministers do their duty, but a settled number of peers may abuse their power when no man is answerable for them, or can call them to account for their encroachments. The bill was rejected by a majority of 269 votes against 177. In March of 1720 was passed an act with a pompous and even portentous title. It was called An Act for the Better Securing the Dependency of the Kingdom of Ireland upon the Crown of Great Britain. The preamble recited that attempts have been lately made to shake off the subjection of Ireland onto and dependence upon the imperial crown of this realm, which will be of dangerous consequence to Great Britain and Ireland. The reader would naturally assume that some fresh designs of the Stuarts had been discovered, having for their theatre the Catholic provinces of Ireland. Was James Stuart about to land at Kinsall? Had Alberoni got hold of the Irish Catholics? Was Atterbury plotting with Swift for an armed insurrection in Munster and Connaught? No, nothing of the kind was expected. The preamble of the alarming act went on to set forth that the House of Lords in Ireland had lately, against law, assumed to themselves a power and jurisdiction to examine, correct, and amend the judgments and decrees of the courts of justice in the Kingdom of Ireland. In this alleged trespass of the Irish House of Lords was the whole cause of the new measure. The Act declared that the Irish House of Lords had no jurisdiction to judge of, affirm, or reverse any judgment, sentence, or decree given or made in any court within the said kingdom. This was an enactment of the most serious moment in a constitutional sense. It made the Parliament of Ireland subordinate to the Parliament of England. It reduced the Irish House of Lords from a position in Ireland equal to that of the House of Lords in England down to the level of a mere provincial assembly. The occasion of the passing of this act was the decision given by the Irish House of Lords in the celebrated case of Sherlock against Ainsley. It is not necessary for us to go into the story of the case at any length. It was a question of disputed property. The defendant had obtained a decree in the Irish Court of Exchequer, which decree was reversed on an appeal to the Irish House of Lords. The defendant appealed to the English House of Lords, who confirmed the judgment of the Irish Court of Exchequer, and ordered him to be put in possession of the disputed property. The Irish House of Lords stood by their authority and actually ordered the Irish barons of Exchequer to be taken into custody by Black Rod for having offended against the privileges of the peers and the rights and liberties of Ireland. The Act was passed to settle the question and reduce the Irish House of Lords to submission and subordinate rank. It was settled merely, of course, by the strength of a majority in the English Parliament. The Duke of Leeds recorded a sensible and manly protest against the vote of the majority of his brother peers. One or two of the reasons he gives for his protest are worth reading even now. The eleventh reason is, because it is the glory of the English laws and the blessing attending Englishmen, that they have justice administered at their doors, and not to be drawn as formerly to Rome for appeals. And by this order the people of Ireland must be drawn from Ireland hither whensoever they receive any injustice from the chancery there, by which means poor man must be trampled upon, as not being able to come over to seek justice. The thirteenth reason is still more concise. 
because this taking away the jurisdiction of the Lord's house in Ireland may be a means to disquiet the Lords there and disappoint the King's affairs. The protest, it need hardly be said, received little or no attention. More than sixty years after, when England was perplexed in foreign and colonial troubles, the spirit of the protest walked abroad and animated Grattan and the Irish volunteers. But in 1720, the Parliament at Westminster was free to do as it pleased with the Parliament in Dublin. To the vast majority of the Irish people, it might have been a matter of absolute indifference which Parliament reigned supreme. They had as little to expect from Dublin as from Westminster. The Irish Parliament was quite as ready to promote legislation for the further persecution of Catholics as any English Parliament could be. The Parliament in Dublin was merely an assembly of English and Protestant colonists. Yet it is worthy of remark that then and after, the sympathies of the people, when they had any means of showing them, went with the Irish Parliament simply because of the name it bore. It was, at all events, the so-called Parliament of Ireland. It represented, at least in name, the authority of the Irish people. So long as it existed, there was some recognition of the fact that Ireland was something more than a merely conquered country held by the title of the sword and governed by arbitrary proclamation, secret warrant, and drumhead court-martial. Death had been busy among eminent men for some few years. The Duke of Shrewsbury, the King of Hearts, the statesman whose appointment as Lord Treasurer secured the throne of Great Britain for the Hanoverian family, died on February 18, 1717. William Penn, the founder of the great American state of Pennsylvania, closed his long, active, and fruitful life in 1718. We have here only to record his death. The history of his deeds belongs to an earlier time. Controversy has now quite ceased to busy itself about his noble character and his life of splendid, unostentatious beneficence. His name, which without his consent and against his wishes was made part of the name of the state which he founded, will be remembered in connection with its history, while the Delaware and the Sky Kill flow. Of his famous treaty with the Indians, nothing perhaps was ever better said than the comment of Voltaire, that it was the only league between savages and white men which was never sworn to and never broken. Addison died, still comparatively young, on June seventeenth, 1719. He had reached the highest point of his political career but a short time before, when, on one of the changes of office between Stanhope and Sunderland, he became one of the principal secretaries of state. His health, however, was breaking down, and he never had, indeed, the slightest gift or taste for political life. Pity, said Mrs. Manley, the authoress of the New Atlantis, speaking of Addison, that politics and sordid interest should have carried him out of the road of Helicon and snatched him from the embraces of the muses. But it seems quite unjust to ascribe Addison's divergence into political ways to any sordid interest. He had political friends who loved him, and he went with them into politics, as he might have traveled in company with them and for the sake of their company, although caring nothing for travel himself. No man was better aware of his incapacity for the real business of public life. Addison had himself pointed out all the objections to his political advancement before that advancement was pressed upon him. He was not a statesman. He was not an administrator. He could not do any genuine service as head of a department. He was not even a good clerk. He was a wretched speaker. He was consumed by a morbid shyness, almost as oppressive as that of the poet Cowper in a later day, or of Nathaniel Hawthorne, the American novelist, later still. His whole public career was, at best, but a harmless mistake. It has done no harm to his literary fame. The world has almost forgotten it. Even lovers of Addison might have to be reminded now that the creator of Sir Roger de Coverley was once a diplomatic agent and a secretary of state and a member of the House of Commons. Some of the essays which Addison contributed to the Spectator are like enough to outlive the system of government by party 
and perhaps even the whole system of representative government. Sir Roger de Coverley will not be forgotten until men forget Parson Adams and Robinson Crusoe and Gil Blas, and for that matter Sir John Falstaff and Don Quixote. For some time things were looking well at home and abroad. The policy of the government appeared to have been completely successful on the continent. The confederations that had been threatening England were dissolved or broken up. The Jacobite conspiracies seemed to have been made hopeless and powerless. The friendship established between England and the Regent of France had, to all seeming, robbed the Stuarts of their last chance. James the Chevalier had no longer a house on French soil. Paris could not any more be the headquarters of his organization and the scene of his mock court. The regent had kept his promises to the English government. It was well known that so far from encouraging or permitting the designs of the exiled family against England, he would do all in his power to frustrate them, as indeed he had an opportunity of doing not long after. Never before, perhaps never since, was there so cordial an understanding between England and France. Never could there have been a time when such an understanding was of greater importance to England. At home, the prospect seemed equally bright. Walpole had contrived to ingratiate himself more and more with the Prince of Wales, and had become his confidential adviser. Acting on his counsel, the Prince made his submission to the King, and acting on Stanhope's counsel, the King accepted it. The Sovereign and his heir had a meeting, and were reconciled for the time at least. Walpole consented to join the administration, content for the present to fill the humbler place of paymaster to the forces, without a seat in the cabinet. He returned, in fact, to the ministerial position which he had first occupied, and from which he had been promoted, and must have seemed to himself somewhat in the position of a boy who, after having got high in his class, had got down very low again, and is well content to mount up a step or two from the humblest position. Walpole knew what he was doing, and must have been quite satisfied in his own mind that he was not likely to remain very long paymaster to the forces, although he could not by any possibility have anticipated the strange succession of events by which he was destined soon to be left without a rival. For the present, he was in the administration, but he took little part in its actual work. He did not even appear to have any real concern in it. He spent as much of his time as he could at Houghton, his pleasant country seat in Norfolk. Townsend, too, had been induced to join the administration. To him was assigned the position of President of the Council. Thus there appeared to be a truce to quarrels and to enmities abroad and at home. There was no dispute with any of the great continental powers, there was no dread of the Stuarts. Ministerial rivalries had been reduced to concordance and quiet. The traditional quarrel between the sovereign and the heir apparent had been composed. It might have been thought that a time of peace and national prosperity had been assured. In the history of nations, however, we commonly find that nothing more certainly bodes unsettlement than a general conviction that everything is settled for ever. End of chapter 10. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Section 13 of A History of the Four Georges in Four Volumes, Volume 1, by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 11 the earth hath bubbles one of the comedies of ben jonson gives some vivid and humorous illustrations of the mania for projects speculations patents and monopolies that at his time had taken possession of the minds of englishmen there is an enterprising person who declares that he can coin money out of cobwebs raise wool upon eggshells and make grass grow out of marrow bones he has a project for the recovery of drowned land a scheme for a new patent for the dressing of dogskins for gloves, a plan for the bottling of ale, a device for making wine out of blackberries, and various other schemes cut and dry for what would now be called 
floating companies to make money. The civilized world is visited with this epidemic of project and speculation from time to time. In the reign of George I, such a mania attacked England much more fiercely than it had done even in the days of Ben Jonson. It came to us this time from France. The close of a great war is always a tempting and a favorable time for such enterprises. Finances are out of order. A season of spurious commercial activity has come to an end. New resources are to be sought for somehow, and man must change to be other than he is when he wholly ceases to believe in financial miracle working. There is an air of plausibility about most of the new projects, and indeed, like the scheme told us in Ben Jonson for the recovery of drowned lands, the enterprise is usually something within human power to accomplish, if only human skill could make it pay. The Exchequer of France had been brought into a condition of something very like bankruptcy by the long and wasting war, and a projector was found who promised to supply the deficiency as boldly and as liberally as Mephistopheles does in the second part of Faust. John Law, a Scotchman, and unquestionably a man of great ability and financial skill, had settled in France in consequence of having fought a duel and killed a man in his own country. Law set up a company which was to have a monopoly of the trade of the whole Mississippi region in North America, and on condition of the monopoly was to pay off the national debt of France. A scheme of the kind within due limitations would have been reasonable enough so long as the working of the Mississippi region was concerned, but law went on extending and extending the scope of its supposed operations until it might almost as well have attempted to fold in the orb of the earth. The shares in his company went up with a sudden bound. He had the patronage of the regent and of all the court circle. Gambling in shares became the fashion, the passion of Paris, and indeed of all France. Shares bought one day were sold at an immense advance the next, or even the same day, Men and women nearly bankrupt in purse before suddenly found themselves in possession of large sums of money for which they had to all appearance run no risk and made no sacrifice whatever. Princes and tradesmen, duchesses and sempstresses and harlots clamored in intrigue and battled for shares. The offices in the Rue Quincompois, a street then inhabited by bankers, stockbrokers, and exchange agents, were besieged all day long with crowds of eager competitors for shares. The street was choked with fine equipages until it was found absolutely necessary to close it against all horses and carriages. All the rank and fashion of Paris flung themselves into this game of speculation. Every one has heard the story of the hunchback who made a little fortune by the letting of his hump as a desk on which impatient speculators might scribble their applications for shares. A French novelist, M. Paul Feval, has made good use of this story, and London still remembers to what a brilliant dramatic account it was turned by Mr. Fechter. Law was the most powerful and the most courted man of his day. In his youth he had been a gallant and a free liver, a man of dress and fashion and intrigue, who delighted in scandalous entanglements with women. The fashion and beauty of Paris was for the hour at his feet. Think of a brilliant gallant who could make one rich in a moment, the mother of the regent, described in a coarse and pungent sentence, the sort of homage which Parisian ladies would have been willing to pay to law if he had so desired. Saint-Simon, the mere littérature and diplomatist, kept his head almost alone, and was not to be dazzled. Since the fable of Midas, he said, he had not heard of any one having the power to turn all he touched into gold, and he did not believe that virtue was given to Monsieur Law. There is no doubt that Law was a man of great ability as a financier, and that his scheme in the beginning had promise in it. It was, as Burke has said of the scheme and its author, the public enthusiasm, and not Law himself, which chose to build on the base of his scheme a structure which it could not bear. It does not seem by any means certain that a project quite as wild might not be launched in London or Paris at the present day, 
and find almost as great a temporary success and blaze like laws the comet of a season while the season lasted the comet blazed with a light that filled the social sky law was for the time the most powerful man in france a momentary whisper that he was out of health sent the funds down and eclipsed the gaiety of nations he was admitted into the regent's privy council and made controller general of the finances of france the result was inevitable there was as yet nothing behind the promises and the shares of the mississippi company if finance could have gone on for ever promise crammed things would have been all right but you cannot feed capons so as hamlet told us and you cannot long feed shareholders so law's scheme suddenly collapsed one day and brought ruin on hundreds of thousands in france while however it was still afloat in air its gaudy colours dazzled the eyes of the south sea company in england at the northwest end of threadneedle street within view of the remains of richard the third's palace of crosby stands a solid red brick building substantial respectable business-like dignified with the dignity of some century and a half of existence time has softened and deepened its ruddy hue to a mellow rich tone contrasting pleasantly with the white copings and facings of its windows and suggesting agreeably something of the smooth brown cloth and neat white linen of a well-to-do city gentleman of the last century yet that solemn massive prosperous-looking building is the enduring monument of one of the most gigantic shams on record a sham and a swindle that was the prolific parent of a whole brood of shams and swindles for that building with honesty and credit and mercantile honour written on its every line and angle is all that remains of the south sea house it is a melancholy place the hall of the kings at karnak is hardly more melancholy or more ghost-haunted not that the house has now that desolation something like balclutha's which charles lamb attributed to it more than half a century ago the place has changed greatly since elia the italian and elia the englishman were fellow clerks at the south sea house those dusty maps of mexico dim as dreams have long been taken away the company itself having outlived alike its fame and its infamy lingering inappropriately like some guest that hath outstayed his welcome time was wound up at last within the memory of living men the stately gateway no longer opens upon the grave court with cloisters and pillars where south sea stock so often changed hands the cloisters and pillars have gone the court has been converted into a hall of a sort of exchange where merchants daily meet the days of the desolation of the south sea house are as much a thing of its past as its earlier splendour its corridors are now crowded with offices occupied by merchants of every nationality from scotland to greece and by companies connected with every portion of the globe only at night on saturday afternoons and during the still peace of a city sabbath do the noise of men and the stir of business cease in the south sea house yet nevertheless when one thinks of all that has happened there of the dreams and hopes and miseries of which it was the begetter it remains one of the most melancholy temples to folly that man has yet erected the south sea company had been established in seventeen ten by harley himself and was going along quietly and soberly enough for the time but the example of the mississippi company was too strong for it the south sea company too made to itself waxen wings and prepared to fly above the clouds the directors offered to relieve the state of its debt on condition of obtaining a monopoly of the south sea trade the nation was to take shares in the company in the first instance and to deal with the company for its commercial and other wares in the second and by means of the exclusive dealing in shares and in products it was to pay off the national debt in other words three men all having nothing and heavily in debt were to go into exclusive dealings with each other and were thus to make fortunes discharge their liabilities and live in luxury for the rest of their days stated thus the proposition looks marvellously absurd but it is not in its essential conditions 
more absurd than many a financial project which floats successfully for a time money-making the hardest and most practical of all occupations the task which can soonest be tested by results is the business of all others in which men are most easily led astray most greedy to be led astray sydney smith speaks of a certain french lady whose whole nature cried out for her seduction there are seasons when the whole nature of man seems to cry out for his financial seduction the south sea project expanded and inflated as the mississippi scheme had done its temporary success turned the heads of the whole population hundreds of schemes still more wild sprang into sudden existence some of the projects then put forward and believed in surpass in senseless extravagance anything satirized by ben jonson so wild was the passion for new enterprises that it seemed as if at one time anybody had only to announce any scheme however preposterous in order to find people competing for shares in it the only condition of things in our own time that can be compared with this epoch of insane speculation is the railway mania of eighteen forty six when for a brief season george hudson was king and set his hat in the market-place and all england bowed down in homage to it but the epidemic of speculation in the reign of the railway king was comparatively harmless and reasonable when compared with the midsummer madness of the south sea scheme the south sea scheme was brought before the notice of the house of commons in seventeen twenty the chancellor of the exchequer was mr aylaby we have already seen mr aylaby as one of the secret committee who recommended the impeachment of oxford and bolingbroke how well he was fitted for his office will appear from the fact that he was altogether taken in by the project and by the financial arguments of those who brought it forward sunderland and stanhope were taken in likewise but there was nothing very surprising in that a statesman of those days did not profess to understand anything about finance or economics unless these subjects happened to belong to his department and the statesman was exceptional who could honestly profess to understand them even when they did walpole however was a minister of a different order he was the first of the line of statesmen financiers he saw through the bubble and endeavoured to make others see as clearly as he did himself walpole assailed the project in a pamphlet and opposed it strenuously in his place in parliament he was not at that time a minister of the crown perhaps if he had been the south sea bill might never have been presented in parliament but the nation and the parliament were off their heads just then the caricaturists and the authors of lampoon verses positively found out the south sea scheme before the financiers and men of the city on january twenty second seventeen twenty the house of commons sitting in what was then termed a grand committee or what would now be called committee of the whole house took into consideration a proposal of the south sea company toward the redemption of the public debts the proposal set forth that quote, the corporation of the government and company of merchants of great britain trading to the south sea and other parts of america and for encouraging the fishery having under their consideration how they may be most serviceable to his majesty and his government and to show their zeal and readiness to concur in the great and honourable design of reducing the national debt do humbly apprehend that if the public debts and annuities mentioned in the annexed estimate were taken into and made part of the capital stock of the said company it would greatly contribute to that most desirable end, end quote. the company then set forth the conditions under which they proposed to convert themselves into an agency for paying off the national debt and making a profit for themselves the proposal fell somewhat short of the general expectation which looked for nothing less than a sort of financial philosopher's stone besides the bank of england was willing to compete with the south sea company if the company could coin money out of cobwebs why should not the bank be able to accomplish the same feat the friends of the bank reminded the house of commons of the great services 
which that corporation had rendered to the government in the most difficult times and urged with much show of justice that if any advantage was to be made by public bargains the bank should be preferred before a company that had never done anything for the nation well might Aileby, the unfortunate chancellor of the exchequer whose shame and ruin we shall soon come to tell of exclaim in the speech which he made when defending himself for the second time before the house of lords that the spirit of bubbling had prevailed so universally that the very bank became a bubble in this not by chance or necessity or from any engagement to raise money for the public service but from the same spirit that actuated temple mills and garraway's fishery in plain truth as poor aleby pointed out the bank started a scheme in imitation of the south sea company and the house of commons gave time for its proper development the bank offered its scheme on february first and by that time the south sea company had seen their way to mend their hand and submit more attractive proposals then the bank not to be outrivalled soon made a second proposal as well the house took the rival propositions into consideration and walpole was the chief advocate of the bank no doubt he had come to the reasonable conclusion that if there could be any hope of success for such a scheme it would be found in the bank of england rather than in the south sea company mr aleby the chancellor of the exchequer made himself the champion of the company and assured the house that its propositions were of far greater advantage to the country than those of the bank under his persuasive influence the house agreed to accept the tender as we may call it of the company and the chancellor of the exchequer mr secretary craggs and others were ordered to prepare and bring in a bill to give legislative sanction to the scheme the bill passed the commons and went up to the house of lords to the credit of the peers it has to be said that they received it more doubtfully and were slower to admit the certainty of its blessings than the members of the representative chamber had been lord north and grey condemned it as not only making way for but actually countenancing and authorizing the fraudulent and pernicious practice of stock jobbing the duke of wharton declared that the artificial and prodigious rise of the south sea stock was a dangerous bait which might decoy many unwary people to their ruin and allure them by a false prospect of gain to part with what they had got by their labour and industry to purchase imaginary riches lord cowper said that the bill like the trojan horse was ushered in and received with great pomp and acclamations of joy but was contrived for treachery and destruction lord sunderland however spoke warmly in favour of the bill and contended that they who countenanced the scheme of the south sea company had nothing in their view but the easing the nation of part of that heavy load of debt it laboured under and argued that the scheme would enable the directors of the company at once to pay off the debt and to secure large dividends to their shareholders the lords decided on admitting the south sea company's trojan horse eighty-three votes were in favour of the bill and only seventeen against it the bill was read a third time on april seventh and received the royal assent on june eleventh the king's speech delivered that day at the close of the session declared that the good foundation you have prepared this session for the payment of the national debts and the discharge of a great part of them without the least violation of the public faith will i hope strengthen more and more the union i desire to see among all my subjects and make our friendship yet more valuable to all foreign powers the immediate result of the parliamentary authority thus given to what was purely a bubble scheme was to bring upon the legislature a perfect deluge of petitions from all manner of projectors patents and monopolies were sought for the carrying on of fisheries in greenland and various other regions for the growth manufacture and sale of hemp flax and cotton for the making of sailcloth for a general insurance against fire for the planting and rearing of matter to be used by dyers for the preparing and curing of virginia tobacco for snuff and making it into the same 
within all his majesty's dominions schemes such as these were comparatively reasonable but there were others of a different kind petitions were gravely submitted to parliament praying for patents to be granted to the projectors of enterprises for trading in hair for the universal supply of funerals to all parts of great britain for ensuring and increasing children's fortunes for ensuring masters and mistresses against losses from the carelessness or misconduct of servants for ensuring against thefts and robberies for extracting silver from lead for the transmutation of silver into malleable fine metal for buying and fitting out ships to suppress pirates for a wheel for perpetual motion and with which project perhaps we may close our list of specimens for carrying on an undertaking of great advantage but nobody to know what it is of course some of these projects were mere vulgar swindles even in that season of marvellous projection it is not to be supposed that the inventors of the last-mentioned scheme had any serious belief in its efficacy the author of the project for the perpetual motion wheel was we take it a sincere personage and enthusiast his scheme has been coming up again and again before the world since his time and we have known good men who would have staked all they held dear in life upon the possibility of its realization but the would-be patentee of the undertaking of great advantage nobody to know what it is was a man of a different order he understood human nature in certain of its moods he knew that there were men and women who can be got to believe in anything which holds out the promise of quick and easy gain if he found a few dozen greedy and selfish fools to help his project with a little money that would no doubt be the full attainment of his ends probably he was successful the very boldness of his avowal of secrecy would have a charm for many one day would be enough for him the day when he sent in his demand for a patent the bare demand would bring him dupes the first great blow struck at the south sea company came from the south sea company itself several bubble companies began to imitate the financial system which the more favored institution had set up the south sea company put in motion certain legal proceedings against some of the offenders the south sea company had the support and countenance of the high legal authorities and found no difficulty in obtaining injunctions against the other associations directing them not to go beyond the strict legal privileges secured to them by their charters of incorporation among the undertakings thus admonished were the english copper company and the welsh copper and lead company his royal highness the prince of wales happened to be a governor of the english copper company and the lord's justices were polite enough to send the prince a message expressing the great regret they felt at having to declare illegal an enterprise with which he was connected the prince not to be outdone in politeness received the admonition we are told very graciously and sent on his part a message to the company requesting them to accept his resignation and to elect someone else a governor in his place the proceedings which the south sea company had set on motion against their audacious rivals and imitators had however the inconvenient effect of directing too much of public attention to the principles upon which they conducted their own business confidence began to waver to be shaken to give way altogether and when people ask whether a speculation is a bubble the bubble if it is one is already burst the whole basis of law's system and of the south sea schemes as well was the principle that the prosperity of a nation is increased in proportion to the quantity of money in circulation and that as no state can have gold enough for all its commercial transactions paper money may be issued to an unlimited extent and its full value maintained without its being convertible at pleasure into hard cash this supposed principle has been proved again and again to be a mere fallacy and paradox but it always finds enthusiastic believers who have plausible arguments in its support it appears indeed to have a singular fascination for some persons in all times and communities it might seem an obvious truism 
that under no possible conditions can people in general be got to give as much for a promise to pay as for a certain and instant payment and yet this truism would have to be proved of falsehood in order to establish a basis for such a project as that of law even were the basis to be established the project would then have to be worked fairly and honestly out which was not done either in the case of the mississippi company or of the south sea company if each had been founded on a true financial principle each was worked in a false and fraudulent way at its best the south sea company in its later development would have been a bubble worked as it actually was it proved to be a swindle a committee of secrecy was appointed by the house of commons to inquire into the condition of the company the committee found that false and fictitious entries had been made in the company's books that leaves had been torn out that some books had been destroyed altogether and that others had been carried off and secreted the vulgar arts of the card sharper and the thimble rigger had been prodigally employed to avert detection and ruin by the directors of a company which was promoted and protected by ministers of state and by the favorites of the king some idea of the widespread nature of the disaster which was inflicted by the wreck of the company may be formed from a rapid glance at some of the petitions for redress and relief which were presented to the house of commons we find among them petitions for the counties of hereford dorset essex buckinghamshire derby the cities of bristol exeter lincoln the boroughs of oakhampton amersham bedford chipping wickham abingdon sudbury east retford evesham newark upon trent newbury and many other places we have purposely omitted to take account of any of the london communities the wildest excitement prevailed and it is characteristic of the time to note that the national calamity for it was no less aroused fresh hopes in the minds of the jacobites such a calamity such a scandal it was thought could not but bring shame and ruin upon the whig ministers and through them discredit on the sovereign and the court it was believed it was hoped that sunderland would be found to be implicated in the swindle why should not such a crisis such a humiliation to the whigs be the occasion of a new and more successful attempt on the part of the jacobites the king was again in hanover he was summoned home in hot haste on december eighth seventeen twenty the two houses of parliament were assembled to hear the reading of the royal speech proroguing the session and in the speech of the king was made to express his concern for the unhappy turn of affairs which has so much affected the public credit at home and to recommend most earnestly to the house of commons that you consider of the most effectual and speedy methods to restore the national credit and fix it upon a lasting foundation you will i doubt not the speech went on to say be assisted in so commendable and necessary a work by every man that loves his country a week or so before the royal speech was read on november thirtieth seventeen twenty charles edward eldest son of james stuart was born at rome the undaunted medal of atterbury came into fresh and vigorous activity with the birth of the stuart heir and the apparent imminent ruin of the whig ministers robert walpole had been spending some time peacefully at his country place houghton in norfolk hunting bull-baiting and drinking were the principal amusements with which walpole entertained his guests there sometimes the guests were persons of royal rank walpole once entertained the grand duke of tuscany sometimes the throng of his visitors and his neighbors to the hunting field could only be compared says a letter writer at the time to an army in its march walpole never lost sight however of what was going on in the metropolis he used to send a trusty norfolk man as his express messenger to run all the way on foot from houghton to london and carry letters for him to confidential friends and bring him back the answers when he found how badly things were going in london on the bursting of the south sea bubble he hastened up to town his presence was sadly needed there it is not without interest to think of james stuart in rome 
and Walpole and Houghton, both keeping their eyes fixed on the gradual exposure of the South Sea swindle, and both alike hoping to find their account in the national calamity. All the advantage was with the statesman and not with the prince. The English people, of all opinions and creeds, were tolerably well assured that if any one could help them out of the difficulty, Walpole could, and it required the faith of the most devoted Jacobite to make any man of business believe that the return of the exiled Stuarts could do much to keep off national bankruptcy. Walpole had waited long. His time was now come at last. Walpole had kept his head cool during the days when the company was soaring to the skies. He kept his head equally cool when it came down with a crash. He had never, he said, in the House of Commons, approved of the South Sea scheme, and was sensible it had done a great deal of mischief. But since it could not be undone, he thought it the duty of all good men to give their helping hand towards retrieving it, and with this view he had already bestowed some thoughts on a proposal to restore public credit, which at the proper time he would submit to the wisdom of the House. Walpole had made money by the South Sea scheme. The sound knowledge of the principles of finance which enabled him to see that the enterprise thus conducted could not pay in the end, enabled him also to see that it could pay up to a certain point, and when that point had been reached he quietly sold out and saved his gains. The king's mistresses and their relatives also made good profit out of the transactions. The Prince of Wales was a gainer of some of the season's speculations, but when the crash came the ruin was widespread. It amounted to the proportions of a national calamity. The ruling classes raged and stormed against the vile conspirators who had disappointed them in their expectations of coining money out of cobwebs. The lords and commons held inquiries and passed resolutions demanding impeachments. It was soon made manifest beyond all doubt that members of the government had been scandalously implicated in the worst parts of the fraudulent speculations. Mr. Aylaby, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, was only too clearly shown to be one of the leading delinquents. Mr. Craggs, the father, Postmaster General, and James Craggs, the son, Secretary of State, were likewise involved. Both were remarkable men. The father had begun life as a common barber, and partly by capacity and partly by the thrift that follows fawning, had made his way up in the world until he reached the height from which he was suddenly and so ignominiously to fall. It was hardly worth the trouble thus to toil and push and climb, only to tumble down with such shame and ruin. Craggs the father had had great transfers of South Sea stock made to him, for which he never paid. Craggs the son, the Secretary of State, had acted as the go-between in the transactions of the company with the king's mistresses, whereby the influence of these ladies was purchased for a handsome consideration. Charles Stanhope, one of the secretaries to the Treasury and cousin of the minister, was shown to have received large value in the stock of the company for which he never paid. The most ghastly ruin fell on some of these men. Craggs the Younger died suddenly on the very day when the report incriminating him was read in the House of Commons. Craggs, the father, poisoned himself a few days afterwards. Pope wrote an epitaph on the son, in which he described him as, Statesman yet friend of truth, of soul sincere, in action faithful and in honor clear, who broke no promise, served no private end, who gained no title, and who lost no friend. Epitaphs seem to have been genuine tributes of personal friendship in those days, they had no reference to merit or to truth. One's friend had every virtue because he was one's friend. Secret committees might condemn, Parliament might degrade, juries might convict, impartial history might stigmatize, but one's friend remains one's friend all the same, and if one had the gift of verse, was to be held up to the admiration of time and eternity in a glorifying epitaph. We have fallen on more prosaic days now. The living admirer, of a modern Craigs would leave his epitaph unwritten if he could not make facts and feelings fit better in together. A better and more eminent man than Aylaby or either Craggs lost his life in consequence of the South Sea calamity. 
no one had accused or even suspected lord stanhope of any share in the financial swindle even the fact that his cousin was one of those accused of guilty complicity with it did not induce any one to believe that the minister of state had any share in the guilt yet stanhope was one of the first victims of the crisis the duke of wharton son of the late minister had just come of age he was already renowned as a brilliant audacious profligate he was president of the hellfire club he and some of his comrades were the nightly terror of london streets wharton thought fit to make himself the champion of public purity in the debates on the south sea company's ruin he attacked the ministers fiercely he attacked stanhope in especial stanhope replied to him with far greater warmth than the weight of any attack from wharton would seem to have called for excited beyond measure stanhope burst a blood vessel in his anger he was carried home and died the next day february fifth seventeen twenty one his life had been pure and noble he was a sincere lover of his country a brave and often a successful soldier a statesman of high purpose if not of the most commanding talents his career as a soldier was brought to a close when he had to capitulate to that master of war and profligacy the duc de vendome an encounter of a different kind with another brilliant profligate robbed him of his life the house of commons promptly passed a series of resolutions declaring john aylaby esq a member of this house then chancellor of the exchequer and one of the commissioners of his majesty's treasury guilty of most notorious dangerous and infamous corruption in ordering his expulsion from the house and his committal as a prisoner to the tower this resolution was carried without a dissentient word the house of commons went on next to consider the part of the report which applied to lord sunderland and a motion was made declaring that after the proposals of the south sea company were accepted by this house and a bill ordered to be brought in thereupon and before such bill passed fifty thousand pounds of the capital stock of the south sea company was taken in by robert knight late cashier of the said company for the use and upon the account of charles earl of sunderland a lord of parliament and first commissioner of the treasury without any valuable consideration paid or sufficient security given for payment for or acceptance of the same sunderland had too many friends however and too much influence to be dealt with as if he were aylaby a fierce debate sprang up the evidence against him was not by any means so clear as in the case of aylaby there was room for doubt as to sunderland's personal knowledge of all that had been done in his name his influence and power secured him the full benefit of the doubt the motion implicating him was rejected by a majority of two hundred and thirty three votes against one hundred and seventy two which however says a contemporary account occasioned various reasonings and reflections charles stanhope too was lucky enough to get off on a division by a very narrow majority a letter from an english traveller at rome to his father bearing date may sixth seventeen twenty one and privately printed this year eighteen eighty four for the first time under the auspices of the clarendon society of edinburgh gives an interesting account of the reception of the writer an english protestant by james stuart and his wife that part of the letter which is of present interest to us tells of the remarks made by james on the subject of the south sea catastrophe james spoke of the investigations of the secret committee from which he had no great hope for he said the authors of the calamity would find means to be above the common course of justice some may imagine continued he that these calamities are not displeasing to me because they may in some measure turn to my advantage i renounce all such unworthy thoughts the love of my country is the first principle of my worldly wishes and my heart bleeds to see so brave and honest a people distressed and misled by a few wicked men and plunged into miseries almost irretrievable thereupon says the writer of the letter he rose briskly from his chair and expressed his concern with fire in his eyes 
exiled sovereigns are in the habit of expressing concern for their country with fire in their eyes they are also in the habit of regarding their own return to power as the one sole means of relieving the country from its distress the english gentleman who describes this scene represents himself as not to be outdone in patriotism of his own even by the exiled prince i could not disavow much of what he said yet i own i was piqued at it for very often compassionate terms from the mouth of an adverse party are grating it appeared to me so on this occasion therefore i replied it's true sir that our affairs in england lie at present under many hardships by the south sea's mismanagement but it is a constant maxim with us protestants to undergo a great deal for the security of our religion which we could not depend upon under a romish government this speech not over polite the prince took in good part and entered upon an argument so skilfully that i am apprehensive i should become half a jacobite if i should continue following these discourses any longer therefore says the writer i will give you my word i will enter no more upon arguments of this kind with him the prince and his visitor were perhaps both playing a part to some extent and the whole discourse was probably a good deal less theatric in style than the english traveller has reported but there can be no doubt that the letter fairly illustrates the spirit in which the leading jacobites watched over the financial troubles in england and the new hopes with which they were inspired hopes destined to be translated into new action before very long nor can it be denied that the speech of the english visitor correctly represented the feeling which was growing stronger day after day in the minds of prudent people at home in england the time was coming had almost come when a political disturbance or a financial panic in these kingdoms was to be accounted sufficient occasion for a change of ministers but not for a revolution End of chapter eleven section fourteen of a history of the four georges in four volumes volume one by justin mccarthy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter twelve after the storm swift wrote more than one poem on the south sea mania that which was written in seventeen twenty one and is called south sea is a wonder of wit and wisdom it shows the hollowness of the scheme in some new odd and striking light in every metaphor and every verse a guinea swift reminds his readers will not pass at market for a farthing more shown through a magnifying glass than what it always did before so cast it in the southern seas and view it through a jobber's bill put on what spectacles you please your guinea's but a guinea still other poets had not as much prudence and sound sense as swift pope put some of his money a good deal of it into south sea stock contrary to the earnest advice of atterbury and lost it swift reflected faithfully the temper of the time in savage verses which call out for the punishment by death of the fraudulent directors of the company antaeus swift tells us was always restored to fresh strength as often as he touched the earth hercules subdued him at last by holding him up in the air and strangling him there suspended a little while in the air according to the same principles our directors he admonishes the country will be properly tamed and dealt with many public enemies of the directors gave themselves credit for moderation and humanity on the ground that they would not have the culprits tortured to death but merely executed in the ordinary way walpole set himself first of all to restore public credit his object was not so much the punishment of fraudulent directors as the tranquillizing of the public mind and the subsidence of national panic he proposed one measure in the first instance to accomplish this end but that not being sufficiently comprehensive he introduced another bill which was finally adopted by both houses of parliament briefly described this scheme so adjusted the financial affairs of the south sea company that five millions of the seven which the directors had agreed to pay the public was remitted 
the encumbrances of the company were cleared off to a certain extent by the confiscation of the estates of the fraudulent directors the credit of the company's bonds was maintained thirty three pounds six shillings and eight pence per cent were divided amongst the proprietors and two million were reserved toward the liquidation of the national debt the company was therefore put into a position to carry out its various public engagements and the panic was soon over many of the proprietors of the company complained bitterly of the manner in which they had been treated by walpole the lobbies of the house of commons and all the adjacent places were crowded by proprietors of the short annuities and other redeemable popular deeds men and women who as the contemporary accounts tell us in a rude and insolent manner demanded justice of the members as they went into the house and put into their hands a paper with the words written on it pray do justice to the annuitants who lent their money on parliamentary security the noisy multitude we are told was particularly rude to mr comptroller tearing part of his coat as he passed by the speaker of the house was informed that a crowd of people had got together in a riotous and tumultuous manner in the lobbies and passages and he ordered that the justices of the peace for the city of westminster do immediately attend this house and bring the constables with them while the justices and the constables were being sent for sir john ward was presenting to the house a petition from the proprietors of the redeemable funds setting forth that they had lent their money to the south sea company on parliamentary security that they had been unwarily drawn into subscribing for the shares in the company by the artifices of the directors and they prayed that they might be heard by themselves or their counsel against walpole's measure the bill for making several provisions to restore the public credit which suffers by the frauds and mismanagement of the late south sea directors and others walpole opposed the petition and said he did not see how the petitioners could be relieved seeing that the resolutions in pursuance of which his bill was brought in had been approved by the king and council and by a great majority of the house walpole therefore moved that the debate be adjourned in order to get rid of the matter the motion was carried by seventy-eight votes against twenty-nine by this time four justices for the city of westminster had arrived and were brought to the bar of the house the speaker informed them that there was a great crowd of riotous people in the lobbies and passages and that he was commanded by the house to direct them to go and disperse the crowd and take care to prevent similar riots in the future the four justices attended by five or six constables desired the petitioners to clear the lobbies and when they refused to do so caused a proclamation against rioters to be twice read warning them at the same time that if they remained until the third reading they would have to incur the penalties of the act what the penalties of the act were and what the four justices and five or six constables could have done with the petitioners if the petitioners had refused to listen to reason do not seem very clear the petitioners however did listen to reason and dispersed before the fatal third reading of the proclamation but they did not disperse without giving the house of commons and the justices a piece of their mind many exclaimed that they had come as peaceable citizens and subjects to represent their grievances and had not expected to be used like a mob and scoundrels and others as they went out shouted to the members of parliament you first pick our pockets and then send us to jail for complaining the bill went up to the house of lords on monday august seventh and the lords agreed to it without an amendment on thursday august tenth parliament was prorogued the lord chancellor read the king's speech the common calamity said his majesty occasioned by the wicked execution of the south sea scheme was become so very great before your meeting that the providing proper remedies for it was very difficult but it is a great comfort to me to observe that public credit now begins to recover which gives me the greatest hopes that it will be entirely restored when all the provisions you have made for that end shall be duly put in execution the speech went on to tell of his majesty's great compassion for the sufferings of the innocent and a just indignation against the guilty and added that the king had readily given his assent to such bills as you have presented to me 
for punishing the authors of our late misfortunes and for obtaining the restitution and satisfaction due to those who have been injured by them in such a manner as you judged proper certainly there was no lack of severity in the punishment inflicted on the fraudulent directors their estates were confiscated with such rigour that some of them were reduced to miserable poverty they were disqualified from ever holding any public place or office whatever and from ever having a seat in parliament yet severely as they were punished the outcry of the public at the time was that they had been let off far too easily walpole was denounced because he did not carry their punishment much farther there was even a ridiculous report spread abroad that he had defended sunderland and screened the directors from the most ignoble and sordid motives in that he had been handsomely paid for his compromise with crime nothing would have satisfied some of the sufferers by the south sea scheme short of the execution of its principal directors even the scaffold however could hardly have dealt more stern and summary justice on the criminals as some of them undoubtedly were than did the actual course of events when the storm cleared away aylaby was ruined craggs the postmaster-general was dead craggs the secretary of state was dead lord stanhope who was really innocent was really unsuspected of any share in the crimes of the fraudulent directors was dead also sunderland was no longer a minister of state and the shadow of death was already on him it was not merely the bursting of a bubble it was the bursting of a shell it mutilated or killed those who stood round and near by the time of the new elections for parliament was now nearly run its course public tranquillity was entirely restored parliament was dissolved in march of seventeen twenty two and the new election left walpole and his friends in power with an immense majority at their back long before the new parliament had time to assemble lord sunderland suddenly died of heart disease on april nineteenth seventeen twenty two his death took place and it was so unexpected that a wild outcry was raised by some of his friends who insisted that his enemies had poisoned him the medical examination proved however that sunderland's disease was one which might at any moment of excitement have brought on his death nearly all the leading public men who innocent or guilty had been mixed up with the evil schemes of the south sea company were now in the grave the field seemed now clear and open to walpole the death of sunderland following so soon on that of stanhope had left him apparently without a rival sunderland had been to the last a political and even a personal enemy of walpole although walpole had gone so far to protect sunderland against the house of commons and against public opinion with regard to his share in the south sea company's transactions sunderland could not forgive walpole because walpole was rising higher in the state because he was in fact the greater man though sunderland was compelled by public opinion to resign office he had contrived up to the hour of his death to maintain his influence over the mind of king george fortunately for george the king had too much clear good sense not to recognize the priceless worth of walpole's advice and walpole's services sunderland tried one ingenious artifice to get rid of walpole he suggested to george that walpole's merits required some special and permanent recognition and he recommended that the king should create walpole postmaster-general for life such an office indeed would have brought walpole an ample revenue supposing he stood in need of money which he did not but it would have disqualified him for ever for a seat in parliament perhaps no better illustration of sunderland's narrow intellect and utter lack of judgment could be found than the supposition that this shallow trick could succeed and that the greatest administrator of his time could be thus quietly withdrawn from parliamentary life and from the higher work of the state and shelved in perpetuity as a postmaster-general king george was not to be taken in after this fashion he asked sunderland whether walpole wished for such an office or was acquainted with sunderland's intention to make the suggestion sunderland had to answer both questions in the negative then said the king pray do not make him any such offer or say anything about it to him i had to part with him once much against my will and so long as he is willing to serve me i will never part with him again 
This incident shows that if Sunderland had lived, he would have plotted against Walpole to the end, and would have stood in Walpole's way to the best of his power, and with all the unforgiving hostility of the narrow-minded and selfish man who has had services rendered him for which he ought to feel grateful but cannot. A far greater man than Sunderland was soon to pass away. From Marlborough's eyes the streams of dotage flow. These are the famous words in which Johnson depicts the miserable decay of a great spirit, and points anew the melancholy moral of the vanity of human wishes. Hardly a line in the poetry of our language is better known or more often quoted. Where did Johnson get the idea that Marlborough had sunk into dotage before his death? There's not the slightest foundation for such a belief. All that we know of Marlborough's closing days tells us the contrary. Nothing in Marlborough's life, not even his serene disregard of dangers and difficulties, not even his victories, became him like the leaving of it. No great man ever sank more gracefully, more gently, with a calmer spirit down to his rest. We get some charming pictures of Marlborough's closing days. Death had given him warning by repeated paralytic strokes. On November 27, 1721, he was seen for the last time in the House of Lords. He was not, however, quite near his death even then. He used to spend his time at Blenheim or at his lodge in Windsor. To the last, he was fond of riding and driving and the fresh country air. Indoors, he loved to be surrounded by his granddaughters and their young friends, and to join in games of cards and other amusements with them. They used to get up private theatricals to gratify the gentle old warrior. We hear of a version of Dryden's All for Love being thus performed. The Duchess of Marlborough had cut out of the play its unseemly passages, and even its two amorous expressions. The reader will probably think there was not much left of the piece when this work of purification had been accomplished, and she would not allow any embracing to be performed. The gentleman who played Mark Antony wore a sword which had been presented to Marlborough by the Emperor. The part of the high priest was played by a pretty girl, a friend of Marlborough's granddaughters, and she wore, as high priest's robe, what seems to have been a lady's nightdress, gorgeously embroidered with special devices for the occasion. A prologue written by Dr. Hoadley was read, in which the glories of the great Duke's career were glowingly recounted. Some painter, it seems to us, might make a pretty picture of this. The great hall in Blenheim turned into a theatre, the handsome young men and pretty girls enacting their chastened parts, the fading old hero looking at the scene with pleased and kindly eyes, and the imperious loving old duchess turning her devoted gaze on him. So fades, so languishes, grows dim and dies, the conqueror of Blenheim, the greatest soldier England ever had since the days when kings ceased to be, as a matter of right, her chiefs in command. In the early days of June 1722, Marlborough was stricken by another paralytic seizure, and this was his last. He was in full possession of his senses to the end, perfectly conscious and calm. He knew that he was dying. He had prayers read to him. He conveyed in many tender ways his feelings of affection for his wife and of hope for his own future. At four in the morning of June 16th, his life ebbed quietly away. He was in his seventy-second year when he died. None of the great deeds of his life belong to this history. None of that life's worse offenses have much to do with it. Marlborough's career seems to us absolutely faultless in two of its aspects, as a commander and as a husband. We can only give him praise. He was probably a greater commander than even the Duke of Wellington. If he never had to encounter a Napoleon, he had to meet and triumph over difficulties which never came in Wellington's way. It was not Wellington's fate to have to strive against political treachery of the basest kind on the part of English ministers of state. Wellington's enemies were all in the field arrayed against him. Marlborough had to fight the foreign enemy on the battlefield and to struggle meanwhile against the persistent treachery of the still more formidable enemy at home in the council chamber of his own sovereign. Perhaps, indeed, Wellington's nature would not have permitted him to succeed under such difficulties. Wellington could hardly have met craft with craft, and it must be added falsehood with falsehood, as Marlborough did. We have said in this book already 
that even for that age of double dealing marlborough was a surprising double dealer and there were many passages in his career which are evidences of an astounding capacity for deceit he was a great man said his enemy lord peterborough and i have forgotten his faults historians would gladly do the same if they could would surely dwell with much more delight on the virtues and the greatness than on the defects the english people were generous to marlborough and in the way which it has to be confessed was most welcome to him but if a very treasure house of gold could not have satisfied his love of money let it be added that the national treasure house itself were it poured out at his feet could not have overpaid the services which he had rendered to his country marlborough left no son to inherit his honours and his fortune his titles and estates descended to his eldest daughter the countess of godolphin she died without leaving a son and the titles and estates passed over to the earl of sunderland the son and heir of marlborough's second daughter at that time long dead from the day when the victor of blenheim died there has been no duke of marlborough distinguished in anything but the name not one of the world's great soldiers it would seem was destined to have a great soldier for a son from great statesmen fathers sometimes spring great statesmen sons but alexander hannibal julius caesar charles the twelfth alexander farnese clive marlborough frederick napoleon wellington washington left to the world no heir of their greatness End of chapter 12section fifteen of a history of the four georges in four volumes volume one by justin mccarthy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter thirteen the banishment of atterbury on thursday august ninth seventeen twenty two the pompous solemnity of marlborough's funeral took place the great procession went from the duke's house in st james's park through St. James's and the Upper Park to Hyde Park Corner, and thence through Piccadilly, St. James's Street, Pell Mell, Charing Cross, and King Street to Westminster Abbey. A small army of soldiers guarded the remains of the greatest warrior of his age. A whole herald's college clustered about the lofty funeral banner on which all the arms of the Churchills were quartered. Marlborough's friends and admirers, his old brothers in arms, the companions of his victories followed his coffin and listened while garter knight at arms bending over the open grave said thus it hath pleased almighty god to take out of this transitory life unto his mercy the most high most mighty and most noble prince john churchill duke and earl of marlborough in appleby's weekly journal for saturday august eleventh two days after the funeral we are told that the Duchess of Marlborough, in honour of the memory of her lifelong lover, had offered a prize of five hundred pounds for a Latin epitaph to be inscribed upon his tomb, and that several poets have already taken to their lofty studies to contend for the prize. At Marlborough's funeral, we see for the last time in high public estate one of the few Englishmen of the day who could properly be named in the same breath with Marlborough. This was Francis Atterbury, the eloquent and daring Bishop of Rochester. Atterbury came up to town for the purpose of officiating at the funeral of the great Duke. On July 30th, 1722, he wrote from the country to his friend Pope, announcing his visit to London. I go tomorrow, Atterbury writes, to the deanery, and I believe I shall stay there till I have said dust to dust and shut up this last scene of pompous vanity. Atterbury does not seem to have been profoundly impressed with the religious solemnity of the occasion. His was not a very reverential spirit. There was as little of the temper of pious sanctity in Atterbury as in Swift himself. The allusion to the last scene of pompous vanity might have had another significance as well as that which Atterbury meant to give it. Amid the pomp in which Marlborough's career went out, the career of Atterbury went out as well, although in a different way, and not closed sublimely by death. After the funeral, Atterbury went to the deanery at Westminster, 
he was dean of westminster as well as bishop of rochester and there on august twenty fourth the day but one after the scene of pompous vanity he was arrested by the under secretary of state accompanied by two officers of justice and was brought along with all papers of his which the officers could seize before the privy council he underwent an examination as the result of which he was committed to the tower on a charge of having been concerned in a treasonable conspiracy to dethrone the king and to bring back the house of stuart in the tower he was left to languish for many a long day before it was found convenient to bring him to trial england was startled by the disclosures which followed atterbury's arrest on tuesday october ninth seventeen twenty two the sixth parliament of great britain the sixth that is to say since the union with scotland met at westminster the house of commons on the motion of mr pulteney elected mr spencer compton their speaker and on the next day but one october eleven the royal speech was read the king was present in person but the speech was read by the lord chancellor for the good reason which we have already mentioned that his majesty the king of england could not speak the english language the speech opened with a startling announcement my lords and gentlemen so ran the words of the sovereign i am concerned to find myself obliged at the opening of this parliament to acquaint you that a dangerous conspiracy has been for some time formed and is still carrying on against my person and government in favor of a popish pretender some of the conspirators the speech went on to say have been taken up and secured and endeavors are used for the apprehending others when the speech was read and the king had left the house the duke of grafton then lord lieutenant of ireland brought in a bill for suspending the habeas corpus act and empowering the government to secure and detain such persons as his majesty shall suspect are conspiring against his person and government for the space of one year the motion to read the bill a second time in the same sitting was strenuously resisted by a considerable minority of the peers a warm debate took place and in the end the second reading was carried by a majority of sixty-seven against twenty-four the debate was renewed upon the other stages of the bill which was taken in rapid succession the proposal of the government was of course carried in the end but it met with a resistance in the house of lords which certainly would not have been offered to such a proposal by any member of the hereditary chamber in our day some of the recorded protests of dissentient peers read more like the utterances of modern radicals than those of influential members of the house of lords the strongest objection made to the proposal was that the utmost term for which the constitution had previously been suspended was six months and that the measure to suspend it for a year would become an authority for suspending it at some future time for two years or three years or any term which might please the ministers in power on monday october fifteenth the bill was brought down to the commons and was read a first time on the motion of walpole the bill was passed in the commons not indeed without opposition but with an opposition much less strenuous and influential than that which had been offered to it in the house of lords on october seventeenth it was announced to parliament that dr atterbury the bishop of rochester the lord north and gray and the earl of orrery had been committed to the tower on a charge of high treason a few days later a similar announcement was made about the arrest and committal of the duke of norfolk by far the most important of the persons committed for trial was the bishop of rochester francis atterbury may rank among the most conspicuous public men of his time he stands only just beneath marlborough and bolingbroke and walpole steele in his sixty-sixth tatler pays a high tribute to atterbury he has so much regard to his congregation that he commits to memory what he has to say to them and has so soft and graceful a behaviour that it must attract your attention his person it is to be confessed is no slight recommendation but he is to be highly commended for not losing that advantage and adding to a propriety of speech which might pass the criticism of longinus an action which would have been approved by demosthenes 
He had a peculiar force in his way, and as many of his audience could not be intelligent hearers of his discourse, were there not explanation as well as grace in his action. This art of his is used with the most exact and honest skill. He never attempts your passions until he has convinced your reason. All the objections which he can form are laid open and dispersed before he uses the least vehemence in his sermon. But when he thinks he has your head, he very soon wins your heart, and never pretends to show the beauty of holiness, until he hath convinced you of the truth of it. Atterbury had, however, among his many gifts, a dangerous gift of political intrigue. Like Swift and Dubois and Alberoni, he was at least as much statesman as churchman. He had mixed himself up in various intrigues. Some of them could hardly be called conspiracies, for the restoration of the Stuarts, and when at last something like a new conspiracy was planned, it was not likely that he would be left out of it. He had courage enough for any such scheme. There was no great difficulty in finding out the new plot which King George mentioned in his speech to Parliament, for James Stuart had revealed it himself by a proclamation which he caused to be circulated among his supposed adherents in England, renewing in the boldest terms his claim to the crown of England. A sort of junto of Jacobites appears to have been established in England to make arrangements for a new attempt on the part of James. The noblemen whom King George had arrested were understood to be among its leading members. Atterbury was charged with having taken a prominent, if not indeed a foremost part in the conspiracy. The Duke of Norfolk, Lord North and Grey, and Lord Orrery were afterwards discharged for want of evidence to convict them. The arrest of a number of humbler conspirators led to the discovery of a correspondence asserted to have been carried on between Atterbury and the adherents of James Stuart in France and Italy. Both Houses of Parliament began by voting addresses of loyalty and gratitude to the king, and by resolving that the proclamation entitled Declaration of James the Third, King of England, Scotland, and Ireland, to all his loving subjects of the three nations, and signed James Rex, was a false, insolent, and traitorous libel, and should be burnt by the hands of the common hangman under the direction of the sheriffs of London. This important ceremonial was duly carried out at the Royal Exchange. Then, the House of Commons voted that towards raising the supply and reimbursing to the public the great expenses occasioned by the late rebellions and disorders, the sum of one hundred thousand pounds be raised and levied upon the real and personal estates of all papists, popist recusants, or persons educated in the popish religion, or whose parents are papists, or who shall profess the popish religion in lieu of all forfeitures already incurred for or upon account of their recusancy. This singular method of infusing a loyalty into the Roman Catholics of England was not allowed to be adopted without serious and powerful resistance in the House of Commons. The idea was not to devise a new penalty for the Catholics, but to put in actual operation the terms of a former penalty pronounced against them in Elizabeth's time, and not then passed into execution. This fact was dwelt upon with much emphasis by the advocates of the penal motion. Why talk of religious persecution, they asked. This is not religious persecution. It is only putting in force an edict passed in a former reign to punish Roman Catholics for political rebellion. This way of putting the case seems only to make the character of the policy more clear and less justifiable. The Catholics of King George's time were to be mulked indiscriminately because the Catholics of Queen Elizabeth's time had been declared liable to such a penalty. The master of the rolls, to his great credit, strongly opposed the resolution. Walpole supported it with all the weight of his argument and his influence. The plot was evidently a popish plot, he contended, and although he was not prepared to accuse any English Catholic in particular of taking part in it, yet there could be no doubt that papists in general were well-wishers to it, and that some of them had contributed large sums toward it. Why, then, should they not be made to reimburse some part of the expense to which they and the friends of the pretender had put the nation? The resolution, after it had been reported from committee, was only carried in the whole house 
by 188 votes against 172. The resolution was embodied in a bill, and the bill, when it went up to the House of Lords, was opposed there by several of the peers, and especially by Lord Cowper, the silver-tongued Cowper, who had been so distinguished a Lord Chancellor under Anne and under George himself. Lord Cowper's was an eloquent and a powerful speech. It tore to pieces the wretched web of flimsy sophistry by which the supporters of the bill endeavoured to make out that it was not a measure of religious persecution. Indeed, there were some of those who insisted that so far from being a measure of persecution, it was a measure of relief. Our readers will no doubt be curious to know how this bold position was sustained. In this wise, the penalties prescribed for the Catholics in Elizabeth's reign were much greater in amount than those which the bill proposed to inflict on the Catholics of King George's time. Therefore, the bill was an indulgence, and not a persecution, a mitigation of penalty, not a punishment. Let us reduce the argument to plain figures. A Catholic in the reign of Elizabeth is declared liable to a penalty of twenty pounds, but out of considerations of humanity or justice, the penalty is not enforced. The descendant and heir of that same Catholic in the reign of George I is fined fifteen pounds, and the fine is exacted. He complains, and he is told, You have no right to complain. You ought to be grateful. The original fine ordained was twenty pounds. You have been let off five pounds. You have been favored by an act of indulgence, not victimized by an act of persecution. Lord Cowper had not much trouble in disposing of arguments of this kind, but his speech took a wider range and is indeed a masterly exposure of the whole principle on which the measure was founded. On May 23, 1723, 69 peers voted for the third reading of the bill and 55 opposed it. Lord Cowper, with 20 other peers, entered a protest against the decision of the House according to a practice then common in the House of Lords, and which has lately fallen into complete disuse. The recorded protests of dissentient peers form, we may observe, very important historical documents, and deserve, some of them, a careful study. Lord Cowper's protest was the last public act of his useful and honorable career. He died on the 10th of October in the same year, 1723. Some of his enemies explained his action on the anti-papist bill by the assertion that he was a Jacobite at heart. Even if he had been, the fact would hardly have made his conduct less creditable and spirited. Many a man who was a Jacobite at heart would have supported a measure for the punishment of Roman Catholics, if only to save himself from the suspicion of sympathy with the lost cause. This, however, was but an episode in the story of the Jacobite plot and the measures taken to punish those who were engaged in it. Committees of secrecy were appointed by Parliament to inquire into the evidence and examine witnesses. Meantime, both Houses of Parliament kept voting address after address to the Crown at each new stage of the proceedings, and as each fresh evidence of the conspiracy was laid before them. The king must have grown rather weary of finding new words of gratitude, and the Houses of Parliament, one would think, must have grown tired of inventing new phrases of loyalty and fresh expression of horror at the wickedness of the Jacobites. The horror was not quite genuine on the part of some of those who thus proclaimed it. Many of those who voted the addresses would gladly have welcomed a restoration of the Stuarts. Not the most devoted adherent, of King George could really have felt any surprise at the persistent efforts of the Jacobite partisans. Eight years before this, it was a mere toss-up whether Stuart or Hanover should succeed, and even still it was not quite certain whether if the machinery of the modern plebiscite could have been put into operation in England, the majority would not have been found in sympathy with Atterbury. It is almost certain that if the plebiscite could have been taken in Ireland and Scotland also, a majority of voices would have voted James Stuart to the throne. It was resolved to proceed against Atterbury by a bill of pains and penalties to be brought into Parliament. The evidence against him was certainly not such as any criminal court would have held to justify a conviction. A young barrister named Christopher Layer, 
was arrested and examined, so were a non-juring minister named Kelly, an Irish Catholic priest named Naino, and a man named Plunkett, also from Ireland. The charge against Atterbury was founded on the statements obtained or extorted from these men. It should be said that Layer gave evidence which actually seemed to impugn Lord Cowper himself as a member of a club of disaffected persons, and when Lord Cowper indignantly repudiated the charge and demanded an inquiry, the government declared inquiry absolutely unnecessary, as everybody was well assured of his innocence. The government, however, declined to follow Lord Cowper in his not unreasonable assumption that the whole story was unworthy of explicit credence when it included such a false statement. The case against Atterbury rested on the declaration of some of the arrested men that the bishop had carried on a correspondence with James Stewart, Lord Marr, and General Dillon, an Irish Catholic soldier who, after the capitulation of Limerick, had entered the French service through the instrumentality of Kelly, who acted as his secretary and amanuensis for that purpose. It was a case of circumstantial evidence altogether. The impartial reader of history now will feel well satisfied on two points. First, that Atterbury was engaged in the plot, and second, that the evidence brought against him was not nearly strong enough to sustain a conviction. It was the case of Bolingbroke and Harley over again. We know now that the men had done the things charged against them, but the evidence then relied upon was utterly inadequate to sustain the charge. A dialogue and verse between a Whig and a Tory was written by Swift in the year 1723 concerning the horrid plot discovered by Harlequin, the Bishop of Rochester's French dog. The Whig tells the Tory that the dog, his name is Harlequin, I wot, and that's a name in every plot, was generously resolved to save the British nation, though French by birth and education. His correspondence, plainly dated, was all deciphered and translated. His answers were exceeding pretty before the secret wise committee, confessed as plain as he could bark, then with his forefoot set his mark. There was more than mere fooling in the lines. The dog Harlequin was made to bear important evidence against the Bishop of Rochester, Atterbury had never resigned himself to the Hanoverian dynasty. He did not believe it would last, and he openly declaimed against it. He did more than this, however. He engaged in conspiracies for the restoration of James Stuart. Horace Walpole says of him that he was simply a Jacobite priest. He was a Jacobite priest who would gladly, if he could, have been a Jacobite soldier, and had given ample evidence of courage equal to such a part. He had been engaged in a long correspondence with Jacobite conspirators at home and abroad. The correspondence was carried on in cipher and, of course, under feigned names. Atterbury appears to have been described now as Mr. Illington and now as Mr. Jones. Atterbury refused to make any defense before the House of Commons, but he appeared before the House of Lords on May 6, 1723, and defended himself and made strong and eloquent protestation of his innocence. One of the witnesses whom he called in his defense was his friend Pope, who could only give evidence as to the manner in which the bishop had passed his time when staying in the poet's house. Christopher Layer, Atterbury's associate in the general charge of conspiracy, was a young barrister of good family, a remarkably handsome, graceful, and accomplished man. One charge against him was that he had formed a plan to murder the king and carry off the Prince of Wales, but the statements made against Layer must be taken with liberal allowance for the extravagance of loyal passion, panic, and exaggeration. Layer had escaped and was recaptured, was tried, found guilty, and sentenced to death. He was hanged at Tyburn on March fifteenth, 1723. He met his death with calm courage. His body was quartered and his head was set on Temple Bar, from which it was presently blown down by the wind. Someone picked up the head and sold it to a surgeon. Naino, another of the accused men, contrived to escape from custody, got to the river, endeavored to swim across it, and was drowned in the attempt. The charges made against Atterbury had therefore sometimes to rest upon inferences drawn from confessions or portions of confessions 
averred to have been dropped or been drawn from men whose lips were now closed by death. Those who defended Atterbury dwelt strongly on this fact, as was but natural. It is curious to notice how often in the debate of the Lords on the Bill of Pains and Penalties one noble peer accuses another of secret sympathy with Jacobite schemes. As regards Atterbury, the whole question was whether he was really the person described in the correspondence, now as Jones and now as Illington. There might have been no evidence which even a secret wise committee of that day would have cared to accept but for the fact that the bishop's wife had received or was to have received from France a present of a dog called Harlequin, and that there was mentioned in the correspondence about poor Mr. Illington being in grief for the loss of his dog Harlequin. This allusion put the committee of secrecy on the track. The bishop's wife had lately died, and it would seem from the correspondence that Illington's wife had died about the same time. Clearly, if it were once assumed that Illington and Atterbury were one and the same person, there was ample ground for suspicion, and even for a general belief that the story told was true in the main. The evidence was enough for Parliament at that time, and the bill passed the House of Lords on May 16th by a majority of 83 votes to 43. Atterbury was deprived of all his offices and dignities, declared to be forever incapable of holding any place or exercising any authority within the king's dominions, and condemned to perpetual banishment. He went to France in the first instance with his daughter and her husband. It so happened that Bolingbroke had just at that time obtained a sort of conditional pardon from the king, obtained it mainly by bribing the Duchess of Kendal. The two Jacobites crossed each other on the way, one going into exile, the other returning from it. I am exchanged, was Atterbury's remark. The nation, said Pope afterwards, is afraid of being overrun with genius and cannot regain one great man but at the expense of another. So far as this history is concerned, we part with Atterbury here. He lived abroad until 1731, and after his death his remains were brought back and privately laid in Westminster Abbey. We have directed attention to the freedom and frequency of the accusations of Jacobitism made by one peer against another during the debates on Atterbury's case. The fact is worthy of note, if only to show how uncertain, even still, was the foundation of the throne of Brunswick, and how widespread the sympathy with the lost cause was supposed to be. When Bolingbroke was allowed to return to England, some of Swift's friends instantly fancied that he must have purchased his permission by telling some tale against the dean himself, among others, and long after this time we find Swift defending himself against the rumoured accusation of a share in Jacobite conspiracy. The condition of the public mind is well pictured in a description of two imaginary politicians in one of the successors to the Tatler. Tom Tempest is described as a steady friend of the House of Stuart. He can recount the prodigies that have appeared in the sky, and the calamities that have afflicted the nation every year from the Revolution, and is of opinion that if the exiled family had continued to reign, there would neither have been worms in our ships nor caterpillars in our trees. He firmly believes that King William burnt Whitehall that he might steal the furniture, and that Tillotson died an atheist. Of Queen Anne he speaks with more tenderness, owns that she meant well, and can tell by whom she was poisoned. Tom has always some new promise that we shall see in another month the rightful monarch on the throne. Jack Sneaker, on the other hand, is a devoted adherent to the present establishment. He has known those who saw the bed in which the pretender was conveyed in a warming pan. He often rejoices that this nation was not enslaved by the Irish. He believes that King William never lost a battle, and that if he had lived one year longer, he would have conquered France. Yet amid all this satisfaction, he is hourly disturbed by dread of popery wonders that stricter laws are not made against the papists, and is sometimes afraid that they are busy with French gold among our bishops and judges. End of chapter 13。section 16 of A History of the Four Georges in Four Volumes, Volume 1 by Justin McCarthy, 1789-1852. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 14. Walpole in Power as Well as Office. Walpole was now Prime Minister. The King wished to reward him for his services by conferring a peerage on him, but this honour Walpole steadily declined. One of his biographers says that his refusal at first appears extraordinary. It ought not to appear extraordinary at first or at last. Walpole knew that the sceptre of government in England had passed to the House of Commons. He would have been unwise and inconsistent indeed if, at his time of life, he had consented to renounce the influence and the power which a seat in the House gave him for the comparative insignificance and obscurity of a seat in the House of Lords. He accepted a title for his eldest son, who was made Baron Walpole, but for himself he preferred to keep to the field in which he had won his name, and where he could make his influence and power felt all over the land. We may anticipate the course of events, and say at once that hardly ever before in the history of English political life, and hardly ever since Walpole's time, has a minister had so long a run of power. His long administration, as Mr. Green well says, is almost without a history. It is almost without a history, that is to say, in the ordinary sense of the word. For the most part, the steady movement of England's progress remains during long years and years undisturbed by any event of great dramatic interest at home or abroad. But the period of Walpole's long and successful administration was none the less a period of the highest importance in English history. It was a time of almost uninterrupted national development in the right direction and almost unbroken national prosperity. The foreign policy of Walpole was, on the whole, no less sound and just than his policy at home. His first ambition was to keep England out of wars with foreign powers. Yet this was not the ambition which some later statesmen, especially, for example, Mr. Bright, have owned, the ambition to keep England free of any foreign policy whatever. Such an ambition was not Walpole's, and such an ambition at Walpole's time it would have been all but impossible to realize. Walpole knew well that there was no way of keeping England out of foreign wars at that season of political growth but by securing for her a commanding influence in continental affairs. Such influence he set himself to establish, and he succeeded in establishing it by friendly and satisfactory alliances with France and other powers. Turning back for a moment into the political affairs of a year or two previous, we may remark that one of the consequences of the Mississippi scheme and the reign of Mr. Law in France had been the recall of Lord Stair from the French court, to which he was accredited as English ambassador. Lord Stair quarrelled with Law when Law was all-powerful, and in order to propitiate the financial dictator, it was found convenient to recall Stair from Paris. England had been well served by him as her ambassador at the French court. We have already said something of Lord Stair, his ability, courage, and dexterity, his winning ways, and his fearless spirit. John Dalrymple, second Earl of Stair, was one of the remarkable men of his time. He was a scholar and an orator, a soldier and a diplomatist. He had fought with conspicuous bravery and skill under William the Third and under Marlborough. He appears to have combined a daring that looked like recklessness with a cool calculation which made it prudence. On Marlborough's fall, Lord Stair fell with him. He was deprived of all his public offices and was plunged into a condition of something like poverty. When George I came to the throne, Stair was taken into favor again, and as a special tribute to his diplomatic capacity, was sent to represent England at the court of France. There he displayed consummate sagacity, foresight, and firmness. He contrived to make himself acquainted beforehand with everything the Jacobites were doing. This, as may be seen by Bolingbroke's complaints, was easy enough at one time, but the adherents of James Stuart began after a while to learn prudence, and some of their enterprises were conducted up to a certain point with much craft and caution. Lord Stair, however, always contrived to get the information he wanted. Some of the arts by which he accomplished this purpose were not, perhaps, 
such as great diplomatists of our time would have cared to practice. He bribed with liberal hand. He kept persons of all kinds in his pay. He bribed French officials and even French ministers. He got to know all that was done in the most secret councils of the state. He used to go about the capital in disguise in order to find out what people were saying in the wine shops and coffee houses. Often, after he had entertained a brilliant company of guests at a state dinner, he would make some excuse to his friends for quitting them abruptly, say that he had received dispatches which required his instant attention, leave the company to be entertained by his wife, withdraw to his study, there quietly change his clothes, and then wander out to one of his nightly visitations of taverns and coffee-houses. He paid court to great ladies, flattered them, allowed them to win money at cards from him, and even made love to them for the sake of getting some political secrets out of them. He had a noble and stately presence, a handsome face, and charming manners. He is said to have been the most polite and well-bred man of his time. It is of him the story is told about the test of good breeding which the king of france applied and acknowledged louis the fourteenth had heard it said that stair was the best-bred man of his day the king invited stair to drive out with him as they were about to enter the carriage the king signed to the english ambassador to go first stair bowed and entered the carriage the world is right about lord stair said the king i never before saw a man who could not have troubled me with excuses and ceremony. The French government naturally feared that the recall of Lord Stair might be marked by a change in the friendly disposition of England. This fear became greater on the death of Stanhope. The English government, however, took steps to reassure the regent of France. Townsend himself wrote at once to Cardinal Dubois, promising to maintain as before a cordial friendship with the French government. Walpole was entirely imbued with the instincts of such a policy. The chief disturbing influence in continental politics arose from the anxiety of Spain to recover Gibraltar and Minorca, and, in fact, to get back again all that had been taken from her by the Treaty of Utrecht. The territorial and other arrangements which concluded with the Treaty of Utrecht made themselves the central point of all the foreign policy of that time. These states were concerned to maintain the treaty. Those were eager to break through its bonds. It holds in the politics of that day the place which was held by the Treaty of Vienna at a later period. There is always much of the hypocritical about the manner in which treaties of that highly artificial nature are made. No state really intends to hold by them any longer than she finds that they serve her own interests. If they are imposed upon a state, and are injurious to her, that state never means to submit to them any longer than she is actually under compulsion. New means and impulses to break away from such bonds are given to those inclined that way in the fact that the arrangements are usually made without the slightest concern for the populations of the countries concerned, but only for dynastic or other political considerations. The pride of the Spanish people was so much hurt by some of the conditions of the Treaty of Utrecht that a Spanish sovereign or minister would always be popular who could point to his people a way to escape from its bonds or to rend them in pieces. Spain, therefore, was always looking out for new alliances. She saw, at one time, a fresh chance for trying her policy, and she held out every inducement in her power to the Emperor Charles the Sixth and to Russia to enter into a combination against France and England. The Emperor was without a son, and in consequence had issued his famous pragmatic sanction, providing that his hereditary dominions in Austria, Hungary, and Bohemia should descend to his daughter Maria Theresa. The great powers of Europe had not as yet seen fit to guarantee or even recognize this succession. Spain held out the temptation to the emperor of her own guarantee to the pragmatic sanction, and of several important concessions in the matter of trade and commerce to Austria, on consideration 
that the emperor should assist Spain to recover her lost territory. Catherine, the wife of Peter the Great, was now governing Russia and was entering into secret negotiations with Spain and with the emperor. Townsend and Walpole understood all that was going on and succeeded in making a defensive treaty between England, France, and Prussia. Prussia, to be sure, did not long hold to the treaty, and her withdrawal gave a new stimulus to the machinations of the Emperor and Philip of Spain. And in 1727, Philip actually ventured to lay siege to Gibraltar. England, France, and Holland, however, held firmly together. The Russian Empress suddenly died. The Emperor Charles was not inclined to risk much, and Spain finally had to come to terms with England and her allies. These troubles might have proved serious, but for the determined policy of Townsend and of Walpole. We have not thought it necessary to weary our readers with the details of this little running fire of dispute, which was kept up for many years between England and Spain. We saw in an earlier chapter how the quarrel began, and what the elements were which fed it and kept it burning. This latter passage is really only a continuation of the former, both except for the sake of mere continuity of historic narrative, might have been told as one story, and indeed would perhaps not have required many sentences for the telling. Walpole applied himself at home to the work of what has since been called peace, retrenchment, and reform. He was the first great English finance minister. Perhaps we may say he was the first English minister who ever sincerely regarded the development of national prosperity the just and equal distribution of taxation, and the lightening of the load of financial burdens as the most important business of a statesman. The whole political and social conditions of the country were changing under his wise and beneficent system of administration. Population was steadily increasing. Some of the great rising towns had doubled their numbers since Walpole's career began. Agriculture was better in its systems and was brightening the face of the country everywhere. The farmer had almost ceased for the time to grumble. The laborer was well fed and not too heavily worked. We do not mean to say that Walpole's administration was the one cause of all this improvement in town and country, but most assuredly the peace and the security of peace which Walpole's administration conferred was of direct and material influence in the growing prosperity of the nation. His financial systems lightened the burdens of taxation, distributed the load more equally everywhere, and enabled the state to get the best revenue possible at the lowest cost and with the least effort. It might almost be said that Walpole anticipated free trade. The royal speech from the throne at the opening of Parliament on October 19, 1721, declared it to be very obvious that nothing would more conduce to the obtaining so public a good, the extension of our commerce, than to make the exportation of our manufactures and the importation of the commodities used in the manufacturing of them as practicable and as easy as may be. By this means, the balance of trade may be preserved in our favor, our navigation increased, and greater numbers of our poor employed. I must therefore this speech went on, recommend to you, gentlemen of the House of Commons, to consider how far the duties upon these branches may be taken off and replaced without any violation of public faith or laying any new burden upon my people. And I promise myself that, by a due consideration of this matter, the produce of those duties, compared with the infinite advantages that will accrue to the kingdom by their being taken off, will be found so inconsiderable as to leave little room for any difficulties or objections. In furtherance of the policy indicated in these passages of the royal speech, more than 100 articles of British manufacture were allowed to be exported free of duty, while some 40 articles of raw material were allowed to be imported in the same manner. Walpole was anxious to make a full use of this system of indirect taxation, he desired to levy and collect taxes in such a manner as to avoid the losses imposed upon the revenue 
by smuggling, and by various forms of fraud. His principle was that the necessaries of life and the raw materials from which our manufactures were to be made ought to remain, as far as possible, free of taxation. The whole history of our financial systems since Walpole's time has been a history of the gradual development of his economic principles. There has been, of course, reaction now and then, and sometimes the councils of statesmen appear for a while to have been under the absolute domination of the policy which he strove to supplant. But the reaction has only been for seasons, while the progress of Walpole's policy has been steady. We have now, in 1884, nearly accomplished the financial task Walpole would, if he could, have accomplished a century and a half earlier. No one can deny that Walpole was an unscrupulous minister. He would gladly have carried out the best policy by the best means, but where this was not practicable or convenient, he was perfectly willing to carry out a noble policy by the vilest methods. He was not himself avaricious. He was not open to the temptations of money. He had a fortune large enough for him, and he spent it freely, but he was willing to bribe and corrupt all those of whom he could make any use. Under his rule, corruption became a settled parliamentary system. He had done more than any other man to make the House of Commons the most powerful factor in the government of England. He had, therefore, made a seat in the House of Commons an object of the highest ambition. To sit in that house made the obscurest country gentleman a power in the state. Naturally, therefore, a seat in the House of Commons was struggled for, scrambled for, fought for, obtained at any cost of money, influence, time, and temper. Naturally, also, a seat thus obtained was a possession through which recompense of some kind was expected. Those who buy their seats naturally expect to sell their votes. At least that was so in the days of Walpole. In times nearer to our own, England has seen a condition of things in which public opinion and the development of a sort of national conscience absolutely prevented members from taking bribes, although it allowed them the most liberal use of bribery and corruption in the obtaining of their seats. The member of Parliament who twenty or thirty years ago would have bought his seat by means of the most unblushing and shameless corruption would no more have thought of selling his vote to a minister for a money payment than he would have thought of selling his wife at Smithfield. But in Walpole's time, the man who bought his seat was ready to sell his vote. Walpole, the minister, was willing to buy the vote of any man who would sell it. He was lavish in the gift of lucrative offices, of rich sinecures, of pensions, and even of bribes in a lump sum, money down. He would bribe a member's wife, if that were more convenient, than openly to bribe the member himself. He had no particular choice as to whether the bribe should be direct or indirect, open or secret. He wanted to get the vote. He was willing to pay the price, and he cared not who knew of the arrangement. We have already mentioned that the saying ascribed to him about every man having his price was never uttered by him. What he said probably was that each of these men, alluding to a certain group or party, had his price. He is reported to have said that he never knew any woman who would not take money, except one noble lady whom he named, and she, he said, took diamonds. He acted consistently and was not ashamed. He was incorrupt himself. He was even, in that sense, incorruptible. But in order to gain his own public purposes, wise and just as they were, he was willing to corrupt a whole house of commons and would not have shrunk from corrupting a nation. It ought to be pointed out that the very pacific nature of Walpole's policy and the security and steadiness of his administration made it sometimes all the more necessary for him to have recourse to questionable methods. Great controversies of imperial or national interest, controversies which stir the hearts of men, which appeal to their principles and awaken their passions, did not often arise during his long tenure of power. Agitations of this kind, whatever trouble and disturbance they may bring with them, 
have a purifying effect upon the political atmosphere. Only a very ignoble creature is to be bribed out of his opinions when some interest is at stake on which his heart, his training, and his associations have already taught him to take sides. Walpole kept the nation out of such controversies for the most part, and one result was that small political combinations of various kinds were free to form themselves around him, beneath him, and against him. The House of Commons sometimes threatened to dissolve itself into a number of little separate sections or factions, none of them representing any real principle or having more than a temporary attraction of cohesion. Walpole was again and again placed in the position of having to encounter some little faction of this kind by open exercise of power or by the process of corruption, and he usually found the latter course more convenient and ready. Nor could such a man at any period of English history have remained long without more or less formidable rivals. Walpole himself must have known well enough that the death of men like Sunderland or the death of any number of men could not, as long as England was herself, secure him for long an undisturbed political field with no head raised against him. A country like this is never so barren of political intellect and courage as to admit of a long dictatorship in political life. Walpole had already one rising rival in the person of Lord Carteret, afterwards Earl of Granville. John Carteret was born April twenty second, 1690, and was only five years old when the death of his father, the first Lord Carteret, made him a member of the House of Lords. He distinguished himself greatly at Oxford and entered very early into public life. He was from the beginning a favorite of George I, and by the influence of Stanhope was entrusted with various diplomatic missions of more or less importance. In 1721, he was actually appointed ambassador to the court of France. The death of Craggs, the Secretary of State, however, made a vacancy in the administration, and the place was at once assigned to Carteret. Carteret was one of those men whose genius we have to believe in, rather on the faith of contemporary judgment than by reason of any track of its own it has left behind. The unanimous opinion of all who knew him, and more especially of those who were commonly brought into contact with him, was that Carteret possessed the rarest combination of statesmanlike and literary gifts. Probably no English public man ever exhibited in a higher degree the qualities that bring success in politics and the qualities that bring success in literature. It seems strange to have to say this when one remembers a man like Bolingbroke and a man like Burke, but it is certain that neither Bolingbroke nor Burke could boast of such scholarship and accomplishments as those of Carteret. He was a profound classical scholar. He was a master of French, Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, German, and Swedish. His scientific knowledge was extraordinary for that time. He was a close student of the history of past and passing time. He was deeply interested in constitutional law and had a passion for church history. He was a great parliamentary debater. Some say he was even a great orator. He was prompt and bold in his decisions. He was not afraid of any enterprise. He was not depressed or abashed by failure. He could take fortunes, buffets, and rewards with equal thanks. Large brains and small affections are, according to Mr. Disraeli, the essential qualities for success in public life. Carteret had large brains and small affections. He had no friendships and no enmities. Like Fox, he was a bad hater, but unlike Fox, he had not a heart to love. He was fond of books and of wine and of women. He was a great drinker of wine, even for those days of deep drink. Beneath all the apparent energy and daring of his character, there lay a voluptuous love of ease and languor. He was not a lazy man, but his inclination was always to be an indolent man. He leaped up to sudden political action when the call came 
like Sardanopolis leaping up to the inevitable fight. But like Sardanopolis, he would have been always glad to lie down again and loll in ease the moment the necessity for action had passed away. No doubt his daily allowance of Burgundy, a very liberal and generous allowance, had a good deal to do with his tendency to indolence. Whatever the reason, it is certain that with all his magnificent gifts and his splendid chances, he did nothing great, and has left no abiding mark in history. Every one who came near him seems to have regarded him as a master spirit. Chesterfield said of him, When he dies, the ablest head in England dies too, take it for all in all. Horace Walpole declares him to be superior in one set of qualities to his father, Sir Robert Walpole, and in others to the great Lord Chatham. Why did they send you here? Swift said to Carteret, with rough good humor, when Carteret came over to Dublin to be Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. You are not fit for this place. Let them send us back our boobies. Carteret's fame has always seemed to us like the fame of Sheridan's Begum speech. Such poor records as we have of that speech seem hardly to hint at any extraordinary eloquence, yet the absolutely unanimous opinion of all that heard it, of all the orators and critics and statesmen of the time, was that so great a speech had never before been spoken in Parliament. These men can hardly have been all wrong, one would think, and yet, on the other hand, it is not easy to believe that those who made such record of the speech as we have can have purposely left out all the eloquence, the wit, and the argument. In like manner, readers of this day may perplex themselves about the fame of Carteret. All the men who knew him can hardly have been mistaken when they concurred in giving him credit for surpassing genius, and yet we find no evidence of that genius either in the literature or the political history of England. Carteret had one great advantage over Walpole and over all his contemporaries in political life. He was able to speak German fluently. He was able to talk for hours with the king in the king's own guttural tongue. The king clung to Carteret's companionship because of his German, while Walpole was trying to instill his policy and counsels into George's mind through the non-conducting medium of very bad Latin, while other ministers were endeavoring to approach the royal intelligence by means of French, which they spoke badly and he understood imperfectly, Carteret could rattle away in idiomatic German and could amuse the royal humor even with voluble German slang. Carteret had come into public life under the influence of Lord Sunderland and Lord Stanhope, and he regarded himself as the successor to their policy. He never considered himself as quite in understanding and harmony with Townsend and Walpole. His principal idea was that the time had passed when it was proper or expedient to exclude the Tories or the high churchmen from the political service of the crown. He desired to enlarge the basis of administration by admitting some of the more plastic and progressive of the Tories to a share in it. There was, however, something more than a conflict of political views between Carteret and Walpole. Walpole's ambition was to be the constitutional dictator of England. We do not say that this was a mere personal ambition. On the contrary, we believe Walpole acted on the honest conviction that he knew better than any other man how England ought to be governed. He was sure, and reasonably sure, that no other statesman could play the game so well. He therefore claimed the right to play it. Carteret, on the other hand, was far too strong a man to be quietly pushed into the background. He was determined that if he remained in the service of the state, he would be a statesman and not a clerk. Therefore, while Carteret and Walpole were colleagues, there was always a struggle going on between them, and like all the political struggles of the time, it had a great deal of underhand influence and the worst kind of petticoat influence engaged in it. One of the king's mistresses, the most influential of them, gave all her support to Walpole. Another royal paramour lent her aid to Carteret's side. 
Carteret played into the king's hands as regarded the Hanoverian policy, and was for taking strong measures against Russia. Townsend and Walpole would hear of no schemes which threatened to entangle England in war for the sake of Hanoverian interests. George liked Carteret and was captivated by his policy, as well as by his personal qualities, but he could not help seeing that Townsend's advice was the sounder, and that no man could manage the finances like Walpole. George went to Hanover in the summer of 1723, and both the secretaries of state went with him. This was something unusual, and even unprecedented, but the king would not do without the companionship of Carteret, and knew that he could not do without the advice of Townsend. So both Townsend and Carteret went with his majesty to Herrenhausen, and Walpole had the whole business of administration in his own hands at home. A very paltry and pitiful intrigue at length settled the question between Townsend and Carteret. A marriage had been arranged between a niece, or so-called niece, of one of George's mistresses, and the son of La Vrière, the French Secretary of State. Madame La Vrière insisted, as a condition of the marriage, that her husband should be made a duke, and it was assumed that this could be brought about by the influence of the English government. King George was anxious that the marriage should take place, and Carteret, of course, was willing to assist him. The English ambassador at the court of France was a man named Sir Luke Schaub, by birth a Swiss, who had been Stanhope's secretary, and by Stanhope's influence was pushed up in the diplomatic service. Sir Luke Schaub was in close understanding with Carteret, and was strongly hostile to Townsend and Walpole. Of this fact Townsend was well aware, and he took care that Schaub should be closely watched in Paris. Schaub was instructed by Carteret to do all he could in order to obtain the dukedom for Madame La Vrière's husband. Cardinal Dubois died, and his place in the councils of the Duke of Orléans was taken by Count Nocet, who was believed to be hostile to England. This fact gave Townsend an excuse for suggesting to the king that someone should be sent to Paris to watch over the action of the French government and the conduct of the English ambassador in such a manner, so Townsend wrote from Hanover to Walpole, as may neither hurt Sir Luke Schaub's credit with the Duke of Orléans, nor create a jealousy in Sir Luke of the king's intending to withdraw his confidence from him. This was, of course, exactly what Townsend wanted to do, to induce the king to withdraw his confidence from poor Sir Luke. The king agreed that it was necessary someone in whose fidelity and dexterity he can depend, should be sent from England to Hanover to take Paris on his way hither under pretense of curiosity to see that place, and without owning to any one living the business he is employed in. The person selected for this somewhat delicate mission was Horace Walpole, Robert Walpole's only surviving brother. Horace Walpole acquitted himself very cleverly of the task assigned to him. He was a man of uncouth manners, but of some shrewd ability and of varied experience. He had been a soldier with Stanhope before acting as Under Secretary of State to Townsend. He had managed to distinguish himself in Parliament and in diplomacy. He soon contrived to obtain the ear of the Duke of Orleans, and he found that Sir Luke Schaub had been deceiving himself and his sovereign about the prospect of La Vrière's dukedom. Philip of Orléans told Horace Walpole frankly that there never was the slightest idea of giving such a dukedom, and added that the dignity of France would be compromised if such a concession were made, in order to enable the King of England to marry his bastard daughter, so the Duke put it, into the French noblesse. Sir Luke Schaub's haste and indiscreet zeal had, in fact, brought his sovereign into discredit, and even compromised the good understanding between England and France. Philip of Orléans died almost immediately. His death was sudden, but he had long run a course which set all laws of health at defiance. He stuck to his pleasures to the very last, died, one might say, in harness. His successor in the administration of France under the young king Louis the fifteenth, 
who had just been declared of age, was the Duc de Bourbon, Philip's equal perhaps in profligacy, but not by any means his equal in capacity. Horace Walpole won over the new administrator. The Duc de Bourbon told him that Sir Luke Schaub was obnoxious to everyone in the French court, and that he was not fit by birth, breeding, or capacity to represent England there. We need not follow the intrigue through all its turns and twists. Walpole and Townsend succeeded. Schaub was recalled. Horace Walpole was appointed ambassador in his place. The recall of Schaub involved the fall of Carteret. Carteret, however, was not a man to be rudely thrust out of office, and a soft fall was therefore prepared for him. He was made Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. He knew that he was defeated, then, as at a later day, and at an earlier, the Viceroyalty of Ireland was the gilding which enabled a man to gulp down the bitter pill of political failure. When Lord John Russell obtained the dismissal of Lord Palmerston from his cabinet in 1851, he endeavoured, somewhat awkwardly, to soften the blow by offering to his dispossessed rival the position of Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. Lord Palmerston understood the meaning of the offer and treated it, as was but natural, with open contempt. Carteret acted otherwise. Probably he felt within himself that he was not destined to a great political career. In any case, he accepted the offer with perfect good humour, declaring that, on the whole, he thought he should be much more pleasantly situated as a dictator in Dublin than as the servant of a dictator in London. End of chapter 14section seventeen of a history of the four georges in four volumes volume one by justin mccarthy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter fifteen the draper's letters lord carteret arrived at the seat of his viceroyalty in the midst of a political storm which threatened at one time to blow down a good many shaky institutions he found the whole country and especially the capital convulsed by an agitation the like of which was not seen again until the days of grattan and the volunteers the hero of the agitation was swift the spell words which gave it life and direction were found in the draper's letters the copper coinage of ireland had been for a long time deficient employers of labor had in many cases been obliged to pay their workmen in tokens, sometimes even with pieces of card, stamped and signed and representing each a small amount. During Sunderland's time of power, the government set themselves to work to supply the lack of copper, and invited tenders from the owners of mines for the supply. A Mr. William Wood, a man who owned iron and copper mines and iron and copper works, sent in a tender which was accepted. A patent was given to Wood, permitting him to coin haypence and farthings to the value of one hundred and eight thousand pounds. Walpole had not approved of the scheme himself, but for various reasons he did not venture to upset it. He had the patent prepared, and consulted Sir Isaac Newton, then master of the mint, with regard to the objects which the government had in view, and the weight and fineness of the coin which Wood was to supply the haypence and farthings were to be a little less in weight than the coin of the same kind current in england walpole considered this necessary because of the difference in exchange between the two countries sir isaac newton was of opinion that the irish coin exceeded the english in fineness of metal as to the king's prerogative for granting such patents walpole himself explained in a letter to lord townsend then in hanover with the king that it was one never disputed and often exercised the granting of this patent and the mode of supplying the deficiency in copper coin might seem little open to objection but the irish privy council at once declared against the whole transaction both houses of the irish parliament passed addresses to the king declaring that the introduction of wood's coinage would be injurious to the revenue and positively destructive of trade 
the Irish Lord Chancellor, set himself sternly against the patent in private, and urged all his friends, comrades, and dependents to act publicly against it. The addresses from the two Houses of Parliament were sent to Walpole, who transmitted them to Lord Townsend. Walpole accompanied the addresses with an explanation in which he vindicated the policy represented by the granting of the patent, and insisted that no harm whatever could be done to the trade or revenue of Ireland by the introduction of the new copper coinage. Walpole advised that the king should return a soothing and conciliatory reply to the addresses, and the king acted accordingly. It seemed at one time probable that a satisfactory compromise would be arranged between the Irish Parliament and King George's ministers. This hope, however, was soon dispelled. One objection felt by the Irish people in general to the patent, and the new coinage, was founded on the discovery of the fact that Wood had agreed to pay a large bribe to the Duchess of Kendal for her influence in obtaining the patent for him. The objection of the Irish executive and the Irish Parliament was mainly based on the fact that Dublin had not been consulted in the arrangement of the business. The ministers in London settled the whole affair, and then simply communicated the nature of the arrangement to Dublin. Wood himself was unpopular, so far as anything could be known of him in Ireland. He was a stranger to Ireland, and he was represented to be a boastful, arrogant man, who went about saying he could do anything he liked with Walpole, and that he could cram his copper coinage down the throats of the Irish people. All these objections, however, might have been got over, but for the sudden appearance of an unexpected and powerful actor on the scene. One morning appeared in Dublin a letter to the shopkeepers, tradesmen, farmers, and common people of Ireland concerning the brass halfpence coined by one William Wood, hardware man, with a design to have them pass in this kingdom, wherein is shown the power of his patent, the value of his halfpence, and how far every person may be obliged to take the same in payment, and how to behave himself in case such an attempt should be made by Wood or any other person. The letter was signed M. B. Draper. This was the first of those famous Draper's letters, which convulsed Ireland with a passion like that preceding a great popular insurrection. It may be questioned whether the pamphlets of a literary politician ever before or since worked with so powerful an influence on the mind of a nation as these marvellous letters. The author of the Draper's Letters, we need hardly say, was Dean Swift. Swift had for some years withdrawn himself from the political world. He is described by one of his biographers as having amused himself for three or four years with poetry, conversation, and trifles. Now and then, however, he published some letters which showed his interest in the condition of the people among whom he lived. His proposal, for example, for the universal use of Irish manufacture in clothes and furniture of houses, etc., was written in the year 1720. This letter, the printer of which was subjected to a government prosecution, contains a passage which has been perhaps more often and more persistently misquoted than any other observation of any author we can now remember. It seems to have become an article of faith with many writers and most readers that Swift said, burn everything that comes from England except its coals. Without much hope of correcting that false impression as far as the bulk of the reading and quoting public is concerned, we may observe that Swift never said anything of the kind. This is what he did say. I heard the late Archbishop of Tuam mention a pleasant observation of somebody's that Ireland would never be happy until a law were made for burning everything that came from England except their people and their coals. I must confess that as to the former, I should not be sorry if they would stay at home, and for the latter, I hope, in a little time, we shall have no occasion for them. Swift was not an Irish patriot. He was not, indeed, an Irishman at all, except by the accident of birth, and now by the accident of residence. He did not love the country. He would not have lived there a week if he could. He had no affection for the people, and at first very little sympathy with them. He was always angry if anybody regarded him as an Irishman. 
his friends were all found amongst what may be described as the English and Protestant colony in Ireland. He felt toward the native Irish, the Irish Catholics, very much as the official of an English government might feel toward some savage tribe whom he had been sent out to govern. But at the same time, it is an entire mistake to represent Swift as insincere in the efforts which he made to ameliorate the condition of the Irish people and to redress some of the gross wrongs which he saw inflicted on them. The administrator of whom we have already spoken might have gone out to the savage country with nothing but contempt for its wild natives, but if he were at all a humane and a just man, it would be natural for him, as time went on, to feel keenly if any injustice were inflicted on the poor creatures whom he despised, and at last to stand up with indignation as their defender and their champion. So it was with Swift. Little as he liked the Irish people in the beginning, yet he had a temper and a spirit which made him intolerant of injustice and oppression. That fierce indignation described by himself, and of which such store was always laid up in his heart, was roused to its highest point of heat by the sight of the miseries of the Irish people, and of the frequent acts of neglect and injustice by which their misery was deepened. He felt the most sincere resentment at the arbitrary manner in which the government in London was dealing with Ireland in the matter of Wood's patent and Wood's copper coin. Swift, of course, knew well by what influence the patent had been obtained, and he knew that when obtained it had been simply thrust upon the Irish authorities, Parliament, and people without any previous sanction or knowledge on their part. Very likely he was also convinced, or had convinced himself, that the patent and the new coin would be injurious to the revenues and the trade of the country. Certainly, if he was not convinced of this, he gave to all his diatribes against Wood, Wood's patent, and Wood's haypence, the tones of profoundest conviction. He assumed the character of a draper for the moment, why he chose to spell draper drapier nobody knew and he certainly succeeded in putting on all the semblance of an honest trader driven to homely and robust indignation by an imprudent proposal to injure the business of himself and his neighbours in england he says the haypence and farthings pass for very little more than they are worth and if you should beat them to pieces and sell them to the brazier they would not lose much above a penny and a shilling but he goes on to say that Mr. Wood, whom he describes as a mean, ordinary man, a hardware dealer, Wood was, as we have already seen, a large owner of iron and copper mines and works, but that was all one to Dean Swift, made his haypence of such base metal and so much smaller than the English ones that the brazier would hardly give you above a penny of good money for a shilling of his, so that this sum of one hundred and eight thousand pounds in good gold and silver may be given for trash that will not be worth above eight or nine thousand pounds real value nor is even this the worst he contends for mr wood when he pleases may by stealth send over another hundred and eight thousand pounds and buy all our goods for eleven parts and twelve under the value for example says swift if a hatter sells a dozen of hats for five shillings apiece which amounts to three pounds, and receives the payment in Wood's coin, he really receives only the value of five shillings. Of course, this is the wildest exaggeration, is in fact mere extravagance and absurdity if regarded as a financial proposition. But Swift understood, as hardly any other man understood, the art of employing exaggeration with such an effect as to make it do the business of unquestionable fact he was able to make his literary coins pass for much more than Wood could do with his haypence and farthings. The artistic skill which bade the creatures whom Gulliver saw in his travels seem real, lifelike, and living, made the fantastic extravagance of the draper's letters strike home with all the force of truth to the minds of an excited populace. Many biographers and historians have expressed a blank and utter amazement at the effect which Swift's letters produced. They have chosen to regard it as a mere historical curiosity, a sort of political paradox and puzzle. 
they have described the Irish people at the time as under the spell of something like sorcery. Even in our own days, Mr. Gladstone, in a speech delivered to the House of Commons, treated the convulsion caused by Swift's letters and Wood's haypence as an outbreak of national frenzy, called up by the witchery of style displayed in the draper's letters. To some of us, it is, on the other hand, a matter of surprise to see how capable writers, and especially how a man of Mr. Gladstone's genius and political knowledge, could for a moment be thus deceived. One is almost inclined to think that Mr. Gladstone could not have been reading the Draper's letters recently, when he thus spoke of the effect which they produced, and thus was willing to explain it. Any one who reads the letters with impartial attention will see that from the first to the last, the anger that burns in them, the sarcasm that withers and scorches, the passionate eloquence which glows in even their most carefully measured sentences, are directed against Wood and his haypence only because the patent, the bribe by which it was purchased, and the manner in which it was forced on Ireland, represent the injustice of the whole system of Irish administration and the wrongs of many generations. It would be very hard if all Ireland, Swift declares with indignation, should be put into one scale, and this sorry fellow would into the other. I have a pretty good chap of Irish stuffs and silks, the draper declares, and instead of taking Mr. Wood's bad copper, I intend to truck with my neighbors, the butchers and bakers and brewers, and the rest goods for goods. In the little gold and silver I have, I will keep by me like my heart's blood till better times, or until I am just ready to starve. Wood's contract, he asks, his contract with whom? Was it with the Parliament or people of Ireland? The reader who believes that such a passage as that, and scores of similar passages, were inspired merely by disapproval of the introduction of one hundred and eight thousand pounds in copper coin, must have very little understanding of Swift's temper, or Swift's purpose, or the condition of the times in which Swift lived. I will shoot Mr. Wood and his deputies through the head like highwaymen or housebreakers, if they dare to force one farthing of their coin on me in the payment of a hundred pounds. It is no loss of honor to submit to the lion, but who, in the figure of a man, can think with patience of being devoured alive by a rat? If the famous Mr. Hamden rather chose to go to prison than pay a few shillings to King Charles I without authority of Parliament, I will rather choose to be hanged than have all my substance taxed at seventeen shillings in the pound, at the arbitrary will and pleasure of the venerable Mr. Wood. Mr. Gladstone, perhaps, did not observe this allusion to the famous Mr. Hampton. If he had done so, he would have better understood the inspiration of the Draper's letters. Mr. Hampton was not so ignorant a man as to believe that the mere collection of the ship money— the mere withdrawal of so much money from the pockets of certain taxpayers, would rather ruin the trade and imperil the national existence of England. What Mr. Hampton objected to, and would have resisted to the death, was the unconstitutional and despotic system which the levy of the ship money represented. The American colonists did not rise in rebellion against the government of George the Third merely because they had eaten of the insane root and fancied that a trifling tax upon tea would destroy the trade of Boston and New York, they rose in arms against the principle represented by the imposition of the tax. We can all understand why there should have been a national rebellion against ship money, any national rebellion against a trumpery duty on tea, but English writers and English public men seem quite unable to explain the national outcry against Wood's patent, except on the theory that a clever writer pouring forth captivating nonsense bewitched the Irish Parliament and the Irish people and sent them out of their senses for a season. Swift followed up his first letter by others in rapid succession. Lord Carteret arrived in Ireland when the agitation was at its height. He issued a proclamation against the draper's letters, offered a reward of three hundred pounds for the discovery of the author, and had the printer arrested. The grand jury, however, unanimously threw out the bill sent up against Harding, the printer. 
another grand jury passed a presentment against all persons who should by fraud or otherwise impose wood's copper coins upon the public this presentment is said to have been drawn up in swift's own hand lord carteret at last had the good sense to perceive and the spirit to acknowledge that there was no alternative between concession and rebellion he strongly urged his convictions on the government and the government had the wisdom to yield the patent was withdrawn a pension was given to wood in consideration of the loss he had sustained and swift was the object of universal gratitude enthusiasm love and devotion on the part of the irish nation many a patriotic irishman would fain believe to this very day that swift too was irish and an irish patriot ireland certainly has not forgotten probably never will forget the successful stand made by swift against what he believed to be an insult to the irish nation when he took up his pen to write the first of the draper's immortal letters End of chapter fifteen section eighteen of a history of the four georges in four volumes volume one by justin mccarthy this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 16. The Opposition. The trouble had hardly been got rid of in Ireland by Carteret's judicious advice and the withdrawal of Wood's patent, when a commotion that at one time threatened to be equally serious broke out in Scotland. English members of Parliament had been for many years complaining that scotland was exempt from any taxation on malt up to that time no government had attempted to take any steps toward establishing equality in this respect between the two countries walpole now strove to deal with the question it was proposed to the house of commons that instead of a malt duty in scotland a duty of sixpence should be levied on every barrel of ale walpole at first was not inclined to deal with the difficulty in this way but as the feeling of the house was very strongly in favour of making some attempt he consented to adopt the principle suggested but required that the duty should be threepence instead of sixpence the moment it became known in scotland that any tax on malt or ale was to be imposed rioting began in the principal cities the spirit of the national motto asserted itself nemo me impune lacessit the ringleaders of various mobs were arrested and sent for trial but the scotch juries following the recent example of the irish refused to convict brewers all over scotland entered into a sort of league by virtue of which they pledged themselves not to give any securities for the new duty and to cease brewing if the government exacted it unluckily for walpole the secretary of state for scotland the duke of roxburgh was a great friend of carteret's and had joined with carteret in endeavouring to thwart walpole in all his undertakings the success of walpole's policy in any instance was understood by carteret and by roxburgh to mean walpole's supremacy over all other ministers the duke of roxburgh therefore took advantage of the crisis in scotland to injure the administration and especially to injure walpole in a subtle and underhand way he contrived to favour and foment the disturbance he took care that the orders of the government should not be too quickly carried out and he gave more than a tacit encouragement to the common rumour that the king in his heart was hostile to the new tax that the tax was wholly an invention of walpole's and that resistance to such a measure would not be unwelcome to the sovereign and would lead to the dismissal of the minister walpole was not long in finding out the treachery of the duke of roxburgh to adopt a homely phrase he took the bull by the horns at once lord townshend was in hanover with the king and walpole wrote to lord townshend giving him a full account of all that was going on in scotland and laying the chief blame for the continuance of the disturbance on the duke of roxburgh i beg leave to observe wrote walpole that the present administration is the first that was ever yet known to be answerable for the whole government with a secretary of state for one of the kingdom 
who they are assured acts counter to all their measures, or at least whom they cannot confide in. His remonstrance had to be pressed again and again upon Townsend before anything was done to satisfy him. Walpole, however, was a man to press where he thought the occasion demanded it, and he was successful in the end. The Duke of Roxburgh had to resign, and Walpole added to his own duties those of the Secretary of State for Scotland. He appointed, however, as his agent or deputy in the administration of Scotland, the Earl of Isla, Lord Keeper of the Privy Seal in that country, and a man on whose allegiance he could entirely rely. Having thus secured a full power to act, Walpole was not long in bringing the disturbances to an end. He displayed both discretion and resolve. He was able to satisfy the most reasonable among the brewers and maltsters that their interests would not really suffer by the proposed resolutions. The natural result was that the combination of brewers began to melt away. The brewers held a meeting, and it was soon found that it would not be possible to secure a general resolution to meet the legislation of the government by passive resistance and by ceasing to brew. As all would not stand together, every man was left to take his own course, and the result was that what we should now call a strike came quickly to an end. A modern reader is naturally shocked and surprised at the manner in which members of the same government in Walpole's day intrigued against one another and strove to thwart each other's policy. No actual defense is to be made for such a practice, but it is only fair to observe that up to Walpole's own entrance into office and after it, the habit of English sovereigns had been to make up an administration by taking members of different and even opposing parties and bringing them together in the hope of securing thereby the cooperation of all parties. Under these circumstances, it was natural, it was only to be expected, that the minister who was pledged to one policy would endeavor by all means in his power to counteract the designs of the minister whom he knew to be pledged to a very different kind of policy. Nor, indeed, is the practice of intrigue and counter-intrigue among members of the same cabinet actually unknown in our own days, when there is not the same excuse to be pleaded for it that might have been urged in the time of Walpole. In the case of the Duke of Roxburgh, however, the attempt to counteract the policy of Walpole was made in somewhat bolder and less subtle fashion than was common even in those days, and Walpole was well justified in the course he took. For once, his high-handed way of dealing with men was vindicated by its principle and by the unqualified advantage it brought to the interests of the state and to those of the minister as well. The student of history derives one satisfaction from the frequent visits of King George to Hanover. The correspondence between Walpole and Townsend, which was made necessary by those visits, gives us many an interesting glimpse into political affairs in their reality, in their undress, in their secret movement, which no ordinary state papers or diplomatic dispatches could be trusted to give. The Secretary of State often communicates to the representative of his country at some foreign court only just that view of a political situation which he wishes to put under the eyes of the foreign sovereign and foreign statesman. But Walpole writes to Townsend exactly what he himself believes, and what it is important both to Townsend and to him that Townsend shall fully know. I think, Walpole says to Townsend in one of his letters, we have once more got Ireland and Scotland quiet if we take care to keep them so. Exactly. If only care be taken to keep them so. The same chance had often been given to English statesmen before. Ireland and Scotland quiet, and might have continued in quietness if care had only been taken to keep them so. The king was much pleased with Walpole's success. He made him one of the thirty-eight knights of the bath. The order of the bath had gone out of use, out of existence, in fact, since the coronation of Charles the Second. George the First revived it in 1725 and bestowed its honors on Walpole. It seems an odd sort of reward for the shrewd, practical, and somewhat coarse-fibred squire statesman. The close connection between man and the child, civilized man and the savage, 
is never more clearly illustrated than in the joy and pride which the wisest statesman feels in the wearing of a ribbon or a star in the next year the king made walpole a knight of the garter after this honour all other mark of dignity would be but an anticlimax from the time of his introduction to the order of the bath the great minister ceased to be plain mr walpole and became sir robert walpole meanwhile under walpole's order of the bath many a throb of pain must have made itself felt the minister began to find himself harassed by the most formidable opposition that had ever set itself against him lord carteret was out of the way for the moment and only for the moment but pulteney proved a much more pertinacious ingenious and dangerous enemy than carteret had hitherto been pulteney was at one time the faithful follower the enthusiastic admirer almost the devotee of walpole the one great political defect of walpole filled him with faults he could not bear the idea of a divided rule he would be all or nothing he would have clerks and servants for his colleagues in office not real ministers actual statesmen he was under the mistaken impression that a man of genius is to be reduced to tame insignificance by merely keeping him out of important office he had made this mistake with regard to carteret he made it now with regard to pulteney the consequence was far more serious for pulteney was neither so good-humoured nor so indolent as carteret and he could not be put aside pulteney was a man of singular eloquence of eloquence peculiarly adapted to the house of commons his style was brilliant incisive and penetrating he could speak on any subject at the spur of the moment he never delivered a set speech he was a born parliamentary debater all his resources seemed to be at instant command according as he had need of them his reading was wide deep and varied he was a most accomplished classical scholar and had a marvellous readiness and aptitude for classical allusion he was a wit and a humorist he could brighten the dullest topics and make them sparkle by odd and droll illustrations as well as by picturesque allusions and eloquent phrases he could when the subject called for it break suddenly into thrilling invective but he had some of the defects of the extemporaneous orator his eloquence his wit his epigrams often carried him away from his better judgment he frequently committed himself to some opinion which was not really his and was led far from his proper position in the pursuit of some paradox or by the charm of some fantastic idea he was a brilliant writer as well as a brilliant speaker his private character would have little blame if it were not that a fondness for money kept growing with his growing years for a good old gentlemanly vice says byron i think i must take up with avarice pulteney did not even wait to be an old gentleman to take up with the good old gentlemanly vice we have in some measure now to take his talents on trust as we have those of carteret he proved to be little more than the comet of a season when he had gone he left no line of light behind him but it is certain that in the estimation of his contemporaries he was one of the most gifted men of his time and for a while he was the most popular man in england the darling and hero of the multitude when walpole was sent to the tower in the late queen's reign pulteney had spoken up manfully for his friend when townsend and walpole resigned office in seventeen seventeen pulteney went resolutely with them and resigned office also the time came when walpole found himself triumphant over all his enemies and came back not merely to office but likewise to power naturally pulteney expected that walpole would invite him to fill some place of importance in the new administration walpole did nothing of the kind he had seen ample evidence of pulteney's great parliamentary talents in the meantime and he feared that with pulteney for an official colleague he could never be a dictator he was anxious however not to offend pulteney 
and he had the curious weakness to imagine that he could conciliate Pulteney by offering him a peerage. Even at that time, when the scepter of popular power had not yet passed altogether into the hands of the representative chamber, it was absurd to suppose that Pulteney would consent to be withdrawn from the house in which he had made his fame, which was his natural and fitting place, and which already was seen by every man of sense to be the central force of England's political life. Pulteney contemptuously refused the peerage. From that hour, his old love for Walpole seems to have turned into hate. The explosion, however, did not come at once. Pulteney continued to be on seemingly good terms with Walpole, and shortly afterwards the comparatively humble post of cofferer to the household was offered to him, some say was asked for by him. It does not seem likely that even then he had any intention of a serious reconciliation with Walpole. Perhaps he accepted this post in the expectation that he would shortly be raised to a much higher position in the state. But Walpole, although willing enough to give him any mark or place of honor on condition that he withdraw to the House of Lords, was afraid to allow him any office of influence while he remained in the Commons. However this may be, Pulteney's ambition was not satisfied, and he very soon broke publicly away from Walpole altogether. When a motion was brought on, in April of 1725, for discharging the debts of the civil list, in reply to a message from the king himself, Pulteney demanded an inquiry into the manner in which the money had been spent, and even made a fierce attack on the whole administration, and accused it of something very like downright corruption. He was dismissed from his office as cofferer, and even making allowance for his love of money, the wonder is that he should have held it long enough to be dismissed from it. He then went avowedly over into the ranks of the enemies of Walpole inside and outside the House of Commons. The position taken by Pulteney is chiefly interesting to us now in the fact that it opened a distinctly new chapter in English politics. Pulteney created the part of what has ever been since called the leader of opposition. With him begins the time when the real leader of opposition must have a place in the House of Commons. With him, too, begins the time when the opposition has for its recognized duty not merely to watch with jealous care all the acts of the ministers in order to prevent them from doing anything wrong, but also to watch for every opportunity of turning them out of office. With Pulteney and his tactics began the party organization which inside the House of Commons and outside works unceasingly with tongue and pen, with open antagonism and underhand intrigue, with all the various social as well as political influences, the pamphlet, the press, the petticoat, and even the pulpit, to discredit everything done by the men in office, to turn public opinion against them, and if possible, to overthrow them. Pulteney and his supporters were now and then somewhat more unscrupulous in their measures than in English opposition would be in our time, but theirs was unquestionably the policy of all our more modern English parties. From this time forth, almost to the close of his active career as a politician, Pulteney performed the part of leader of the opposition in the strictly modern sense. His position in history seems to us to be distinctly marked as that of the first leader of opposition. Whether history shows reason to thank him for creating such a part is another and a different question. Pulteney had some powerful allies. The king, as we know, hated his son, the Prince of Wales. The Prince of Wales hated his father. No reconciliation got up between them could be lasting or real. The father and son hardly ever met except on the occasion of some great public ceremonial, the standing quarrel between the sovereign and his heir had the effect of creating two parties in political life, one of which supported the king and the king's advisers, while the other found its centre in the house of the heir to the throne. We shall see this condition of things reappearing in all of the subsequent reigns of the Georges, the ministry and their friends were detested and denounced by those who surrounded the Prince of Wales. The adherents of the Prince of Wales were virtually proscribed by the king. Then, as at a later date in the history of the Georges, 
those who favoured and were favoured by the princes were looking out with anxious hope for the king's death. When the old king is dead as nail in door, then indeed each leading supporter of the new king believed he could say with Falstaff, the laws of England are at my commandment, happy are they which have been my friends. Pulteney and his supporters were among the friends and favorites of the Prince of Wales. They constituted the Prince's Party. The Prince's Party was composed mainly of the men who were Tories, but not Jacobites, and of the Whigs who disliked Walpole, or had been overlooked or offended by him, or who in sober honesty were opposed to his policy. In all these, and in a daily growing number of the people out of doors, Pulteney had his friends and Walpole his enemies. But a more formidable rival than even Pulteney was now again to the front and active in hostility to Walpole. This was the man whom the official records of the time described as the late Viscount Bolingbroke. The late Viscount Bolingbroke, it need hardly be said, means that Henry St. John, whose title of Viscount had been forfeited when he fled to France and joined the Pretender. Bolingbroke had lately received the pardon of King George. He had secured the pardon chiefly by means of an influence then familiar and recognized in politics, that of one of the king's mistresses. Bolingbroke had got money with his second wife, and through her he conveyed to the Duchess of Kendal a large sum, about ten thousand pounds, with the intimation that more would be forthcoming from the same place if necessary to obtain his object. The Duchess of Kendal was easily prevailed upon under these circumstances to recognize the justice of Bolingbroke's claim and the sincerity of his repentance. Moreover, there was about the same time that political intrigue, or rather rivalry of intrigues, going on between Walpole and Carteret, between England and France, in which it was thought the influence of Bolingbroke might be used with advantage, as it was in fact used, to Walpole's ends, for all these reasons the pardon was obtained, and Bolingbroke was allowed to return to England. Nor was he long put off with a mere forgiveness, which kept from him his forfeited estates and his right to the family inheritance. Here I am, he wrote to Swift soon after, two-thirds restored, my person safe, unless I meet hereafter with harder treatment than even that of Sir Walter Raleigh, and my estate, with all the other property I have acquired, or may acquire, secured to me. But the attainder is kept prudently in place, lest so corrupt a member should come again into the House of Lords, and his bad leaven should sour that sweet, untainted mass. Walpole was quite willing that the forfeiture of Lord Bolingbroke's estates and the interruption of the inheritance should be recalled. It was necessary for this purpose to pass an Act of Parliament. On April 20th, 1725, Lord Finch presented to the House of Lords the petition of Henry St. John, late Viscount Bolingbroke. The petition set forth that the petitioner was truly concerned for his offence in not having surrendered himself, pursuant to the directions of an Act of the first year of His Majesty's reign, and that he had lately in most humble and dutiful manner, made his submission to the king and given his majesty the strongest assurances of his inviolable fidelity and of his zeal for his majesty's service and for the support of the present happy establishment which his majesty hath been most graciously pleased to accept. The petition then prayed that leave might be given to bring a bill to enable the petitioner and his heirs male to take and enjoy in person the estates of which he was then or afterwards should be possessed. Walpole, as Chancellor of the Exchequer, informed the House that he had received His Majesty's command to say that George was satisfied with Bolingbroke's penitence, was convinced that Lord Bolingbroke was a proper object of mercy, and consented that the petition should be presented to the House. Lord Finch then moved that a bill be brought in to carry out the prayer of the petition. The Chancellor of the Exchequer seconded and strongly advocated the motion. It was opposed with great vigour by Mr. Methuen, the Controller of the Household, and formerly British Minister in Portugal. Methuen denounced Bolingbroke's scandalous and villainous conduct, 
during his administration of affairs in Queen Anne's reign, his clandestine negotiation for peace, his insolent behavior toward the allies of England, his sacrificing the interests of the whole confederacy and the honor of his country, most especially in the abandonment of the Catalans, and, to sum up all his crimes in one, his traitorous design of defeating the Protestant succession and of advancing a popish pretender to the throne. This speech, we read, made a great impression on the assembly, and several distinguished members, Arthur Onslow among the rest, spoke movingly on the same side. The motion, however, was carried, 231 votes against 113. The bill was prepared and went up to the House of Lords on May 5th, was carried there by a large majority, was sent back to the House of Commons with some slight amendments, was accepted there and received the royal assent. Some of the peers put on record a strong and earnest protest against the passing of such a measure. The protest recited all the charges against Bolingbroke, declared that those who signed it knew of no particular public services which Bolingbroke had lately rendered, and which would entitle him to a generous treatment, and further added that no assurances which this person hath given could be a sufficient security against his future insincerity, for, having already so often violated the most solemn assurances and obligations, and in defiance of them having openly attempted the dethroning of his majesty, and the destruction of the liberties of his country. Bolingbroke, however, wanted something more than restoration to his title and to his forfeited right of inheritance. His active and untamed spirit was eager for political strife again, and his heart burned with a longing to take his old place in the debates of the House of Lords. Against this, Walpole had made a firm resolve, and on this point he would not yield. He would not allow his eloquent and daring rival to have a voice in Parliament any more. In this, as it seems to us, Walpole acted neither wisely nor magnanimously. Bolingbroke's safest place, so far as the interests of the public and even the political interests of his rivals were concerned, would have been in the House of Lords. He would have delivered brilliant speeches there and would have worked off his energies in that harmless fashion. In Walpole's time, however, the idea had not yet arisen that an enemy to the settled order of things is least dangerous when he is most free to speak. Bolingbroke, who had always hated Walpole, even lately, when he was professing regard and gratitude, hated him now more than ever, and set to work by all the means in his power to injure Walpole in the estimation of the country, and, if possible, to undermine his whole political position. Bolingbroke and Pulteney soon came into political companionship, there was a certain affinity between the intellectual nature of the two men, and they had now a common object. Both were literary men as well as politicians, and they naturally put their literary gifts to the fullest account in the campaign they had undertaken. In our days, two such men combining for such a purpose would contrive to get incessant leading articles into some daily paper, perhaps would start a weekly or even a daily evening paper of their own. Bolingbroke and Pulteney were men in advance of their age, in some respects at least. They did between them start a paper. They established the famous Craftsman. The Craftsman was started in 1726. It was first issued daily in single leaves or sheets after the fashion of the Spectator. It was soon, however, changed into a weekly newspaper bearing the title of The Craftsman or Country Journal. Its editor, Nicholas Amherst took the feigned name of Caleb Danvers, and the paper itself was commonly called Caleb, accordingly. The craftsman was brilliantly written, and was inspired by the most unscrupulous passion of partisan hate. Walpole was held up in prose and verse, in bold, invective, and droll lampoon, as a traitor to the country, as a man stuffed and gorged with public plunder, audacious in his profligate disregard of political principle and common honesty, a danger to the state, and a disgrace to parliamentary life. The circulation of the craftsman at one time surpassed that of the spectator, 
at the height of the spectator's popularity. Not always are more flies caught by honey than by vinegar. End of chapter 16section nineteen of a history of the four georges in four volumes volume one by justin mccarthy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter seventeen osnabruck osnabruck the impeachment of lord macclesfield was ascribed rightly or wrongly to the influence of the prince of wales the comparative leniency of lord macclesfield's punishment to the favour and protection of the king macclesfield was a justly distinguished judge he had had the highest standing at the bar had risen step by step until from plain thomas parker the son of an attorney he became chief justice of the court of king's bench then one of the lords justices of the kingdom in the interval between anne's death and the arrival of george i and finally lord chancellor george made him baron and subsequently earl of macclesfield he had always borne a high reputation for probity as well as for generosity until the charge was made against him on which he was impeached he was accused of having while lord chancellor sold the offices of masters in chancery to incompetent persons and men of straw unfit to be entrusted with the money of suitors but whom he had publicly represented to be persons of great fortunes and in every respect qualified for that trust with having extorted money from several of the masters and with having embezzled the estates of widows and orphans on may sixth seventeen twenty five the managers of the house of commons appeared at the bar of the house of lords and presented their articles of impeachment against macclesfield the trial took place at the bar of the house and not in westminster hall where impeachments were usually carried on and it lasted until may twenty sixth there was nothing that could be called a defence to some of the charges and as to others lord macclesfield simply insisted that he had followed the example of some of his most illustrious predecessors and that the monies he received as presents were reckoned among the known perquisites of the great seal and were not declared unlawful by any act of parliament the lords were unanimous in finding macclesfield guilty and condemned him to be fined thirty thousand pounds and to be imprisoned in the tower until the fine had been paid the motion that he be declared for ever incapable of any office place or employment in the state was however rejected as was also a motion to prohibit him from ever sitting in parliament or coming within the verge of the court it would certainly seem as if these motions ought to have been the natural and necessary consequences of the impeachment and the conviction if the conviction were just and it was obviously just then lord macclesfield had disgraced the highest bench of justice and merely to condemn him to disgorge a part of his plunder was a singularly inadequate sort of punishment george i however chose to ascribe the impeachment to the malice and the influence of the prince of wales and when macclesfield had paid the fine by the mortgage of an estate the king undertook to repay the money to him george actually did pay to macclesfield one instalment of a thousand pounds but fate interposed and prevented any further payment macclesfield retired from the world and spent his remaining years in the study of science and in religious meditation he died in seventeen thirty two his was a strange story he had many of the noblest qualities he had had on the whole a great career it is not easy if we may borrow the words which burke applied to a more picturesque and interesting sufferer to contemplate without emotion that elevation and that fall during all the time of comparative quietude we are not to suppose that there were no threatenings of foreign disturbance the adherents of the stuarts were never at rest the controversies which grew out of the treaty of utrecht were always sputtering and menacing cardinal fleury a statesman devoted to peace and economy had become prime minister of france other new figures were arising on the field of continental politics alberoni in exile and disgrace had been succeeded by a burlesque imitation of him the duke of Ruperda, a dutch adventurer who turned diplomatist 
and had risen into influence through Alberoni's favor. In 1725, Riperda negotiated a secret treaty between the Emperor Charles VI and the King of Spain, and was rewarded with the title of Duke. He became Prime Minister of Spain for a short time, to be presently disgraced and thrown into prison, quite after the fashion of a royal favorite in the pages of Gil Blas. He was a fantastic, arrogant, feather-headed creature, an Alberoni of the Opera Buffa. He betook himself at last to the service of the sovereign of Morocco. England had a sort of reperda of her own in the person of the wild Duke of Wharton, the man whose eloquent and ferocious invective had contributed to the sudden death of Lord Stanhope, and who had since that time devoted himself to the service of James Stuart on the continent, and actually fought as a volunteer in the ranks of the Spanish army at the abortive siege of Gibraltar. It is to the credit of the sincerer and better supporters of the Stuart cause that they would not even still consent to regard it as wholly lost. They kept their eyes fixed on England, and every murmur of national discontent or disturbance became to them a new encouragement, a fresh signal of hope, a reviving incitement to energy. In England, men were constantly hearing rumors about the dissolute life of the Chevalier and his quarrels with his wife, Clementina Maria, a granddaughter of one of the kings of Poland. The loyalists here at home were ready to believe anything that could be said by anybody to the discredit of James and his adherents. James and his adherents were willing to be fed on any tales about the unpopularity of George I and the tottering condition of his throne. Nor could it be said that George was popular with any class of persons in England. If the reign of the Brunswicks depended on personal popularity, it would not have endured for many years. But the people of England were able to see clearly enough that George allowed his great minister to rule for him, and that Walpole's policy meant prosperity and peace. They did not admire George's mistresses any more now than they had done when first these ladies set their large feet on English soil. But even some of the most devoted followers of the Stuart cause shook their heads sadly over the doings of James in Italy, and could not pretend to say that the cause of morality would gain much by a change from Brunswick to Stuart. The end was very near for George. He was now an old man in his sixty-eighth year, and he had not led a life to secure a long lease of health. His excesses in eating and drinking, his hot punch in his many mistresses, had proved too much even for his originally robust constitution. Of late he had become a mere wreck. He was eager to pay one more visit to Hanover, and he embarked at Greenwich on June 3, 1727, landing in Holland on the 7th of the month. He made for his capital as quickly as he could, but in the course of the journey he was attacked by a sort of lethargic paralysis. Early on June 10th he was seized with an apoplectic fit. His hands hung motionless by his sides, his eyes were fixed, glassy and staring, and his tongue protruded from his mouth. The sight of him horrified his attendants. They wished to stop at once and secure some assistance for the poor old dying king. George, however, recovered consciousness so far as to be able to insist on pursuing his journey, crying out with spasmodic efforts at command the words, Osnabrück, Osnabrück. At Osnabrück lived his brother, the Prince Bishop. The attendants dared not disobey George, even at that moment, and the carriage drove at its fullest speed on toward Osnabrück. No swiftness of wheels, however, no flying chariot, could have reached the house of the Prince Bishop in time for the King. When the royal carriages clattered into the courtyard of the Prince Bishop's palace, the reign of the first George was over. The old King lay dead in his seat. Lord Townsend and the Duchess of Kendal were following in different carriages on the road. An express was sent back to tell the grim news. Lord Townsend came on to Osnabrück, and finding that the King was dead, had nothing to do but to return home at once. The Duchess of Kendal is stated to have shown all the signs of grief proper to be expected from a favorite. She tore her hair, at least she pulled and clutched at it, and she beat her ample bosom, and professed the uttermost horror 
at the thought of having to endure life without the companionship of her lord and master. It is satisfactory, however, to know that she did not die of grief. She lived for some sixteen years and made her home for the most part at Kendall House near Twickenham. Even such a man as George I may become invested by death with a certain dignity and something of a romantic interest. Legends are afloat concerning the king's later days, which would not be altogether unworthy the closing hours of a great Roman emperor. George had his melting moments, it would seem, and not long before his death, being in a pathetic mood, he gave the Duchess of Kendal a pledge that if he should die before her, and it were possible for departed souls to return to earth and impress the living with a knowledge of their presence, he, the faithful and aged lover, would come back from the grave to his mistress. When the Duchess of Kendal returned to her home near Twickenham, she was in constant expectation of a visit in some form from her lost adorer. One day, while the windows of her house were open, a large black raven or bird of some kind, raven would seem to be the most becoming and appropriate form for such a visitor, flew into her presence from the outer air. The lamenting lady assumed at once that in this shape the soul of King George had come back to earth. She cherished and petted the bird, it is said, and lavished all her fondness and tenderness upon it. What became of it, in the end, history does not allow us to know. Whether it still is sitting like the more famous raven of poetry, it is not for us to guess. Probably, when the Duchess herself expired in 1743, the ghastly, grim, and ancient raven disappeared with her. Why George I, if he had the power of returning in any shape to see his mistress, did not come in his own proper form, it is not for us to explain. One might be disposed to imagine that in such a case it would be the first step which would involve the cost, and that there would be no greater difficulty for the departed soul to come back in the likeness of its old vestment of clay than to put on the unfamiliar and somewhat inconvenient form of a fowl. Perhaps the story is not true. Possibly there was no raven or other bird in the case at all. It may be that if a black raven did fly in at the Duchess of Kendall's window, the bird was not the embodied spirit of King George. For ourselves, we should be sorry to lose the story. Neither the king nor the mistress could afford to part with any slight element of romance wherewithal even legend has chosen to invest them. Another story, which probably has more truth in it, adds a new ghastliness to the circumstances of George's death. On November 13, 1726, some seven months before that event, there died in a German castle a woman whom the Gazette of the Capital described as the Electress Dowager of Hanover. This was the unfortunate Princess Sophia, the wife of George. Thirty-two years of melancholy captivity she had endured, while George was drinking and hoarding money and amusing himself with his seraglio of ugly women. She died protesting her innocence to the last. In the closing days of her illness, so runs the story, she gave into the hands of someone whom she could trust a letter addressed to her husband, and obtained a promise that the letter should somehow or other be delivered to George himself. This letter contained a final declaration that she was absolutely guiltless of the offence alleged against her, a bitter reproach to George for his ruthless conduct, and a solemn summons to him to stand by her side before the judgment seat of heaven within a year, and there make answer in her presence for the wrongs he had done her, for her blighted life and her miserable death. There was no way of getting the letter into George's hands while the king was in England, but an arrangement was made by means of which it was put into his coach when he crossed the frontier of Germany on his way toward the capital. George, it is said, opened the letter at once and was so surprised and horror-stricken by its stern summons that he fell that moment into the apoplectic fit from which he never recovered. Sophia, therefore, had herself accomplished her own revenge. Her reproach had killed the king. Her summons brought him at once within the ban of that judgment to which she had called him. It would be well if one could believe the story. There would seem a dramatic justice, a tragic retribution about it. 
its very terror would dignify the story of a life that on the whole was commonplace and vulgar but for ourselves we confess that we cannot believe in the mysterious letter the fatal summons the sudden fulfilment there are too many stories of the kind floating about history to allow us to attach any special significance to this particular tale we doubt even whether if the letter had been written it would have greatly impressed the mind of george remorse for the treatment of his wife he could not have felt he was incapable of any such emotion and we question whether any appeal to the sentiment of the supernatural any summons to another and an impalpable world would have made much impression on that stolid prosaic intelligence and that heart of lead besides according to some versions of the tale it was not after all a letter from his wife which impressed him but only the warning of a fortune-teller a woman who admonished the king to be careful of the life of his imprisoned consort because it was fated for him that he should not survive her a year this story too is told of many kings and other persons less illustrious much more probable is the rumour that sophia made a will bequeathing all her personal property to her son that the will was given to george i in england in that he composedly destroyed it if george committed this act he seems to have been repaid in kind his own will left large legacies to the duchess of kendal and to other ladies the archbishop of canterbury gave the will to the new king who read it put it in his pocket walked away with it and never produced it again both these stories are doubted by some of the contemporaries of george the second but they were firmly believed in and strongly asserted by others who seem to have had authority for their belief at all events they fit in better with the character and surroundings of both princes than the tragic story of the letter and its fearful summons the warning of the fortune-teller or the soul of the dead king revisiting the earth in the funereal form of a raven there is not much that is good to be said of george the first he had a certain prosaic honesty and was frugal amid all his vulgar voluptuousness he managed the expenses of the court with creditable economy and regularity the officers in his army and his civil servants received their pay at the properly appointed time it would be hardly worth while recording these particulars to the king's credit but that it was somewhat of a novelty in the arrangements of a modern court for men to receive the reward of their services at regular intervals and in the proper amount george occasionally did a liberal thing and he more than once declared an interest in the improvement of university education he is said to have declared to a german nobleman who was complimenting him on the possession of two such kingdoms as england and hanover that a king ought to be congratulated rather on having two such subjects as newton in the one country and leibnitz in the other we fear however that this story must go with the fortune-teller and the raven we cannot think of dull prosaic george uttering such a monumental sort of sentiment he cared nothing for literature or science or art he seems to have had no genuine friendships he hated his son and he used to speak of his daughter-in-law caroline as that she devil the princess whatever was respectable in his character came out best at times of trial he was not a man whom danger could make afraid at the most critical moments as for instance at the outbreak of the rebellion in seventeen fifteen he never lost his head if he was not capable of seeing far he saw clearly and he would look coming events steadily in the face on one or two occasions when an important choice had to be made between this political course or that he chose quickly and well the fact that he thoroughly appreciated the wisdom and the political integrity of walpole speaks perhaps his highest praise his reign on the whole was one of prosperity for england he did not love england never up to the very end cared for the country over which destiny had appointed him to rule his soul to the last was faithful to hanover england was to him as the state wife whom for political reasons he was compelled to marry hanover as the sweetheart and mistress of his youth to whom his affections such as they were always clung and whom he stole out to see at every possible chance 
George behaved much better to his political consort, England, than to the veritable wife of his bosom. He managed England's affairs for her like an honest, straightforward, narrow-minded steward. We shall see hereafter that England came to be governed much worse by men not nearly so bad as George I. To do him justice, he knew when he ought to leave the business of the state in the hands of those who understood it better than he. This one merit redeemed many of his faults, and perhaps may be regarded as having secured his dynasty. Frederick the Great described George as a prince who governed England by respecting liberty, even while he made use of the subsidies granted by Parliament to corrupt the Parliament which voted them. He was a king, Frederick declares, without ostentation and without deceit, and who won by his conduct the confidence of Europe. This latter part of the description is a little too polite. Kings do not criticize each other too keenly in works that are meant for publication, but the words form on the whole an epitaph for George which might be inscribed on his tomb without greater straining of the truth than is common in the monumental inscriptions that adorn the graves of less exalted persons. End of chapter 17「Section 20 of A History of the Four Georges in Four Volumes, Volume 1, by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 18. George the Second. The year when George the First died was made memorable forever by the death of a far greater man than any European king of that generation. When describing the events which led to the publication of the Draper's Letters, we mentioned the fact that Sir Isaac Newton had been consulted about the coinage of Wood's Haypence. That was the last time that Isaac Newton appeared as a living figure in public controversy of any kind. On March twentieth, 1727, the great philosopher died after much suffering at his house in Kensington. The epitaph which Pope intended for him sums up as well as a long discourse could his achievements in science nature and nature's laws lay hid in night god said let newton be and all was light no other discovery ever made in science approaches in importance to the discovery of the principle of universal gravitation the principle that every particle of matter is attracted by every other particle with a force proportioned inversely to the square of their distances Vague ideas of some such principle had long been floating in the minds of some men, had probably been thus floating since ever man began to think seriously over the phenomena of inanimate nature. But the discovery of the principle was, however, as distinctly the achievement of Newton as Paradise Lost is the work of Milton. We find it hard now to form to ourselves any clear idea of a world in which Newton's principle was unknown it would be almost as easy to realize the idea of a world without light or atmosphere. Newton is called by Sir David Brewster the greatest philosopher of any age. Sir John Herschel assigns to the name of Newton a place in our veneration which belongs to no other in the annals of science. In this book we have only to record the date at which the pure and simple life of this great man came to its end. The important events of his career belong to an earlier period. His teachings and his fame are for all time. The humblest of historians, as well as the greatest, may ask himself, what is the principle of history which bids us to assign so much more space to the wars of kings and the controversies of statesmen than to the life and the deeds of a man like Newton? In the whole history of the world during Newton's lifetime, the one most important fact the one fact of which the magnitude dwarfs all other facts is the discovery of the principle of gravitation. Yet its meaning may be explained in fewer words than would be needed to describe the nature of the antagonism between Walpole and Pulteney, or the reason why Queen Anne was succeeded by King George. We have, however, in these pages only to deal with history in its old and we suppose its everlasting fashion that of telling what happened in the way of actual fact, telling the story of the time. The English public took the death of George I with becoming composure. 
the vast majority of the people never troubled their heads about it it gave a flutter of hope to spain it set the councils of the stuart party in eager commotion for a while but it made no change in england george the first was always reckoned vile still viler george the second these are the lines in which walter savage landor sums up the characters of the first and second georges before passing on to picture in little the characters of the third and fourth of the name landor was not wrong when he described george the second as on the whole rather worse than george the first george the second was born at hanover on august thirtieth sixteen eighty three and was therefore in his forty-fourth year when he succeeded to the throne he had still less natural capacity than his father he was parsimonious he was avaricious he was easily put out of temper his instincts feelings passions were all purely selfish he had hot hatreds and but cool friendships personal courage was perhaps the only quality becoming a sovereign which george the second possessed he had served as a volunteer under marlborough in seventeen o eight and at the battle of oudenarde he had headed a charge of his hanoverian dragoons with a bravery worthy of a prince he is to serve later on at dettingen and to be in all probability the last english sovereign who commanded in person on the battlefield his education was not even so good as that of his father and he had an utter contempt for literature he had little religious feeling but is said to have had a firm belief in the existence of vampires he was fond of business devoted to the small ways of routine he took a great interest in military matters and all that concerned the arrangements of affairs of an army like his father he found abiding pleasure in the society of a little group of more or less attractive mistresses george the second had always detested his father and during the greater part of their lives was equally detested by him the reconciliation which had lately taken place between them was as formal and superficial as that of the two demons described in lesage's story they brought us together says osmodius they reconciled us we shook hands and became mortal enemies when the reconciliation between george the second and his father was brought about by the influence of stanhope and of walpole the father and son shook hands and continued to be mortal enemies if george the first had his court at st james's george the second had his court and coterie gathered around him at leicester fields and at richmond the two courts were in fact little better than hostile camps walpole had been for long years the confidential and favorite servant of george the first the natural expectation was that he would be instantly discredited and discarded when george the second came to the throne so indeed it seemed at first to happen when walpole received the news of george the first's death he hastened to richmond lodge where george the second then was in order to give him the news and hail him as king george was in bed and had to be roused from a thick sleep he was angry at being disturbed and not in a humor to admit that there was any excuse for disturbing him when walpole told him that his father was dead the kingly answer of the sovereign was that the statesman's assertion was a big lie george roared this at walpole and then was for turning round in his bed and settling down to sleep again walpole however persisted in disturbing the royal slumbers and assured the drowsy grumbler that he really was george the second king of england he produced for george's further satisfaction a letter from lord townsend describing the time place and circumstances of the late king's death walpole tendered the usual ceremonial expressions of loyalty which george received coldly and even gruffly then the minister asked whom his majesty wished to appoint to draw up the necessary declaration for the privy council walpole assumed as a matter of course that the king would leave the task in his hands george however disappointed him compton said the king and when he had spoken that word he intimated to walpole that the interview was over walpole left the royal abode believing himself a fallen man compton whom the king had thus curtly designated was sir spencer compton who had been chosen speaker of the house of commons in seventeen fifteen he had been one of george the second's favorites while george was still prince of wales he was a man of respectable character publicly and privately 
but without remarkable capacity of any kind. He knew little or nothing of the business of a minister, and it is said that when Walpole came to him to tell him of the king's command, he frankly acknowledged that he did not know how to draw up the formal declaration. Walpole good-naturedly came to his assistance, took his pen, and did the work for him. If the king had persevered in his objection to Walpole, the story of the reign would have to be very differently told. Walpole was the one only man who could at the time have firmly stood between England and foreign intrigue, between England and financial blunder. Nor is it unlikely that the king would have persevered and refused to admit Walpole to office, but that he happened to be, without his own knowledge, under the influence of the one only woman who had any legitimate right to influence him, his wife Caroline. Caroline, daughter of a petty German prince, the Margrave of Brandenburg-Ansbach, was one of the most remarkable women of her time. Her faults, foibles, and weaknesses only served to make her more remarkable. She had beauty when she was young, and she still had an expressive face and a sweet smile. She was well-educated and always continued to educate herself. She was fond of letters, art, politics, and metaphysics. She delighted in theological controversy, and also delighted in contests of mere wit. But of all her valuable gifts, the most valuable for herself and for the country, was the capacity she had for governing her husband. She governed him through his very anxiety not to be governed by his wife. One of George's strongest and at the same time meanest desires was to let the world see that he was absolute master in his own house and could rule his wife with a rod of iron. Caroline, having long since discovered this weakness, played into the king's hands and always made outward show of the utmost deference for his authority and dread of his anger. She put herself metaphorically and indeed almost literally under his feet. She was pleased that all the court should see her thus groveling, George was in the habit of making jocular allusion, in his jovial, graceful way, to living and dead sovereigns who were governed by their wives, and he often invited his courtiers to notice the difference between them and him, and to admire the imperial supremacy which he exercised over the humble Caroline. By humoring him in this way, Caroline obtained, without any consciousness on his part, an almost absolute power over him. Another, and a worse failing of the king's, she humored as well. She had suffered much in the beginning of her married life because of his amours and his mistresses. Her true and faithful heart had been wrung by long jealousies, but happily for herself and for the country, she was able at last to rise superior to this natural weakness of woman. Indeed, it has to be said with regret for her self-degradation that she not only tolerated the love-making of the king and his favorites, but even showed occasionally a politic interest in the promotion of the amours and the appointment of the ladies. She humored her lord and master's avarice with as little scruple. Thus his principal defects, his sordid love of money, his ignoble passion for women, and his ridiculous desire to seem the absolute master of his wife, became, in her skillful hands, the leading strings by which she drew and guided him whither she would have him go. Through Caroline's influence, mainly, Walpole was retained in power. She played on the king's avarice and poured into his greedy ear the assurance that Walpole could raise money as no other living man could. Caroline acted in this chiefly from a sincere love of her husband and anxiety for his good, but partly also it has to be acknowledged, because it had been made known to her that Walpole would provide her with a larger allowance than it was Compton's intention to do. The result was that Walpole was retained in office, or perhaps it should be said, restored to office. The crowds of courtiers who loved to worship the rising sun had hardly time to offer their adoration to Compton when they found that the supposed rising sun was only a meteor, which instantly vanished. Horace Walpole, the younger, describes the event by a happy phrase as Compton's evaporation. Compton himself had soon found that the responsibility would be too much for him. He besought the king to relieve him of the burden to which he found himself unequal. The king acceded to his wish. Walpole became once more 
first lord of the treasury and chancellor of the exchequer and townsend continued to be secretary of state the crisis was over parliament assembled on june fifteenth after the death of george the first as the law then stood any parliament summoned by a sovereign was not to be dissolved by that sovereign's death but should continue to sit and act during a term of six months unless the same shall be sooner prorogued or dissolved by such person who shall be next heir to the crown of this realm in succession the meeting of june fifteenth was merely formal parliament was prorogued by a commission from george the second until the twenty seventh of the month both houses then met at westminster and the king came to the house of peers in his royal robes and ascended the throne with all the regular ceremonial sir charles dalton gentleman usher of the black rod was sent with a message from the king commanding the attendance of the commons when the commons had crowded into the space appointed for them in the peers chamber the king delivered from his own mouth the royal speech george the second had at all events one advantage over george the first as a king of england he understood the language of his subjects and could speak to them in their own tongue the royal speech began by expressing the king's persuasion that you all share with me in my grief and affliction for the death of my late royal father the king was well warranted in this persuasion nothing could be more correct than his assumption the lords and commons quite shared with him his grief and affliction for the death of his royal father they felt just as much distress at that event as he did the king then went on to declare his fixed resolution to merit by all possible means the love and affection of his people to preserve the constitution as it is now happily established in church and state and to secure to all his subjects the full enjoyment of their religious and civil rights he expressed his satisfaction at the manner in which tranquillity and the balance of power in europe had been maintained the strict union and harmony which had hitherto subsisted among the allies of the treaty of hanover and which had chiefly contributed to the near prospect of a general peace finally the king pointed out that the grant of the greatest part of his civil list revenues had now run out and that it would be necessary for the house of commons to make a new provision for the support of him and his family i am persuaded said the king that the experience of past times and a due regard to the honour and dignity of the crown will prevail upon you to give me this first proof of your zeal and affection in a manner answerable to the necessities of my government then the king withdrew and lord chesterfield moved for an address of condolence congratulation and thanks the condoling and congratulating address was unanimously voted was presented next day to his majesty and received his majesty's most gracious acknowledgment meanwhile the commons having returned to their house several new members took the oaths sir paul methuen treasurer of the household the author of the commercial treaty with portugal which still bears his name moved an address of condolence and congratulation to the king the motion was seconded by sir robert walpole and as the formal record puts it voted nemine contradicente a committee was appointed to draw up the address sir robert walpole of course being one of its members the chairman of the committee paid walpole the compliment of handing him the pen whereupon as a contemporary account reports it sir robert without hesitation and with a masterly hand drew up the said address walpole could be courtly enough when he thought fit he seems to have distinctly outdone the house of lords in the fervour of his grief for the late king and his devotion to the present the death of george i walpole pronounced to be a loss to this nation which your majesty alone could possibly repair having mentioned the fact that the death of george i had plunged all england into grief walpole changed as by the stroke of an enchanter's wand this winter of our discontent into glorious summer your immediate succession he assured the king banished all our grief on monday july third the commons met to consider the amount of supply to be granted to his majesty walpole as chancellor of the exchequer stated to the house that the annual sum of seven hundred thousand pounds granted to the late king for the support of his household and of the honour and dignity of the crown had fallen short every year 
and that ministers had been obliged to make it up in other ways. The present sovereign's necessary expenses were likely to increase, the Chancellor of the Exchequer explained, by reason of the largeness of his family and the necessity of settling a household for his royal consort. The Chancellor of the Exchequer therefore moved that the entire revenues of the civil list, which produced about £130,000 a year above the yearly sum of £700,000 already mentioned, should be settled on His Majesty during life. The motion was supported by several members, but Mr. Shippen, the earnest and able, though somewhat eccentric, Jacobite and Tory, had the spirit and courage to oppose it. Shippen's speech was expressed in a spirit of loyalty, but was direct and incisive in its criticism of the government proposal. Shippen pointed out that the yearly sum of £700,000, now thought too little, was not obtained by the late sovereign without a long and solemn debate, and was described by everyone who contended for it as an ample revenue for a king. He reminded the House that Queen Anne used to pay about £19,000 a year out of her own pocket for the augmentation of the salaries of poor clergymen, allowed £5,000 a year out of the post office revenue to the Duke of Marlborough, gave several hundred thousand pounds for the building of the castle of Blenheim, and by this means came under the necessity of asking Parliament for five hundred thousand pounds, which she determined never to do again, and had therefore prepared a scheme for the reduction of her expenses, which was to bring her full yearly outlay down to four hundred and fifty thousand pounds. Shippen then severely criticized the foreign policy of the late king's reign, and with justice condemned the extravagance which required to be met by repeated grants from the nation. I confess, he said, that if the same management was to be continued, and if the same ministers were to be again employed, a million a year would not be sufficient to carry on the exorbitant expenses so often and so justly complained of in this house. He deplored the vast sum, sunk in the bottomless gulf of secret service. I heartily wish, he exclaimed, that time, the great discoverer of hidden truths and concealed iniquities, may produce a list of all such, if any such there were, who have been perverted from their public duty by private pensions, who have been the hired slaves and the corrupt instruments of a profuse and vainglorious administration. Shippen concluded by moving as an amendment that the amount granted to His Majesty be the clear yearly sum of £700,000. It is worth noticing that when Shippen had occasion once to refer to some of Walpole's arguments, he spoke of him as my honourable friend, and then suddenly corrected himself and said, I ask pardon, I should have said the honourable person, for there is no friendship betwixt us. Shippen's speech hit hard and must have been felt by the ministry, the one charge against Walpole's government which he could not refute was the charge of extravagance and corruption. The ministers, however, affected to treat the speech with contempt and were justified in doing so by the manner in which the House of Commons dealt with it. No answer was given to Shippen's statements because Shippen's motion was not seconded and fell to the ground. The resolutions proposed by the Chancellor of the Exchequer were carried without a division, and a bill was ordered to be brought in to give effect to them. A provision of £100,000 a year was voted for the Queen, in case she should survive the King. The vote was agreed to without division or debate. Parliament was dissolved by proclamation on August 7th. The new Parliament met on January 23rd, 1728. It was found that the ministerial majority was even greater than it had been before, the King opened Parliament in person, and directed the Commons who had been summoned to the House of Peers to return to their own house and choose their Speaker. The Commons unanimously chose Arthur Onslow to this high office. Compton, the former Speaker, had been soothed with a peerage after his evaporation. Arthur Onslow was born in 1691 and had been in Parliament from 1719. In July of 1728, he was made Privy Councillor. We may anticipate events a little for the purpose of mentioning the fact that all the writers of his time united in ascribing to Speaker Onslow, as he has always since been called, 
a combination of the best attributes which fit a man to preside over the House of Commons. It is said that his election to the Speaker's chair was brought about mainly by Sir Robert Walpole, and that Walpole expected Onslow to use his great abilities and authority to suit the policy and serve the wishes of the administration. If this was Walpole's idea, he must soon have found himself as much mistaken as the conclave of cardinals about whom so much is said in history, romance, and drama, who elected one of their order as Pope because they believed him to be too feeble and nerveless to have any will of his own, and were much amazed to find that the moment the new Pope had been elected, he suddenly became strong and energetic, the master and not the servant. Onslow's whole conduct in the chair of the House of Commons, during the many years which he occupied it, displayed an absolute and fearless impartiality. The chair has never been better filled in English history. The very title of Speaker Onslow, ever afterwards given to him, is of itself a tribute to his impartiality and his services. Onslow was a man who loved letters and art, and also, it is said, loved studying all varieties of life. It is reported of him that he used to go about disguised like a sort of 18th-century Harun al-Rashid among the lowest classes of men in out-of-the-way parts of the capital for the purpose of studying the forms and manners of human life. Legend has preserved the memory of a certain public house called the Jew's Harp, where Onslow is said to have amused himself many an evening sitting in the chimney-corner and exchanging talk and jests with the company who frequented the place. It is pleasant to be able to believe these stories of Speaker Onslow in that highly artificial and formal age, that age of periwigs and paint and shallow formulas. It is somewhat refreshing to meet with this clever man of eccentric ways, the great Speaker, who could wear his official robes with so much true dignity, and then, when he had laid them aside, could amuse himself after his own fashion and study life in some of its queerest corners, with the freshness of a schoolboy and the eye of an artist. End of chapter 18。section 21 of a history of the four Georges in four volumes, volume 1 by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 19 the Patriots. The name and the career of William Pulteney are all but forgotten in English political life. It is doubtful whether Pulteney's name, if pronounced in the course of a debate in the House of Commons just now, would bring with it any manner of idea to the minds of nine-tenths of the listening members. Yet Pulteney played, all unconsciously, a great part in the development of the parliamentary life of this country. So far as intellectual gifts are concerned, he is not, of course, to be named in the same breath with a man like Burke, for example. One might as well think of comparing Offenbach with Mozart or Handel. But the influence of the career of Pulteney on the English Parliament is nevertheless more distinctly marked than the influence of the career of Burke. We are speaking now not of political thought, no man ever made a greater impression on political thought than Burke has done, but only of the forms and the development of English parliamentary systems. For Pulteney was beyond all question the founder of the modern practice of parliamentary opposition. Walpole was mainly instrumental in transferring the seat of political power from the House of Lords to the House of Commons, Never since Walpole's time has the House of Lords exercised any real influence over the political life of England. This was not Walpole's doing, it was the doing of time and change, of altered conditions and new forces. But Walpole saw the coming change, and bent all the energies of his robust intellect to help and forward it. Pulteney is, in the same sense, the author of the modern principle of parliamentary opposition, but there is no reason to believe that Pulteney saw what he was doing as clearly as Walpole did. Until the beginning of Pulteney's brilliant career, the opposition between parties 
had been mainly a competition for the ear and the favour of the sovereign. Thus Harley strove against Marlborough, and Bolingbroke against Harley, and the Whigs against Harley and Bolingbroke. But the course of action taken by Pulteney against Walpole converted the struggle into one of party against party, inside and outside of the House of Commons. The object sought was the command of a majority in the representative assembly. Pulteney showed that this was to be obtained by the voices of the public out of doors, as well as by the voices of the elected representatives in Westminster. Walpole had made it clear that in the House of Commons the battle was to be fought. Pulteney showed that in the House of Commons the victory was to be gained, not by the favor of the sovereign, but by the cooperation of the people. We have said in a former chapter that Pulteney's form of procedure become now a component part of our whole parliamentary system, brings with it some serious disadvantages from which for the present it is not easy, it is not even possible, to see any way of escape. The principle of government by party will some time or other come to be put to the challenge in English political life. For the present, however, we have only to make the best we can of it, and no one in his senses can doubt that it was an immense advance on the system of backstairs influence and bedchamber intrigue, the policy, to use the great Condé's expression, of petticoats and alcoves, which prevailed in the days when Mrs. Masham was competing with Sarah Jennings, and later still when Walpole was buying his way back to power through the influence of the sovereign's wife in cooperation with the sovereign's paramour. The student of English history will have to turn with close attention to the reigns of the first and second Georges. In these reigns, the transfer of power to the representative chamber began, and the modern system of parliamentary opposition grew into form. The student will have to remember that the time he is studying was one when there was no such thing known in England as a public meeting. There were demonstrations, as we call them now, there were crowds, there were processions, there were tumults, there were disturbances, riots, reading of riot acts, dispersion of mobs, charges of cavalry, fusillades of infantry, but there were no great public meetings called together for the discussion of momentous political questions. The rapid growth of the popular newspaper, soon to swell up like the prophet's gourd, had hardly begun as yet. We cannot call the craftsman a newspaper. It was rather a series of pamphlets. It stood Pulteney instead of the more modern newspaper. He worked on public opinion with it outside the House of Commons. Inside the House, he made it his business to form a party which should assail the ministry on all points, lie in wait to find occasion for attacking it, attack it rightly or wrongly, attack it even at the risk of exposing national weakness or bringing on national danger, keep attacking it always. In former days, a leader of opposition had often been disdainful of the opinion of the vulgar herd out of doors. Pulteney and his companions set themselves to appeal especially to the prejudices, passions, and ignorance of the vulgar herd. They made it their business to create a public opinion of their own. They dealt in the manufacture of public opinion. They set up political shops wherein to retail the article which they had thus manufactured. Pulteney was now in his prime, still some years inside fifty. He was full of energy and courage, and he threw his whole soul into his work. Much of what he did was undoubtedly dictated by his spite against Walpole, but much, too, was the mere outcome of his ambition, his energy, and the peculiar character of his intellect. He enjoyed playing a conspicuous part, and he liked attacking somebody. People used to think at one time that Mr. Disraeli had a profound personal hatred for Sir Robert Peel when he was flinging off his philippics against that great minister. It afterwards appeared clear enough 
that Mr. Disraeli had no particular dislike to his opponent, but that he enjoyed attacking an important statesman. Pulteney, of course, did actually begin his career of embittered opposition because of his quarrel with Walpole, but it is likely enough that even if no quarrel had ever taken place and he never had been Walpole's friend and colleague, he would sooner or later have become the foremost gladiator of opposition all the same. The materials of opposition consisted of three political groups of men. There were the Jacobites under Shippen, the Tories, who no longer acknowledged themselves Jacobites, and who were led by Sir William Wyndham, and there were the discontented Whigs whom Pulteney led, and whose discontent he turned to his own uses. It had long been a scheme of Bolingbroke's, up to this time it should perhaps rather be called a dream than a scheme, to combine these three groups into one distinct party, having its bond of union in a common detestation of Walpole. The dream now seemed likely to become a successful scheme. The conception of this scheme of opposition was unquestionably Bolingbroke's and not Pulteney's, but it fell to Pulteney's lot to work it out in the House of Parliament, and he performed his task with consummate ability. Pulteney was probably the greatest leader of opposition ever known in the House of Commons, with the single exception of Mr. Disraeli. Charles Fox, with all his splendid genius for debate, was not a skillful or a patient leader of opposition. Perhaps he was too great of heart for such a part. Certain it is that as a leader of opposition he made some fatal mistakes. Pulteney seemed cut out for the part which a strange combination of chances had allowed him to play. He was not merely a debater of inexhaustible resource and a master of all the trick and craft of parliamentary leadership, but he thoroughly understood the importance of public support out of doors and the means of getting at it and retaining it. Pulteney saw that the time had come when the English people would have their say in every political question. By the combined influence of Pulteney and Bolingbroke, there was formed a party of ultra-Whigs, who somewhat audaciously called themselves the Patriots. Perhaps the title was first given to them by Walpole in contempt. If so, they accepted and adopted it. Again and again in our history, this phenomenon presents itself. Some men of ability and unsatisfied ambition, belonging to the Liberal Party, become discontented with the policy of their leaders. When the first opportunity arises, they make a public declaration against that policy. In the conservative ranks, there are to be found some other men, also able and also discontented, to whom the general policy of opposition seems unsatisfactory and feeble. Each of these discontented parties fancies itself to be truly patriotic, public-spirited, and independent. The two factions at length unite for the common good of the country. They tell the world that they are patriots, that they are the only patriots, and the world for a while believes them. This was the condition of things when Pulteney and Parliament joined with Sir William Wyndham, the extreme Jacobite, the Wyndham who was mentioned in Pope's poem about his Twickenham Grotto, the Wyndham with whom Bolingbroke corresponded for many years, and to whom he addressed one of his most important political manifestos. Sir William Wyndham belonged to an old Somersetshire family. He was a staunch Tory. He had powerful connections. His first wife was a daughter of the haughty Duke of Somerset. He entered Parliament and made a considerable figure there. He had been Secretary at War and afterwards Chancellor of the Exchequer under the Tories. He had clung to Bolingbroke's fortunes at the time of Bolingbroke's rupture with Harley. He underwent the common fate of Tory statesmen on the accession of George I. He was deprived of office, was accused of taking part in the Jacobite conspiracy, and was committed to the Tower. There was, however, no evidence against him, and he resumed his political career. 
His eloquence is described by Speaker Onslow as strong, full, and without affectation, arising chiefly from his clearness, propriety, and argumentation, in the method of which last, by a sort of induction almost peculiar to himself, he had a force beyond any man I ever heard in public debates. Lord Harvey, who can be trusted not to overdo the praise of any one, says of Wyndham that he was very far from having first-rate parts, but by a gentlemanlike general behavior, a constant attendance in the House of Commons, a close application to the business of it, and frequent speaking, he had got a sort of parliamentary routine, and without being a bright speaker was a popular one, well heard and useful to his party. So far as we now can judge, this seems a very correct estimate of Wyndham's parliamentary capacity and position. He had a noble presence, singularly graceful and charming manners, and a high personal character. A combination between such a man as Pulteney and such a man as Wyndham could not but be formidable even to the most powerful minister. Shippen, the leader of the Jacobites, Honest Shippen, as Pope calls him, we have often met already. He was a straightforward, unselfish man, absolutely given up to his principles and his party. He was well read and had written clever pamphlets and telling satirical verses. His speeches, or such reports of them as can be got at, are full of striking passages and impressive phrases. They are speeches which even now one cannot read without interest. But it would seem that Shippen often marred the effect of his ideas and his language by a rapid, careless, and imperfect delivery. He appears to have been one of the men who wanted nothing but a clear articulation and effective utterance to be great parliamentary debaters, and whom that single want condemned to comparative failure. Those who remember the late Sir George Cornwall Lewis, or indeed those who have heard the best speeches of Lord Sherbrooke when he was Mr. Robert Lowe, can probably form a good idea of what Shippen was like as a parliamentary debater. Shippen was nothing of a statesman, and his occasional eccentricities of manner and conduct prevented him from obtaining all the influence which would otherwise have been fairly due to his talents and his political and personal integrity. Pulteney's party had in Parliament the frequent, indeed for a time, the habitual assistance of Wyndham and of Shippen. Outside Parliament, Bolingbroke intrigued, wrote, and worked with the indomitable energy and restless craving for activity and excitement which, despite all his professions of love for philosophic quiet, had been his lifelong characteristic. The craftsman was stimulated and guided much more directly by his inspiration than even by that of Pulteney. The craftsman kept showering out articles, letters, verses, epigrams, all intended to damage the ministry, and more especially to destroy the reputation of Walpole. All was fish that came into the craftsman's net. Every step taken by the government, no matter what it might be, was made an occasion for ridicule, denunciation, and personal abuse. Not the slightest scruple was shown in the management of the craftsman. If the policy of the government seemed to tend toward a continental war, the craftsman cried out for peace and vituperated the minister who dared to think of involving England in the trumpery quarrels of foreign states. Walpole, however, we need hardly say, made it a set purpose of his administration to maintain peace on the continent, and as soon as the patriots began to find out in each particular instance that his policy was still the same, they turned round and shrieked against the minister whose feebleness and cowardice were laying England at the feet of foreign alliances and continental despots. Walpole worked in cordial alliance with the French government, the principal member of which was now Cardinal Fleury. It became the object of the craftsman to hold Walpole up to contempt and derision as the dupe of a French cardinal and the sycophant of a French court. The example of the craftsman 
was speedily followed by pamphleteers, caricaturists, satirists, and even ballad-mongers without end. London and the provinces were flooded with such literature. Walpole was described as Sir Blue String, the blue string being a cheap satirical allusion to the blue ribbon which was supposed to adorn him as Knight of the Garter. He was styled Sir Robert Brass, Sir Robert Lynn, more often simply Robin or plain Bob. He was pictured as a systematic promoter of public corruption, as one who fattened on the taxation wrung from the miserable English taxpayer. His personal character, his domestic life, his household expenses, the habits of his wife, his own social and other enjoyments were coarsely criticized and lampooned. The craftsman and its imitators attacked not only Walpole himself, but Walpole's friends. The political satire of that day was as indiscriminate as it was unsparing. It was enough to be a political or even a personal friend of Walpole to become the object of the craftsman's fierce blows. Pulteney did not even scruple to betray the confidence of private conversation and to disclose the words which in some unguarded moments of former friendship Walpole had spoken of George the Second when George was Prince of Wales. An excellent opportunity was soon given to Pulteney to make an open and damaging attack on the ministry. Horace Walpole, British ambassador to the French court, had been brought over from Paris to explain and justify his brother's foreign policy. The government put forward a resolution in the House of Commons on February 7, 1729, for a grant of some £250,000 for defraying the expense of 12,000 Hessians taken into His Majesty's pay. Even if the maintenance of this force had been a positive necessity, which it certainly was not, it would nevertheless have been a necessity bringing with it disparagement and danger to the government responsible for it. Pulteney made the most of the opportunity, and in a speech of fine old English flavor, denounced the proposal of the ministers. He asked with indignation whether Englishmen were not brave enough or willing enough to defend their own country without calling in the assistance of foreign mercenaries. It might be admitted, be some advantage to Hanover, that German soldiers should be kept in the pay of England, but he wanted to know what benefit would come to the English people from paying and maintaining such a band. These men were kept, he declared, in the pay of England, not for the service of England, but for the service of Hanover. It need hardly be said that during all the earlier years of the Brunswick accession, a bare allusion to the name of Hanover was enough to stir an angry feeling in the minds of the larger number of the English people. Even the very men who most loyally supported the House of Brunswick winced and writhed under any allusion to the manner in which the interests of England were made subservient to the interests of Hanover. Pulteney, therefore, took every pains to chafe those sore places with remorseless energy. Sir William Wyndham supported Pulteney, and Sir Robert Walpole himself found it necessary to throw all his influence into the scale on the other side. His arguments were of a kind with which the House of Commons has been familiar during many generations. His main point was that by maintaining a large body of soldiers, Hessian amongst the rest, the country had been able to avoid war. The Court of Vienna, with the assistance of Spanish subsidies, had been making preparation for war, Walpole contended, and were it not for the maintenance of this otherwise superfluous body of troops, the Emperor of Austria would probably never have accepted the terms of peace. If you desire peace, prepare for war, may be an excellent maxim, but its value lies a good deal in its practical application. It is a remarkable elastic maxim, and in times nearer to our own than those of Walpole, has been made to expand into a justification of the most extravagant 
and unnecessary military armaments and schemes of fortification, which afterwards were abandoned before they had been half realized. In this instance, however, there was something more to be said against the proposal of the government. Some of the speakers in the debate pointed out that England in former days, if it engaged in a quarrel with its neighbors, fought the quarrel out with its own strength and was not in the habit of buying and maintaining the forces of foreign princes to help Englishmen to hold their own. The resolution, of course, was carried. It was even carried by an overwhelming majority, 256 were on the court side, as it was called, against 91 on the country side. 50,000 pounds was also voted as one-year subsidy to the King of Sweden, and 25,000 pounds for one-year subsidy to the Duke of Brunswick. In order, however, to appease the consciences of some of those who supported the resolution, as well as those who had opposed it, the government permitted what we should now call a rider to be added to the resolution, requesting His Majesty that whenever it should be necessary to take any foreign troops into his service, he will graciously pleased to use his endeavors that they be clothed with the manufactures of Great Britain. It was supposed to be some solace to the wounded national pride of Englishmen to be assured that if they had to pay foreigners to fight for them, the foreigners should at least not be allowed to come to this country clothed in the manufacture of their own land, but would be compelled to buy their garments over the counter of an English shop. On Friday, February 21st, an event which led directly and indirectly to results of some importance occurred. Three petitions from the merchants trading in tobacco in London, Bristol, and Liverpool were presented to the House of Commons. These petitions complained of great interruptions for several years past of the trade, with the British colonies in America by the Spaniards. The depredations of the Spanish, it was said, endangered the entire loss of that valuable trade to England. The Spaniards were accused of having treated such of His Majesty's subjects as had fallen into their hands in a barbarous and cruel manner. The petitioners prayed for the consideration of the House of Commons and such timely remedy as the House should think fit to recommend. These petitions only preceded a great many others, all in substance to the same effect. The Commons entered upon the consideration of the subject in a committee of the whole House, heard several petitioners, and examined many witnesses. An address was presented to the Crown asking for copies of all memorials, petitions, and representations to the late king or the present in relation to spanish captives of british ships copies were also asked for of the reports laid before the king by the commissioners of trade and of plantations concerning the dispute between england and spain with regard to the rights of the subjects of great britain to cut logwood in the bay of Campeche on the western shore of the yucatan peninsula which juts into the Gulf of Mexico. English traders had been, for a long time, in the habit of cutting logwood along the shores in the Bay of Campeche, and the logwood trade had come to be one of the greatest importance to the West Indies and to England. The Spanish government claimed the right to put a stop to this cutting of logwood, and the Spanish viceroy and governor had, in some instances, declared that they would dislodge the Englishmen from the settlements which they had established, and even treat them as pirates if they persisted in their trade. There was, in fact, all the material growing up for a serious quarrel between England and Spain. Despite the recent treaties which were supposed to secure the peace of Europe, the times were very critical. The British nation, says a contemporary writer, had for many years past been in a state of uncertainty, scarce knowing friends from foes, or indeed whether we had either. Each new treaty seemed only to disturb the balance of power, as it was called in a new way. 
the quadruple alliance was intended to rectify the defects of the treaty of utrecht but it gave too much power to the emperor and it increased the bitterness and the discontent of the king of spain the treaty of vienna made between the empire and spain was justly regarded in england as portending danger to this country it was even more dangerous than englishmen in general supposed at the time although walpole knew its full purport and menace the treaty of vienna led to the treaty of hanover an arrangement made in the closing years of george the first's reign between great britain france and prussia by virtue of which if any one of the contracting parties were to be attacked the other two were pledged to come to the assistance with funds and with arms all these arrangements were in the highest degree artificial some of them might fairly be described as unnatural it might be taken for granted that not one of the states whom they professed to bind to this side or to that would hold to the engagements one hour longer than would serve their own interests no safety was secured by these overlapping treaties no one had any faith in them it was quite true that england did not know her friends from her enemies about the time at which we have now arrived the dispute between england and spain concerning the question of the campeche logwood was to involve a controversy as to the interpretation of certain passages in the treaty of utrecht it was distinctly a matter for calm consideration for compromise and for an amicable settlement but each of the two parties mainly concerned showed its desire to push its own claim to an extreme english traders have never been particularly moderate or considerate in pressing their supposed rights to trade with foreign countries in this instance they were strongly backed up encouraged and stimulated by the band of englishmen who chose to call themselves the patriots few of the patriots we venture to think cared a rush about the question of the campeche logwood or were very deeply grieved because spain bore herself in a high-handed fashion towards certain english merchants and ship-owners but the opportunity seemed to the patriots admirably adapted for worrying and harassing not the spaniards but the administration of sir robert walpole they used the opportunity to the very full the debates on the conduct of spain brought out in the house of lords the acknowledgment of the fact that king george i had at one time actually written to the government of spain distinctly undertaking to bring about the restitution of gibraltar a copy of the letter in french with a translation was laid before the house it seemed that on june first seventeen twenty one george the late king wrote to the king of spain sir my brother a letter concerning the treaties then in the course of being re-established between england and spain in that letter occurred these words i do no longer balance to assure your majesty of my readiness to satisfy you with regard to your demand touching the restitution of gibraltar promising you to make use of the first favourable opportunity to regulate this article with the consent of my parliament the house of lords had a long and warm debate on this subject a resolution was proposed declaring that for the honour of his majesty and the preservation and security of the trade and commerce of this kingdom care should be taken that the king of spain do renounce all claim and pretension to gibraltar and the island of minorca in plain and strong terms this resolution however was thought in the end to be rather too strong and it was modified into a declaration that the lords do entirely rely upon his majesty that he will for the maintaining the honour and securing the trade of this kingdom take effectual care in the present treaty to preserve his undoubted right to gibraltar and the island of minorca this resolution was communicated to the house of commons and the lords asked for a conference with that house in the painted chamber the commons had a long debate on the subject the opposition strongly denounced the ministers who had advised the late king 
to write such a letter and declared that it implied a positive promise to surrender gibraltar to spain the courtiers as the supporters of the ministry were then called to distinguish them from the country party that is to say the opposition endeavoured to qualify and make light of the expressions used in the late king's letter to show that they were merely hypothetical and conditional and insisted that effectual care had since been taken in every way to maintain the right of england to gibraltar the country party moved that words be added to the lord's resolution requiring that all pretensions on the part of the crown of spain to the said places be specifically given up two hundred and sixty-seven votes against one hundred and eleven refused the addition of these words as unnecessary and too much in the nature of a challenge and defiance to spain but the motion that this house does agree with the lords in the said resolution was carried without a division the court party not venturing to offer any objection to it the king received the address of both houses on tuesday march twenty fifth and returned an answer thanking them for the confidence reposed in him and assuring them that i will take effectual care as i have hitherto done to secure my undoubted right to gibraltar and the island of minorca the difficulty was over for the present the government contrived to arrange a new treaty with spain the treaty of seville in which france also was included this treaty settled for the time the disputes about english trade with the new world and the claims of spain for a restoration of gibraltar were indirectly at least given up perhaps the whole story is chiefly interesting now as affording an illustration of the manner in which the patriots turned everything to account for their one great purpose of harassing the administration of sir robert walpole all the patriotic effusiveness about the undoubted right of england to gibraltar was merely well-painted passion such sentiment as exists in the english mind with regard to the possession of the rock now did not exist had not had time to come into existence then gibraltar was taken in seventeen o four its possession was confirmed to england by the treaty of utrecht in seventeen thirteen since that time english ministers had again and again been considering the expediency of restoring gibraltar to the spaniards stanhope had been in favour of the restoration townsend and carteret had been in favour of it some of the patriots themselves before they came to be dubbed patriots had been in favour of it only the unreasonable and insolent behaviour of spain herself stood at one time in the way of restitution gibraltar was one capture like many others captured territory changed and changed hands with each new arrangement in those days minorca which was included with gibraltar in the resolution of the two houses of parliament and the consequent promise of the king was taken by the english forces shortly after the capture of gibraltar and was settled upon england by the same treaty of utrecht yet as we all know it was given up by england at the peace of amiens and no tears of grief were shed by any english eyes but the discovery that the late king had at one time been willing to restore gibraltar to spain for a consideration came in most opportunely for the patriots to most of them it was of course no discovery at all they had always known of the intention and some of them had approved of it none the less shrill were their cries of surprise none the less vociferous their shouts of patriotic anger End of chapter nineteen section twenty two of a history of the four georges in four volumes volume one by justin mccarthy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter twenty a victory for the patriots literature lost some great names in the early part of george the second's reign william congreve and richard steele 
Both died in 1729. Congreve's works do not belong to the time of which we are writing. He was not sixty years old when he died, and he had long ceased to take any active part in literature. Swift deplores, in a letter to an acquaintance, the death of our friend Mr. Congreve, whom I loved from my youth, and who surely, besides his other talents, was a very agreeable companion. Swift adds that Congreve had the misfortune to squander away a very good constitution in his younger days, and upon his own account I could not much desire the continuance of his life under so much pain and so many infirmities. Congreve was beyond comparison the greatest English comic dramatist of his time. Since the days of Ben Jonson, and until the days of Sheridan, there was no one who could fairly be compared with him. His comedy was not in the least like the bold, broad, healthy, aristophanic humor of Ben Jonson. The two stand better in contrast than in comparison. Jonson drew from the whole living English world of his time. Congreve drew from the men and women whom he had seen in society. Congreve took society as he found it in his earlier days. The men and women with whom he then mixed were for the most part flippant, insincere, corrupt, and rather proud of their corruption, and Congreve filled his plays with figures very lifelike for such a time. He has not drawn many men or women whom one could admire. Even his heroines, if they are chaste in their lives, are anything but pure in their conversation, and seem to have no moral principle beyond that which is represented by what Heine calls anatomical chastity. Angelica, the heroine of Love for Love, is evidently meant by Congreve to be all that a charming young English woman ought to be, and she is charming, fresh, and fascinating even still. But she occasionally talks in a manner which would be a little strong for a barrack room now, and nothing gives her more genuine delight than to twit her kind, fond old uncle with his wife's infidelities, to make it clear to him that all the world is acquainted with the full particulars of his shame, and to sport with his jealous agonies. Congreve was the first dramatic author who put an English seaman on the stage, and after his characteristic fashion he made his Ben legend a selfish, coarse, and ruffianly lout. But if one cannot admire many of Congreve's characters, on the other hand, one cannot help admiring every sentence they speak. The only fault to be found with their talk is that it is too witty, too brilliant, for any manner of real life. Society would have to be all composed of male and female congreves to make such conversation possible. There is more strength, originality, and depth in it than even in the conversation in The Rivals and The School for Scandal. The same fault has been found with Sheridan, which is to be found with Congreve. We need not make too much of it. No warning example is called for. There will never be many dramatists whose dialogue will deserve the censure of critics on the ground that it is too witty. Of Steele we have often had occasion to speak. His fame has been growing rather than fading with time. At one period he was ranked by critics as far below the level of Addison. Few men now would not set him on a pedestal as high. He was more natural, more simple, more fresh than Addison. There is some justice in the remark of Hazlitt that Steele seems to have gone into his closet chiefly to set down what he had observed out of doors, while Addison appears to have spent most of his time in his study, spinning out to the utmost there the hints which he borrowed from Steele or took from nature. Everyone, however, will cordially say with Hazlitt, I am far from wishing to depreciate Addison's talents, but I am anxious to do justice to Steele. There are not many names in English literature round which a greater affection clings than that of Steele. Lee Hunt, in writing of Congreve, speaks of the love of the highest aspirations, which he sometimes displays 
and which makes us think of what he might have been under happier and purer auspices. Lee Hunt refers in especial to Congreve's essay in The Tatler on the character of Lady Elizabeth Hastings, whom Congreve calls Aspasia, an effusion so full of enthusiasm for the moral graces, and worded with an appearance of sincerity so cordial, that we can never read it without thinking it must have come from Steele. It is in this essay, Lee Hunt goes on, that he says one of the most elegant and truly loving things that were ever uttered by an unworldly passion. To love her is a liberal education. Lee Hunt's critical judgment was better than his information. The words to love her is a liberal education are by Steele and not by Congreve. They do not appear in the essay by Congreve on the character of Lady Elizabeth Hastings, but in a subsequent essay by Steele, in which, after a fashion common enough in the Tatler and the Spectator, one author takes up some figure created or described by another, and gives it new touches and commends it afresh to the reader. Steele was doing this with Congreve's picture of Aspasia, and it was then that he crowned the whole work by the exquisite and immortal words which Lee Hunt could never read without thinking they must have come from the man who was, in fact, their author. If literature had its losses in these years, it also had its gains. Not long before the time at which we have now arrived, English literature had achieved three great successes. Pope wrote the first three books of his Dunciad, Swift published his Gulliver's Travels, and Gay set the town wild with his Beggar's Opera. We are far from any thought of classifying the Beggar's Opera as a work of art on a level with the Dunciad or Gulliver's Travels, but in its way it is a masterpiece. It is thoroughly original, fresh, and vivid. It added one or two distinctly new figures to the humorous drama. It is clever as a satire and charming as a story. One cannot be surprised that when it had the attraction of novelty, the public raved about it. To say anything about Gulliver's Travels or the Dunciad, except to note the historical fact that each was published, would, of course, be mere superfluity and waste of words. In 1731, the first steps were taken in a reform of some importance in the literature of our legal procedure. It was arranged that English should be substituted for Latin in the presentments, indictments, pleadings, and all other documents used in our courts of law. The early stages of this most wise and needful reform were met with much opposition by lawyers and pedants. One main argument employed in favor of the retention of the old system was that, if the language of our legal documents were to be changed, no man would be at the pains of studying Latin any more, and that in a few years no one would be able to read a word of some of our own most valuable historical records. It was mildly suggested, on the other side, that there would always be some men among us who, either out of curiosity or for the sake of gain, would make it their business to keep up the knowledge of Latin, and that a very few of such antiquarians would suffice to give the country all the information drawn from Latin records which it could possibly require or care to have. We have had some experience since that time, and it does not appear that the disuse of Latin in our legal documents has led to its falling into absolute disuse among reading men. There are still among us, and apparently will always be, persons who either out of curiosity or for the sake of gain keep up their knowledge of Latin, the curiosity to read Virgil and Horace and Cicero and Caesar in the tongue which those authors employed is more keen than it ever was before. Men indulge themselves freely in it, even without reference to the sake of gain. Meanwhile, a change long foreseen by those who were in the inner political circles was rapidly approaching. The combination between Walpole and his brother-in-law, Lord Townsend, was about to be broken up. It had for a long time been a question whether it was to be the firm of Townsend and Walpole, or Walpole and Townsend, and of late years the question was becoming settled. If the firm was to endure at all, it must clearly be Walpole and Townsend. Walpole had been growing every day in power and influence. 
the king as well as the queen treated him openly and privately as the head of the government townsend saw this and felt bitterly aggrieved he had for a long time been a much more powerful personage socially than walpole and he could not bear with patience the supremacy which walpole was all too certainly obtaining great part of that supremacy was due to walpole's superiority of talents but something was due also to the fact that the house of commons was becoming a much more important assembly than the house of lords the result was inevitable townsend for a long time struggled against it he tried to intrigue against walpole he did his best to ingratiate himself with the king he was a man of austere character and stainless life but he seems nevertheless to have tried at one time the merest arts of the political intriguer to supplant his brother-in-law in the favor and confidence of the king perhaps he might have succeeded it is at least possible but for the watchful intelligence of queen caroline she saw through all townsend's schemes and took care that they should not succeed at last the two rivals quarrelled their quarrel broke out very openly in the drawing-room of a lady and in the presence of several distinguished persons from hot words they were going on to a positive personal struggle when the spectators at last intervened to pluck them asunder in the words of the king in hamlet they were plucked asunder and then there was talk of a duel the friends of both succeeded in preventing this scandal but the brothers-in-law were never thoroughly reconciled and after a short time lord townsend resigned his office he withdrew from public life altogether and devoted his remaining years to the enjoyment of the country and the practical study of agriculture it is to his credit that when once he had given way to the superior influence of walpole he did not afterwards cabal against him or try to injure him according to the fashion of the statesmen of the time on the contrary when he was once pressed to join in an attack on walpole's ministry he firmly refused to do anything of the kind he said he had resolved to take no further part in political contests and he did not mean to break his resolution he was particularly determined not to depart from his resolve in this case he explained because his temper was hot and he was apprehensive that he might be hurried away by personal resentments to take a course which in his cooler moments he should have to regret nothing in his public life perhaps became him so well as his dignified conduct in his retirement his place in history is not strongly marked in this history we shall not hear of him any more Colonel Stanhope, who had made the Treaty of Seville, and had been raised to the peerage as Lord Harrington for his services, succeeded Townsend as Secretary of State. Horace Walpole, the brother of Robert, was, at his own request, recalled from Paris. Walpole, the Prime Minister, had begun to see that it would be necessary for the future to have something like a good understanding with Austria. The friendship with France had been a priceless advantage in its time, but walpole believed that it had served its turn it was valuable to england chiefly because it had enabled the sovereign to keep the movements of the stuart party in check and walpole hoped that the house of hanover was now secure on the throne and believed with too sanguine a confidence that no other effort would be made to disturb it moreover he saw some reason to think that france no longer guided by the political intelligence of a man like the duke of orleans was drawing a little too close in her relationship with Spain. Walpole was already looking forward to the coming of a time when it might be necessary for England to strengthen herself against France and Spain, and he therefore desired to get into a good understanding with the Emperor and Austria. Walpole now had the government entirely to himself. He was not merely all-powerful in the administration, he actually was the administration the king knew him to be indispensable the queen put the fullest trust in him his only trouble was with the intrigues of bolingbroke and the opposition of pulteney the latter sometimes affected what would have been called at the time a mighty unconcern about political affairs 
Writing once to Pope, he says, Mrs. Pulteney is now in labor. If she does well and brings me a boy, I shall not care one sixpence how much longer Sir Robert governs England or Horace governs France. This was written while Horace Walpole was still ambassador at the French court. Pulteney, however, was very far from feeling anything like the philosophical indifference which he expresses in his letter to Pope. He never ceased to attack everything done by the ministry, and to satirize every word said by Walpole. At the same time, Pulteney was complaining bitterly to his friends of the attacks made on him by the supporters of Walpole. On February ninth, 1730, he wrote a letter to Swift in which he says that certain people had been driven by want of argument to that last resort of calling names, villain, traitor, seditious rascal, and such ingenious appellations have frequently been bestowed on a couple of friends of yours. Such usage, he complacently adds, has made it necessary to return the same polite language, and there has been more Billingsgate stuff uttered from the press within these two months than ever was known before. Swift himself had previously written to his friend Dr. Sheridan a letter in which he declared that, Walpole is peevish and disconcerted, stoops to the vilest offices of hireling scoundrels to write Billingsgate of the lowest and most prostitute kind, and has none but beasts and blockheads for his penmen, whom he pays in ready guineas very liberally. One would have thought that beasts and blockheads could hardly prove very formidable enemies to Swift and Bolingbroke and Pulteney. One of the incidents in the controversy carried on by the ministerial penman and the craftsman was a duel between Pulteney and Lord Harvey. Pulteney and his friends were apparently under the impression that they had a right to a monopoly of personal abuse, and they resented any effusion of the kind from the other side as a breach of their privilege. Harvey had written a tract called Sedition and Defamation Displayed in a letter to the author of The Craftsman, and this led to a new outburst of passion on both sides. Pulteney stigmatized Harvey on account of his effeminate appearance, as a thing that was half man, half woman, and a duel took place in which Harvey was wounded. Harvey was a remarkable man. His physical frame was as feeble as that of Voltaire. He suffered from epilepsy and a variety of other ailments, he had to live mainly on a dietary of ass's milk. His face was so meagre and so pallid, or rather livid, that he used to paint and make up like an actress or a fine lady. Pope, who might have been considerate to the weak of frame, was merciless in his ridicule of Harvey. He ridiculed him as Sporus, who could neither feel satire nor sense, and as Lord Fanny. Yet Harvey could appreciate satire and sense, could write satire and sense. He was a man of very rare capacity. He had already distinguished himself as a debater in the House of Commons, and was afterwards to distinguish himself as a debater in the House of Lords. He wrote pretty verses and clever pamphlets, and he has left to the world a collection of memoirs of the reign of George the Second, which will always be read for its vivacity, its pungency, its bitterness, and its keen, penetrating good sense. Harvey succeeded in obtaining the hand of one of the most beautiful women of the day, the charming Mary Lapel, whose name has been celebrated in more than one poetical panegyric by Pope, and he captivated the heart of one of the royal princesses. The historical reader must strike a sort of balance for himself in getting at an estimate of Harvey's character. No man has been more bitterly denounced by his enemies or more warmly praised by his friends. Affectation, insincerity, prodigality, selfishness, servility to the great, contempt for the humble, are among the qualities his opponents ascribe to him. According to his friends, his cynicism was a mere affectation to hide a sensitive and generous nature. His bitterness arose from his disappointment at finding so few men or women who came up to a really high standard of nobleness. His homage of the great was but the half-disguised mockery of a scornful philosopher. Probably the picture drawn by the friends is, on the whole, more near to life than that painted by the enemies. 
the world owes him some thanks for a really interesting book, the very boldness and bitterness of which enhances to a certain extent its historical value. At this time, Harvey was but little over thirty years of age. He was the son of the first Earl of Bristol by a second marriage, had been educated at Westminster School and at Clare Hall, Cambridge, had gone early through the usual round of continental travels, and became a friend of George I's grandson, now Prince of Wales, at Hanover. This friendship not merely did not endure, but soon turned to hate. Harvey was an admirer of Lady Mary Wortley Montague, and was admired by her, but her own assurances, which may be trusted to, declared that there had been nothing warmer than friendship between them. Lady Mary afterwards maintained that the relationship between Harvey and her established the possibility of a long and steady friendship subsisting between two persons of different sexes without the least admixture of love. Harvey was in his day a somewhat free and liberal lover of women, and it is not surprising that the world should have regarded his acquaintance with Lady Mary as something warmer than mere friendship. We shall have occasion to refer to Harvey's memoirs of the reign of George the Second more than once hereafter, and may perhaps now cite a few words which Harvey himself says in vindication of their sincerity and their historical accuracy. No one who did not live in these times will, I dare say, believe, but some of those I describe in these papers must have had some hard features and deformities exaggerated and heightened by the malice and ill-nature of the painter who drew them. Others, perhaps, will say that at least no painter is obliged to draw every wart or wen or humpback in its full proportions, and that I might have softened these blemishes where I found them, but I am determined to report everything just as it is, or at least just as it appears to me, and those who have a curiosity to see courts and courtiers dissected must bear with the dirt they find in laying open such minds with as little nicety and as much patience as in a dissection of their bodies if they wanted to see that operation they must submit to the disgust. Harvey fought with spirit and effect on the side of Walpole, although Lady Harvey strongly disliked the minister and was disliked by him. Walpole had at one time, it was said, made unsuccessful love to the beautiful witty Molly Lapel, and he did not forgive her because of her scornful rejection of his ponderous attempts at gallantry. Harvey, nevertheless, took Walpole's side and proved to be an ally of some importance. A great struggle was approaching in which the whole strength of Walpole's hold on the sovereign and the country was to be tested by the severest strain. Walpole was, as we have said more than once, the first of the great financial statesmen of England. He was the first statesman who properly appreciated the virtue and the value of mere economy in the disposal of a nation's revenues. He was the first to devise anything like a solid and symmetrical plan for the fair adjustment of taxation. Sometimes he had recourse to rather poor and commonplace artifices, as in the case of his proposal to meet a certain financial strain by borrowing half a million from the sinking fund. This proposal he carried by a large majority, in spite of the most vehement and even furious opposition on the part of the patriots. It must be owned that the patriots were right enough in the principle of their objection to this encroachment on the sinking fund, although their predictions as to the ruin it must bring upon the country were preposterous. Borrowing from a sinking fund is always rather a shabby dodge, but it is a trick familiar to all statesmen in difficulties, and Walpole did no worse than many statesmen of later days, who, with the full advantages of a sound and well-developed financial system, have shown that they were not able to do any better. The patriots seem to have made up their minds to earn their title. They fought the court, or ministerial party, on a variety of issues. They supported motions for the reduction of the numbers of the army, and they declaimed against the whole principle of a standing army with patriotic passion, which sometimes appeared for the time quite genuine. They brought illustrations of all kinds, applicable and inapplicable, from Greek and Roman, from French and Spanish history, even from Eastern history, to show 
that a standing army was invariably the instrument of despotism and the forerunner of doom to the liberties of a people. The financial policy of the government gave them frequent opportunities for using the sword of the partisan behind the fluttering cloak of the patriot. On both sides of the house there was considerable confusion of ideas on the subject of political economy and the incidence of taxation. Walpole was ahead of his own party, as well as of his opponents on such subjects. His followers were little more enlightened than his antagonists. In 1732 there was presented to the House of Commons an interesting report from the commissioners for trade and plantations on the state of his majesty's colonies and plantations in america with respect to any laws made manufactures set up and trade carried on there which may affect the trade navigation and manufactures of this kingdom from this report we learn that at the time there were three different systems of government prevailing in the american colonies some provinces were immediately under the administration of the crown these were Nova Scotia, New Hampshire, the Jerseys, New York, Virginia, the two Carolinas, Bermuda, Bahama Islands, Jamaica, Barbados, and the Leeward Islands. Others were vested in proprietors, Pennsylvania, for example, in Maryland, and the Bahamas and the two Carolinas had not long before been in the same condition. There were three charter governments, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut in which the power was divided between the crown and the population, where the people chose their representative assemblies, and the governor was dependent upon the assembly for his annual support, which, as the report observed ingenuously, has so frequently laid the governor of such a province under temptations of giving up the prerogative of the crown and interest of Great Britain. The report contains a very full account of the state of manufactures in all the provinces, New York, for example, had no manufactures that deserved mentioning. The trade there consisted chiefly in furs, whalebone, oil, pitch, tar, and provisions. In Massachusetts, the inhabitants worked up their wool and flax and made an ordinary coarse cloth for their own use, but did not export any. In Pennsylvania, the chief trade lay in the exportation of provisions and lumber, and there were no manufactures established, their clothing and utensils for their houses being all imported from Great Britain. For the object of the whole report was not to discover how far the energy of the colonists was developing the resources of the colonies, in order that the government and the people of England might be gratified with a knowledge of the progress made, and give their best encouragement to further progress. The inquiry was set on foot in order to find out whether the colonists were presuming to manufacture for themselves any goods which they ought by right to buy from English makers, and to recommend steps by which such audacious enterprises might be rebuked and prevented. This is the avowed object of the report, and we find governor after governor assuring the commissioners earnestly and plaintively that the population of his province really manufacture nothing, or at all events nothing that could possibly interfere with the sacred privileges of the English monopolists. The report significantly recommends the House of Commons to take into consideration the question whether it might be expedient to give these colonies proper encouragement for turning their industry to such manufactures and products as might be of service to Great Britain, and more particularly to the production of all kinds of naval stores. The proper encouragement given to this sort of productiveness would imply, of course, proper discouragement given to anything else. The colonies were to exist merely for the convenience and benefit of the so-called mother country, a phrase surely of sardonic impressiveness. Such, however, was the common feeling of that day in England. It was so with regard to India. It was so with regard to Ireland the story of the pelican was reversed. The pelican did not in this case feed her young with her blood. The young were expected to give their blood to feed the pelican. The real strain was to come 
when walpole should introduce his famous and long expected scheme for a reform in the custom and excise laws walpole's scheme was inspired by two central ideas one of these was to diminish the amount of taxation imposed on the land of the country and make up the deficiency by indirect taxation the other was to reduce the customs duties by substituting as far as possible an excise duty walpole would have desired something like free trade as regarded the introduction of food and the raw materials of manufacture let these be got into the country as easily and freely as possible was his principle and then let us see afterwards how we can adjust the excise duties so as to produce the largest amount of revenue with the smallest injury to the interest of the consumer and with the minimum of waste his design was that the necessaries of life and the raw materials of manufacture should remain as nearly as possible untaxed and that the revenue of the country should be collected from land and from luxuries we do not mean to say that the plans which walpole presented to the country were faithful in all their details to these central ideas one scheme at least which he laid before parliament was positively at variance with the main principles which he had long been trying to establish but in considering the whole controversy between him and his opponents the reader may take it for granted that such were the principles by which his financial policy was inspired he had been moving quietly in this direction for some time he had removed the import duties from tea coffee and chocolate and made them subject to inland or excise duties in seventeen thirty two he revived the salt tax the bill which was introduced on february ninth seventeen thirty two to accomplish this object met with a strong opposition in both houses of parliament walpole's speech in introducing the motion for the revival of the tax contained a very clear statement of his financial creed where every man contributes a small share a great sum may be raised for the public service without any man's being sensible of what he pays whereas a small sum raised upon a few lies heavy upon each particular man and is the more grievous in that it is unjust for where the benefit is mutual the expense ought to be in common the general principle is unassailable but walpole seems to us to have been quite wrong in his application of it to such an impost as the salt tax of all the taxes i ever could think of he argued there is not one more general nor one less felt than that of the duty upon salt he described it as a tax that every man in the nation contributes to according to his circumstances and condition in life this is exactly what every man does not do the family of the rich man does not by any means consume more salt than the family of the poor man in proportion to their respective incomes pulteney knocked walpole's argument all to pieces in a speech of remarkable force and ingenuity even for him there was something honestly pathetic in his appeal on behalf of the poor man whom the duty on salt would touch most nearly the tax he said would be as one shilling a head for every man or woman able to work to a man with a family it would average four shillings and sixpence a year such a yearly sum may be looked upon as a trifle by a gentleman of a large estate in easy circumstances but a poor man feels sometimes severely the want of a shilling many a poor man has for want of a shilling been obliged to pawn the only whole coat he had to his back and has never been able to redeem it again even a farthing to a poor man is a considerable sum what shifts do the frugal among them make to save even a farthing had all pulteney's speech been animated by this spirit he would have made out an unanswerable case the objection to a salt tax in england then was not so great as in india at a later period but the principle of the tax was undoubtedly bad while the general principle of walpole's finance was undoubtedly good the question however was not argued out by pulteney or any other speaker on his side upon such a ground as the hardship to the poor man the tyranny of an excise system of any excise system its unconstitutional 
despotic and inquisitorial nature this was the chief ground of attack sir william wyndham sounded the alarm which was soon to be followed by a tremendous echo he declared the proposed tax not only destructive to the trade but inconsistent with the liberties of this nation the very number of the officers who would have to be appointed to collect this one tax would be named by the crown and scattered all over the country would have immense influence on the elections and this fact alone would give a power into the hands of the crown greater than was consistent with the liberties of the people and of the most dangerous consequence to our happy constitution the bill passed the house of commons and was read a first time in the house of lords on march twenty second the second reading was moved on march twenty seventh and a long debate took place not the least interesting fact concerning this debate was that the leading part in opposition to the bill was taken by lord carteret who had returned from his irish government and was beginning to show himself a pertinacious and a formidable enemy of walpole and his administration carteret outshone even pulteney and wyndham in wholesale and extravagant denunciation of the measure he likened it to the domestic policy of cardinal richelieu by which the estates of the nobility and gentry were virtually confiscated to the crown and the liberties of the people were lost it would place it in the power of a wicked administration to reduce the english people to the same condition as the people in turkey their only resource will be in mobs and tumults and the prevailing party will administer justice by general massacres and proscriptions all this may now seem sheer absurdity but for the purposes of carteret and pulteney it was by no means absurd the salt tax was carried through the house of lords but the public out of doors were taught to believe that the minister's financial policy was merely a series of artifices for the destruction of popular rights and for robbing england of her political liberty walpole had long had in his mind a measure of a different nature a measure to readjust the duties on tobacco and wine it was known that he was preparing some bill on the subject and the excitement which was beginning to show itself at the time of the salt tax debate was turned to account by the opposition to forestall the popular reception of the expected measure the cry was got up that the administration was planning a scheme for a general excise and the bare idea of a general excise was then odious and terrible to the public whatever walpole's final purposes may have been there was nothing to alarm any one in the scheme which he was presently to introduce nobody now would think of impugning the soundness of the economical principles on which his moderate limited and tentative scheme of fiscal reform was founded the coming event threw its shadow before it and the shadow became marvellously distorted pulteney speaking on february twenty third seventeen thirty three with regard to the sinking fund proposal talked of the expected excise scheme in language of such exaggeration that it is impossible to believe the orator could have felt anything like the alarm and horror he expressed there is a very terrible affair impending pulteney said a monstrous project yea more monstrous than has ever yet been represented it is such a project as has struck terror into the minds of most gentlemen within this house and into the minds of all men without doors who have any regard to the happiness or the constitution of their country i mean that monster the excise that plan of arbitrary power which is expected to be laid before this house in the present session of parliament sir john barnard one of the members for the city of london a man of great respectability capacity and influence ventured to predict that walpole's scheme would turn out to be his eternal shame and dishonour and that the more the project is examined and the consequences thereof considered the more the projector will be hated and despised of all this strong language walpole took little account he meant to propose his scheme he said when the proper time should come and he did not doubt but that honourable members would find it something very different from the vague and monstrous project of which they had been told in any case 
he meant to propose it. Accordingly, on Wednesday, March 7th, 1733, Walpole moved that the House should on that day week resolve itself into a committee to consider of the most proper methods for the better security and improvement of the duties and revenues already charged upon and payable from tobacco and wines. On the day appointed, Wednesday, March 14th, the House went into committee accordingly, and Walpole expounded his scheme. It was simply a plan to deal with the duties on wines and tobacco, and Walpole protested that his views and purposes were confined altogether to these two branches of the revenue, and that such a thing as a scheme of general excise had never entered into his head, nor, for what I know, into the head of any man I am acquainted with. There was in the mind of the English people, then, a vague horror of all excise laws and excise officers, and the whole opposition to Walpole's scheme in and out of the House of Commons was maintained by an appeal to that common feeling. Walpole's resolutions with regard to the tobacco trade were taken first and separately. It will soon be seen that the resolutions concerning the duties on wine were destined never to be discussed at all. What Walpole proposed to do in regard to tobacco was to make the customs duty very small and to increase the excise duty to establish bonded warehouses for the storing of the tobacco imported into this country and meant to be exported again or sold here for home consumption, thus to encourage and facilitate the importation, to get rid of many of the dishonest practices which injured the fair dealer and defrauded the revenue, to put a stop to smuggling, to benefit at once the grower, the manufacturer, the consumer, and the revenue." We need not relate at great length and in minute detail the history of these resolutions and of the debates on them in the House of Commons, but it may be pointed out that, wild and absurd as were the outcries of the patriots, there yet was good reason for their apprehension of a growing scheme to substitute excise for land tax or poll tax or customs. Walpole was, as we know, a firm believer in the advantages of indirect taxation and of the introduction as freely as possible of all raw materials for manufacture and all articles useful for the food of the nation. He was a free trader before his time, and he saw that in certain cases there was immense advantage to the consumer and to the revenue in allowing articles to be imported under as light a duty as possible, and then putting an excise duty on their distribution here. Walpole was perfectly right in all this, but his enemies were none the less justified in proclaiming that the proposals he was introducing would not end in a mere readjustment of the tobacco and wine duties. Walpole's first resolution was carried by 266 votes against 205. The government had won a victory but it was such a victory as Walpole did not care to win. He had been used of late to bear down all before him, and he saw with eyes of clear foreboding the ominous significance of his present majority. He knew well that the opposition had got the most telling cry they could possibly have sought or found against him. He knew that popular tumult would grow from day to day. He knew that his enemies were unscrupulous, and that they were banded together against him on many grounds and with many different purposes. Every section of the nation which had any hostile feeling to the House of Hanover, to the existing administration, or to the Prime Minister himself, made common cause against not his excise bill, but him. The tobacco resolutions were passed, and a bill to put them into execution was ordered to be prepared. On April 4th, the bill was introduced to the House of Commons, and a motion was made that it be read a first time. Much, however, had happened out of doors since the day when Walpole introduced his resolutions. Even at that time, there was a great excitement abroad, which brought crowds of more or less tumultuous persons round the entrances of the House of Commons. The troops had to be kept in readiness for any emergency that might arise, the least thing feared was that they might have to be employed to keep the access to the house clear for its members. By the time the first division had taken place, the tide of popular passion had swollen still higher. As Walpole was quitting the house, 
a furious rush was made at him and but that some of his colleagues surrounded protected and bore him off he would have been in serious personal danger but the interval between that event and the introduction of the bill had been turned to very practical account by those who were agitating against him and the country was now in a flame of excitement the craftsmen and the pamphleteers had done their work well the most extravagant consequences were described as certain to follow from the adoption of walpole's excise scheme a minister once allowed to impose his excise duty upon wine and tobacco and thus shrieked the mouths of a hundred pamphleteers and verse-mongers he will go on imposing excise on every article of food and dress and household use nothing will be able to resist the inquisitorial excise man it was positively asserted in ballad and in pamphlet that before long the excise man would everywhere practice on the daughters of england the atrociously insulting test which was attempted on wat tyler's daughter and which brought about wat tyler's insurrection the memories of wat tyler and of jack straw were invoked to arouse popular panic and fury strange as it may seem now these appeals were successful in their object they did create a popular panic and stir up popular passion and fury to the uttermost height not even walpole attempted any longer to argue down the monstrous misrepresentations of his policy the fury against him and his excise scheme grew hotter every day and at one time it was positively thought that his life was in danger tumultuous crowds of people gathered in and around all the approaches to the house of commons several members of the house who were known to be in favour of the ministerial scheme complained that they had been menaced insulted and even assaulted and the house had for the security of its own debates and the personal safety of its own members to pass resolutions declaring that this riotous behaviour was destructive of the freedom and constitution of parliament and a high crime and misdemeanour in the house itself certain tactics with which parliament has been very familiar at a later period were tried with some effect various motions for adjournment and other such delay to the progress of the bill were made and pressed to a division it was becoming evident to every one that the measure was doomed and the hearts of the leaders of opposition rose with each hour that passed while the spirits of the ministerialists fell walpole never lost his head although he well knew that a certain any damaging failure was now awaiting him he still proclaimed that his measure could be hurtful to none but smugglers and unfair traders that it would be of great benefit to the revenue and the nation that it would tend to make london a free port and by consequence the market of the world he spoke with scorn of the riotous crowds whom some had declared to be merely respectful petitioners gentlemen may give them what name they think fit it may be said that they come hither as humble suppliants but i know whom the law calls sturdy beggars the common council of london spirited on by a jacobite lord mayor petitioned against the excise scheme and its example was followed by various municipalities in the kingdom walpole acted at last according to the principle which always governed him at such a crisis he had the courage to abandon the ground which he had taken up and which he would have been well entitled to maintain if argument could prevail over misrepresentation and passion with that cool contempt for the extravagance and the ignorance of the sentiment which thwarted him he abandoned his scheme and let the mob have its way on wednesday april eleventh seventeen thirty three it was made known that the government did not intend to go any further with the bill exaltation all over the island was unbounded church bells rang windows were illuminated bonfires blazed multitudes shouted everywhere if england had gained some splendid victory over a combination of foreign enemies there could not have been a greater display of frantic national enthusiasm than that which broke out when it was found that hostile clamour had prevailed against the minister and that his excise scheme was abandoned frederick the great 
has enriched the curiosities of history with an account which he gives of the abandonment of the bill according to him george the second had devised the measure as a means of making himself absolute sovereign of england the excise bill was intended to put him in possession of a revenue fixed and assured a revenue large enough to allow him to increase his military power to any strength he pleased it only needed a word of command and a chief for revolution to break out walpole escaped from parliament covered with an old cloak and shouting with all his might liberty liberty no excise thus disguised he managed to get to the king in st james's palace he found the king preparing for the worst arming himself at all points having put on the hat he wore at Malplaquet, and trying the temper of the sword he carried at Oudenard. George desired to put himself at once at the head of his guards, and try conclusions with his enemies. Walpole had all the trouble in the world to moderate his sovereign's impetuosity, and at length represented to him, with the generous hardihood of an Englishman attached to his master, that it was only a choice between abandoning the excise bill and losing the crown whereupon george at last gave way the bill was abandoned and the crown preserved this scene is of course a piece of the purest romance but it is certain that the passions of the people were so thoroughly aroused that a man less cool and in the true sense courageous than walpole might have provoked a popular outbreak and no one can say whether the crown of the Brunswicks might not have gone down in a popular outbreak just then. Time and education have long since vindicated Walpole's financial principles, but the passion, the ignorance, and the partisanship of his own day were too strong and prevailed against him. End of the first volume. End of chapter 20. End of A History of the Four Georges in Four Volumes, Volume 1, by Justin McCarthy. Recording by Pamela Nagami, September 2015.